Okay, so good morning. I am Eileen Wang from Shanghai Astronomical Observatory. So it's happy to chair the GG session today. Shall we begin the meeting? Firstly, Chris will bring us with the principal scientist update. Hi, Chris. Could you please start your presentation? Okay, thanks, Eileen. Um, let's get this on the way. Yeah, that's top two. Yeah, we can see your slides. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Shall we, uh, shall we start? Yeah, yeah, we can see the slides. Excellent. Okay. So, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, NWA collaboration. It is Italy calling where it is awfully early, but um, it's great to be here as your principal scientist to talk you through some of the awesome stuff that's been happening over the last six months to a year. So we'll start with a few uh, updates on uh, MWA people. The principal scientist position, for those of you who may not necessarily be aware, is under new management. You have a new principal scientist as of a few months ago, that's uh, myself, there with the beard, as you can see uh, wonderfully live stream. And uh, the deputy principal scientist is Ben McKinley, who is at Ikra Curtin, and I'm sure he'll be waving online. In terms of science working group updates, we have the Pulsars and Fast Transients group, which has uh, been approved by the board officially and are establishing their charter. Um, Ramesh is uh, Ikra Curtin is the chair of that group. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that later. Um, Paul Hancock, after several years of service, has is uh, stepping down as chair of the transients working group um, and Melanie is stepping down as the chair of the clusters and cosmic web science team as part of GEG. So we thank both Paul and Melanie for their excellent service and leadership over the last few years and if you would like to uh, throw your name into consideration for replacing them as chair of those groups and science teams then uh, for transients get in touch with Paul and for the GEG Clusters and Cosmic Web Science team, please get in touch with Janela Tremblay as the GEG coordinator. She is uh, coordinating the search. We also have a couple of new student projects that have been approved in the case of Alien student projects or in, um, are just about to go out for review in the case of Keegan Smith. Um, that's pretty much the, the summary update in terms of people. So MWA Science in Numbers and Graphs. We have 20 papers featuring MWA data admitted, uh, accepted or published in the last six months, and we have a whopping total of six collaboration papers submitted. That brings us to a total of 149 collaboration papers and 100 external papers. And congratulations to Shintaro on being the lead author of our 100th external paper. Citation so statistics. Uh, in the last six months, uh, the collaboration papers have gained a total of exactly a thousand citations, and our external papers have gained a total of about 260 citations. And if you look at the uh, citation curves, they look a little bit, a little something like this. A um, bit of a shout out to the EOR collaboration for having quite a few papers in the top, uh, in the in the top six. So uh, well done, there, EOR. Keep being awesome. So how did this compare to the last year? Um, in the calendar year of 2020, the collaboration papers gained about 1,000 citations. Our external papers gained about 300 citations, and we had 28 papers accepted. In the first half of this year, we have almost equaled uh, that record, which is frankly fantastic. And the curves, the, the citation rate curves, look a little something like this. Now, I live in Europe, so I've seen a lot of curves that show this kind of growth over the last year or so, and uh, normally they're bad news. This is good news. We're doing great. The citation rate is accelerating. Our publication rate is accelerating. So you all can be really proud of yourselves because despite everything the past year has thrown at you, uh, you're, you're all doing amazing science. So keep it up. Keep being awesome. And for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to delve into a few science highlights from each of these science working groups. The collaboration has been hugely scientifically productive. So this is a very much biased sample. I've had to cherry pick a few results that I think are pretty cool. Um, so apologies if your recent cool science result is missed by me in this. 
First things first, let's go to the EOR. Let's go way back to the early universe. One of the papers that's caught my eye is a paper by Aman Chokshi. Uh, he's been doing some fantastic work, student-led work, um, using satellites to update the MWA beam model. Now, this is really important for EOR because of the incredibly high level of precision they require. So any calibration problems are a problem. So this is great for the EOR point of view, but it's also a highlight because this kind of work is useful for every single MWA science working group. We all use the telescope. We all need as good a beam model as we can get, particularly those folks who, like me, deal with polarization. So this is great. Um, also, another shout out to EOR because you all have submitted four papers since I have taken over as principal scientist. So that's fantastic. Another highlight is uh, Shintaro's paper, which is really awesome because it's, you know, power spectrum of using the MWA ultra low bands to put limits on cosmic dawn at very high redshift. Because of the extremely low frequencies here, this is incredibly challenging. Um, and we saw Shintaro's talk yesterday where uh, some of this was mentioned and this plot was mentioned. But for those folks who aren't like, who, who are like me and are outside of EOR, we see power spectra like this all the time, but I'm going to try and put this in a little bit of context. Uh, and this figure from Nicole Barry really goes quite well to put this in context. We see limits on uh, EOR and cosmic dawn, as indicated by the various different markers, as a function of redshift. And if you plot the power law of the power spectrum and look at all of the different MWA papers that are in here, uh, the MWA is doing fantastic. You know, we're, the MWA is pushing limits across a very broad redshift space. So really, the MWA is leading the way in the search for EOR and Cosmic Dawn across a huge redshift space, pushing down the limits. It's awesome. Um, next up, we switch to uh, GEG. And there are quite a few GEG papers that have caught my eye, but I can only really mention three. One of these is the paper by Tessa Wernstrom and collaborators. Um, Kessler looks at stacking uh, pairs of galaxy clusters to look for possible signals of synchrotron emission from the inter-cluster bridge region. Now, a handful of these cases have been directly imaged by LOFAR recently, um, and this is the first time that we have seen a, a signal with the MWA. This is going to be, going to be discussed more in Chinoa's talk, but this is really cool because we're looking here in Tesla's work at scales much, much larger than those seen by LOFAR. And these kind of studies are really important because they place limits on magnetic fields and particle acceleration mechanisms in a very poorly studied environment. Um, and it's also extremely cool because the work has made a splash in a couple of science media outlets, such as Nature Astronomy and Space Australia. And it's also to be featured in an article in New Scientist. So keep your eyes peeled. More work that has caught my eye is by Stéphane Duchesne. Uh, Stéphane has really been one of the driving forces behind um, many of the MWA cluster papers over the past few years during his PhD. Um, Stefan has discovered a pair of unusual radio halos in these two ABEL clusters. Um, these clusters, you wouldn't, you know, uh, they're, they're relatively uh, weak merging systems, they're relatively low mass. So to find prominent radio halos is perhaps a bit, uh, is perhaps a bit surprising, but really it goes to show that we're digging deeper into the weak inefficient particle acceleration regime here with the MWA. So stay tuned for what, Stephane, what else the is going to be doing with the phase two MWA, because there's going to be heaps of awesome cost of science. Another science highlight, I could hardly mention science highlights without discussing the radio jellyfish. You saw this as one of Stephen's highlights yesterday uh, in a paper by Torrance Hodgson and collaborators, the ultra deep spectrum jellyfish in ABL 2877. This is such a steep spectrum source. We have, this thing has a spectral index of nearly minus six, which absolutely smashes the previous record held by Francesco de Gasparin and Lopar, which was a spectral index of about minus 3.8. So this is very old. These things are believed to be a, quite a short-lived phenomenon comprised of various different fossil radio sources um, that have been gently re-accelerated by a very low efficiency merger. So they wouldn't be radio bright for very long, and indeed, this particular source is only quite radio bright at the very lowest frequencies. Um, Torrance's work has made a splash, appearing in a number of different uh, science and popular media outlets. Uh, Torrance was interviewed by Vice, which is extremely cool. And the uh, 
cosmic jellyfish has even made its way onto some merchandise, uh, DJ Cosmic Jellyfish, uh, which is not in any way that I'm aware of affiliated with Torrance or the MWA collaboration, but it's pretty cool. So really from all of this, we see that the MWA is allowing us to study magnetic fields, particle acceleration mechanisms in a variety of really not very well explored so far environments. This is extremely awesome. Looking forward to seeing what the rest of phase two brings. Uh, Pulse and Fast Transients, paper by uh, Nick Swainston and collaborators. Um, PSR J0036 minus 1033 is the MWA's first new pulsar. This thing is kind of unusual. It's got a long period, it's faint, quite a steep radio spectrum, and it's variable on relatively uh, short time scales. Made a bit of a splash um, appearing in uh, a couple of uh, news, scientific news outlets. And there's a beautiful piece of art by Dilpreet Kaur from Ekar Curtin, which, who, which, which also appears in the article. Um, and this is really promising because this is like less than 1% of the smart survey data, which I'm sure Ramesh will correct me if I'm wrong, but has detected several tens of known pulsars, but this is our first new pulsar. And like I said, it's still only less than 1% of the data, so we're discovering all these new and unusual pulsars and learning things about known ones in exquisite, unparalleled detail. And there's so much more to come from the rest of SMART. This is just scratching the very surface of uh, what SMART is going to find, which is extremely cool. So uh, looking forward to seeing what comes out of that later. And finally, last but by no means least, moving on to SHR, the Solar Heliospheric and Ionospheric Group. Um, I picked out a couple of papers here by Hara et al. 2021. Um, they use phase two NWA to uh, study type three radio burst emission encountered by the Parker Solar Probe, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see a uh, radio on uh, roughly visible light wavelength image here uh, on the right. And uh, it's really interesting work looking at all of, looking at and seeing what the NWA has done with solar studies because Hara et al. detected these um, large intensity bursts, but also frequently lo frequency localized features, much like type 3 radio storms, which originate towards the edge of the active region um, of the solar disk. I don't pretend to be an expert in SHI, but this is some extremely cool work. So check out the paper if you want to know more. And there's another paper by Mohan, also earlier this year, um, using phase two MWA observations of type one solar storms, so different types of storms. Um, Moan discovered two different correlated modes with uh, solar flares transit, uh, mediating the transition between these different modes for the first time, which goes to goes away to supporting the idea that what's going on is you have um, magnetic stress building up and building up into these loops, which eventually become unstable. They can't take it. And they cause the flares, which releases the energy uh, related to the build-up stress. So once again, the MWA is providing key information that allows us to understand solar storms, which is really cool because this kind of solar weather is, it's, you know, it's impactful on our everyday life here on Earth. So we want to understand the sun better, and the MWA is allowing us to do that. And so finally, that kind of brings me to my summary because. All the science is cool. You'll hear more about it later. You've heard about it yesterday. You don't want to hear me waffling on about it too much. Um, the MWA continues to drive uh, transformational science. Our publication and citation rates are accelerating. We're unveiling the nature of new complex sources, understanding our sun better. We're understanding pulsars and detecting new pulsars that are you know, new and unusual better. We're digging closer to the EOR and Cosmic Dawn across this huge redshift range. There's so much cool science. Students in ECRs continue to be the driving force. Despite everything the last you know, year has thrown at us, despite the challenging circumstances, students in ECRs are generating ever more fantastic science results. And I just wanted to say that you are all extremely awesome. Keep being awesome. And uh, phase three is going to be great. So uh, laissez les bon temps vous l'êtes. Um, and I will take questions. Thank you. It's really exciting. Thanks, Chris, Master. So, any hands up? Um, I didn't see any questions or 
comments in the Slack. Okay, if, oh yes, please, I see a remnant, please. This, yeah, this is, question is not related to the sign, but I was uh, wondering, um, so uh, what is the plan for uh, this proposal evaluation that uh, uh, there was a proposal called for shared risk proposals for uh, um, priority for obviously the system commissioning, but also to advance some of the projects that are currently in a more like a halfway through or three fourths of the way through, like for example, the smart survey. So I was just curious, uh, what is the current state and what's the plan? Okay, great question. Um, I didn't include a slide on um, TAC outcomes because the outcome is essentially that all proposals will be granted. Um, that was the understanding going into this semester um, because it's you know shared risk. There's, there's a heavy commissioning um, load coming up in the 2021A uh, semester. So once the MW, well, over the coming weeks, probably next week, I will endeavor to get the TAC feedback back to all the PIs. Um, but yeah, once the MWA is observing it again, um, we will we will see what we can do about that. I can't really say much more about that at the moment, but uh, that's about the best I can say. Don't worry, your time has been granted. We will get um, we'll get the rest of the smart done. We'll get the the new correlator commissioned, and, and we'll do some awesome science. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Any hands up? Yes. No. I think we can move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the next speaker is Shinoa, and she will report the GG update. Hi, Shinoa. Yeah, I can see your screen. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you when you are actually watching this. So um, my name is Shinoa Tremblay. I've been the chair of the GEG working group for about a year now. Um, and I've had that pleasure um, to, to do this um, work with people. Uh, we're open to interactions from anyone in the collaboration that is interested in science regarding galaxy, our galaxy, or other galaxies. And if you'd like to join us, we meet every fourth Friday at UTC uh, 0500 plus. Uh, we have a Slack channel. We also have wiki pages, which regularly get updated. And I recently initiated a collaboration meeting called the Celebration of Science. And this was a meeting that was offset from the project meetings and allowed people to give project updates, present ideas for projects they might be interested in collaborating with. Maybe they know how to start, maybe they don't. And then challenges that they're facing. In our first one, we had 11 five minute talks and so much discussion, we almost ran out of time and it led to a lot of more interesting um, science and we'll have our next one in September. So in GEG we have six science teams um, as this covers a lot of science and today I'll present some of the impact the science has had through publications and presentations and then also some of the active projects in science which Chris has already highlighted some but I've got more um, to highlight as well and as Chris had mentioned we're looking for a new lead for the cosmic web and clusters group. So if you are interested, then feel free to email me or contact me. Um, since the last update that we gave in June 2020, we had 23 publications across the different science teams, and you can see that most of the groups are fairly active at this stage. And I'll no also note, similar to what Stephen had said yesterday in the director's update, that a large fraction of these are using public data at this point, which is also great. I asked the members of the of the GEG team to let me know how much they are presenting work at conferences nationally and internationally regarding MWA work. I only had six people respond, but as you can see, it, we still have a very wide breadth of science that's getting out there and quite regularly as well. 
So let's discuss some of the science teams and starting with the uh, galactic and extragalactic spectroscopy group. With this, we have a number of uh, very different and unique projects. We're using the first low frequency axion dark matter searches of the galactic center, which is work led out of uh, the University of Amsterdam. We have high redshift H1 selected GPS sources, SETI on Proxima Centauri and galactic center and radio recombination lines towards the galactic center. Um, we had a summer student at Curtin University named Jamie um, last year who reduced three uh, frequency bands of data towards the galactic center and looked for radio recombination lines. Uh, he didn't find any uh, lines in particular, even in these stacked spectra, but in the noise plots that you can see at the bottom right, the blue points show the noise calculated for different time lengths and the line with the best fit. The orange line is a copy of the blue line shifted for accounting for larger areas of the search. The green line is represented of the noise if the CRLs are decreased further. And the brown line is the noise predicted for with phase three upgrades, in particular with the narrower frequency range and also being able to look straight at Zenith. Some of these observations were very low on the horizon, so we didn't we only had about 30% of the normal sensitivity. And with this prediction, anywhere greater than nine hours could possibly detect carbon recombination lines with the MWA, but 15 to 20 hours of data would give us a much better detection rate. Similarly, we had another summer student looking at the high Z survey data, um, in particular, the the data that was taken with the phase two array, and they looked at a number six sources um, with a pipeline that was designed by Natasha Hurley Walker and Chris put in an amazing effort over the eight weeks of the program to look for these. We didn't find any detections in these sources, and I believe a paper is in progress. Um, Danny will be talking about some of the work we're doing with the MWA. We're broadening the parameter space search space um, for this type of work, and I'll leave that to Danny. For radio galaxies, um, there's also a very large number of projects in progress at the moment. We have new high redshift radio galaxy candidates with gleams. NGC 2663 is displaying some really interesting uh, lobe structure, and so that's under study by a student project. There's uh, follow-up work on the Gleam Forjansky sample that was run by Sarah White. Uh, we have nearby AGN host galaxies. Uh, and a number of other uh, projects in anticipation with Gleam X as well. Uh, Sarah provided a couple of science highlights from the Gleam Forjansky sample, and this source in particular, which she says is um, you might find as familiar as the 40 arc minute across um, the southern lobe, was unlucky to fall within the region masked for Centaurus A, and so was refitted using the Aegean with four Gleam components and characterizing with low frequency emission. It was only in the gleam contours, which are shown in red, that you could see the more extended diffuse emission with the lobes. Uh, a new image from Meerkat reveals even more detail of the stunning radio galaxy. And not only did we see threads similar to those discovered by Ram, uh, Rama Soka at all 2020, but the incredibly straight ribbons uh, indicate where previous jet activity carved out paths in the surrounding medium with a brighter FR1 emission, indicating a more recent jet launching. In addition, the geometry of several of the rings of the emission within the southern lobe have been used to estimate the angle of inclination, which is in agreement with other more standard methods. So great work. Um, some work that will also be presented by Jess a little bit later on the ultra high redshift radio galaxies that he's been doing with Guillaume as well, um, using some gleam steep spectrum sources with follow up with VLA and Alma to do to look at some of these really um, distant galaxies. Uh, work that's led by our student uh, Ben Quincy over at uh, Curtin University is studying the life cycle of radio galaxies. He's using a, a series of MWA data and, um, and processing it and doing really good work and looking at some of the, the relic um, jet activity, extended sources, some less extended sources, and double like they're restarting. For Galactic Continuum, there's also another large number of projects, as you can imagine, uh, everything from supernova remnants to emission shells to H2 regions, 
uh, planetary nebula wavelength, multi-wavelength studies of various sources. Uh, and there's a number of these projects. Uh, a couple of science highlights here. Natasha provided one on the Hoinga supernova remnant, which was done as a Gleam X E Rosita collaboration uh, to look at this unusual high latitude all sky um, synergy between the Gleam X and the ERAS project. And she notes that there's a funded PhD scholarship available for some of this work if anybody is interested. Um, some work that I am leading, uh, I'm studying a number of 11 regions on the sky towards the Vela supernova remnant, and these contain H2 regions, but also hot cores, and I'm doing a multi-wavelength study using archived MWA data, which I've processed myself, RACS um, ASCAP data from the Rapid All Sky Survey, uh, ACA data from archives, uh, parks data and WISE and a number of other things to to study these regions which haven't uh, been well known and we also have a couple other proposals in progress to study the magnetic fields of some of these interacting clouds um, using Zeeman splitting with OH. Uh, with polarimetry um, the most the biggest project project that's going on there is PogX which is being led by Zhang and that will be in an upcoming talk as well. With clusters and cosmic web, a few of the sci science highlights have already been discussed between Stephen and Chris already, but there are a number of projects that they are working on and a number of really high impact projects, in particular some of the stuff that, that Stefan is doing and cleaning up at the moment. Um, so with Tessa's Vernstrom stuff, as Chris had mentioned, um, this is work that was published earlier this year and uh, Tessa says filaments connecting the clusters of galaxies are notoriously hard to detect due to their faint and diffuse nature. Only two short bridges have ever been imaged in the radio before. In Fernstrom et al, nearly 400,000 pairs of clusters were stacked to Measure look for an average place. signal from these filaments. The following is a test of the building <laughs> Maps from the frequency no range, I apologize for this. The following is a test um, of the building's fire evacuation system. No action is required. This results in the first average detection, really poor timing of the alarm system, um, in the first average detection of diffuse radio emission between widely separated pairs. I'm going to mute for a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so maps from three frequencies from Gleam survey using the Murchison Wide Field Array and one of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array were used for stacking. And this resulted in the first average detection of diffuse radio emission between widely separated pairs of clusters, as is shown in the left image. And this was compared with stack sample of cluster pairs with larger separations in three dimensional space and larger changes in redshift between them. And the control sample should not show any detection. And this is what we've seen in the center image. The strength of the emission was compared to the cosmological magnohydrodynamic simulations and the cutout of one of the simulations is shown in the right panel with lines indicating the possible pairs of clusters. The radio detections show stronger signals than predicted by simulations indicating either a stronger magnetic field or a more efficient particle acceleration. For the magnetic um, Magellanic clouds in nearby galaxies. There's also a number of projects um, going on. So there was work done by Philippa Patterson for her master's thesis, which completed in December 2020 using the LMC and SMC. Now this data was not fully reduced in particular for the LMC. So if you are interested in this data, we recommend that you go see Lister Stavely Smith um, as that data is available for use. Also MWA phase two observations of M83 and some phase one gleam and Spitzer observations of NGC 7793 were put together to study this source. Uh, by a summer student, but I believe the supervisor is now uh, writing up a paper. We also have a number of surveys that are led by some of the GEG team, 
in particular, we've got the Gleam Southern Galactic Pole, which was a data release that was given a 5,113 square degrees and published recently by Friends and et al. in 2021. And there's an extensive wiki page as well on the MWA wiki if anybody is interested in that data or using it. And my understanding is it's a combination of Gleam Year 1 and Year 2 um, for much deeper limits than what was originally published in Gleam. There's GleamX, which will have an update talk coming soon. Uh, the Gold Survey, which is the Gamma 23 Overwhelmingly Deep Survey, which you can see Nick Seymour if you're interested in. And also the Midas MWA Interestingly Deep Astrophysical Survey, which aims to provide deep imaging in six well-studied extragalactic fields. Um, a little bit more about Midas, so they have the first um, data release on the Gamma 23, which is internal only, as and it will be available as of the 25th of June. You can see Nick Seymour uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, they also have a number of uh, current papers, and some of these are also listed on the wiki page. Uh, so if you're interested in what some of the work is, you want to collaborate with some of this, you can look there. And, the, and they provided a couple of images that they're getting from that survey already, which is pretty exciting stuff. And so, and they're combining some of this with the Rax survey that was published uh, earlier in the year or late last year as well. So thank you very much. I hope that provided a, a quick and dirty overlook of what we're doing with the GEG stuff, um, but a lot of really exciting science. So if you are interested, then just let me know. Thank you. Yeah, friends, uh, she knows my talk. Any hands up? Or oh, any comments? Yeah, yeah, Chris, please. Okay, Hello. Right. Oh, well, um, <clears throat> thanks for that great overview. Um, there's so much cool science going on in GEG. Um, is there anything you're particularly looking forward to, you know, getting to grips with uh, in phase three with a new correlator? I guess for you being a spectral line person, that's probably going to be an absolute gold mine for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the the higher spectral um, the higher spectral resolution is going to be a major thing. And actually, I've got um, put in a discovery proposal with a group of people to look at large biomolecules, in particular chiral ones. And we've got a group that's working on the theoretical side. We've got a group that's working on um, the spectroscopy side, so actually has laboratory equipment. Um, we've got time in Germany on a synchrotron to do look at actual lab experiments of low frequency emitting lines, uh, which is pretty exciting. And we've gotten really awesome reviews on that discovery proposal. And that would be including using MWA um, data. And at the moment, we're using ACA and TIP and BILA um, to cor correlate with some of the other instrumentation we already have in Australia as well. So I think this will will really start putting it into the running where, you know, 23 kilometers per second for galactic science is, is really broad and, and quite difficult to use. Uh, but getting down into, you know, uh, five to 10 kilometers per second brings us into the realm of galactic science. And so I think it will be really exciting to be able to study these because the, the colder gas regions will be much easier to probe and there'll be a few other benefits as well. Awesome, thanks. Any hands up? Okay, thanks, you know, again so we can to the next next speaker so the next speakers are natasha and zhang xiang they will introduce the green x update please hello thanks can you hear me okay yes yes great and hopefully shortly be able to see some slides there we go Coming up okay? Right, okay. So, uh, yeah, Shan, do you want to move in just a shot for a, yeah. for a second? Uh, hopefully Zoom, Zoom allows it with the background thing. I'm not sure. There we go. Oh, hello. You can just appear, see us appearing out of the, the radio mode. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start off this presentation, um, but Shan's going to um, hop in halfway through. Um, we're tag-teaming today as uh, partners in continuum and polarization. 
So um, yeah, uh, GLEAMX, the Galactic and Extra Galactic All Sky NWA Survey, uh, is a uh, long running project. Um, we started in 2018. Um, and last year I commenced a feature fellowship, which allowed me to actually devote some time to processing the data um, and kind of developing the pipeline and uh, you know, hiring people to work on it. So um, the team has grown and I've, I've, I've tried to be a reasonably complete here, but I've, I've probably missed people because I've um, had lots of fantastic discussions um, across lots of people at Curtin, Syro and Shao and beyond. Um, and so this is a really a, a big team effort. So um, the surveys uh, comprises um, observations taken in 2018, a little bit of makeup time in 2019, and um, a final tranche was taken last year. And uh, it's similar to GLEAM, the drift scan um, method uh, across seven different declination strips, which gives us good coverage over the sky. But we've also taken, um, aside from just the meridian pointing down our angle zero, We've also taken two pointings um, at our angle plus or minus one. Um, we found in Gleam that there were some parts of the sky that were almost unusable due to um, bright A team sources in side lobes. And so this way we thought we'd have a better shot at getting um, decent noise levels if we just move that, those primary beam side lobes a little bit. Um, we still cover uh, the full uh, Gleam band, um, which with this, you know, the old school correlator, we're doing the five, five uh, 30 megahertz chunks. Um, and we are retaining resolutions of um, 40 kilohertz and two seconds. Um, the raw data are taken at the native correlator resolution, so 0.5 second um, and 10 kilohertz. So that stacks up to two petabytes of raw vis visibilities. Greg, if you're on here, I apologize, but I really need this data. So thank you for holding on to it for me. Uh, <laughs> um, and the plan with GleamX is to make this a full, uh, a full Stokes survey. Um, so uh, Chris did a fantastic job um, uh, take, uh, taking the Gleam data and creating POGs. And so we're trying to um, minimize our computational expense because the survey is four times larger by having more cooperation and trying to create the continuum polarization surveys at the same time. Um, the figure here shows, uh, well, the blue, star, everything underneath Dexit 30 has been observed. Um, the orange uh, area shows our planned first data release and the yellow area shows our planned second data release. And so this talk will mostly concern um, the first data release, but I'll come on to future plans at the end. So um, the continuum pipeline, I didn't have time to go into the entire uh, continuum pipeline because it would be really long. Um, but if you've read the Gleam paper um, or, or use that data, um, I've just talked about the differences from Gleam. So of course we have a, um, uh, a long baseline instrument. Um, and so we, are, uh, we have a higher resolution and we have fewer short baselines than Gleam. So when we're doing our sky model, um, we use the Gleam catalog plus a few 18 sources that I've done some fitting to um, as our reference. And we use um, the kind of inner uh, two kilometers of baselines to um, calibrate because um, if we use longer ones, we'd start to resolve out those sources. Uh, and calibrating directly to Gleam makes life very easy because every single uh, snapshot tends to be on the same flux density scale. Um, Tim uh, Galvin, I'm not sure if he's on this call because he's on leave at the moment, but um, he's been uh, taking the lead on kind of developing the pipeline uh, beyond my kind of bare bones sketches. And he's done a lot of automation work. So now, instead of kind of noticing that there's a terrible source in the side lobes after you've spent some time doing deep imaging, uh, we have an automated detection and subtraction of uh, side lobe sources. And one of the big changes is, again, because of the array configuration being different from the 128T, um, we needed to take careful uh, account of how our imaging would change the recovery of extended sources. So Stefan um, did some fantastic work uh, for uh, simulating different um, size sources and then looking at how imaging them with different parameters would or would not recover um, different amounts of flux density. I'm just showing here a plot with Briggs uh, robust 0.5 and multi-scale clean. And um, the ratio on the left-hand side shows the fraction of the source flux density recovered. And the, along the x-axis, you see um, the, the size of that full width half max at the Gaussian. And the, the don't worry too much about the red and blue lines, but the top dashed line, that's where you have 
um, cleaned the source with these settings, and you see that we had pretty good recovery, about 95% of flux density recovered out to about 10 arc minutes. If you change these settings, if you go robust zero, robust minus one, that line comes down and you don't recover um, the, the total flux density. Uh, so this was the best that we could do. And of course, if you do natural weighting, you'll get more flux density recovered, but you'll get lower resolution. So this was our, our compromise and um, optimal weighting scheme. And so just to sort of illustrate that, I've got my delightful animated GIF on the left. Um, most radio galaxies like that one on the, on the left-hand side are nicely recovered, but sort of large galactic objects like this nebula um, won't be completely recovered. So for those, you can just add gleam and uh, recover all of those uh, those larger scales. So the other big change that we made was with the original Gleam pipeline, we used the old analytic beam model because that's all that was available at the time. Um, now we have the all single dancing full embedded element primary beam model. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and we also have buckets of signal to noise. So while there still are a few small errors in that beam model, or possibly there are enough flagged dipoles in the array that the beam model isn't quite an adequate representation of the, of the reality of the array, um, we are able to correct them. So on the left-hand side is a panel where I have accumulated all of the measurements of sources against uh, what we expect from Gleam for a bunch of snapshots for a single um, uh, channel and a single night of GleamX. And I'm plotting it against declination. And you can see there's a very small tilt. Um, and the order here is sort of two, two to three percent um, from the top to the bottom. We can we have enough signal of noise that we can fit that and take it out. And so um, for every, this is kind of the worst one I could find. The, the corrections are quite small, this sort of two to three percent. Um, so for every nine for every channel, we're able to make this correction. So after that, you can still see there's still a lot of scatter. And so I think the flux density calibration probably isn't going to be better than 2%, but that's still pretty good. OK, the ionosphere is still fun. In fact, it's even more fun than it was with Gleam. Um, fortunately, uh, I can see Chris cheering. Yeah, our ionosphere. Don't be on team ionosphere. Um, <laughs> the array is bigger, uh, but it's not so much bigger that we're yet into um, critically nightmarish territory with the ionosphere. Um, what I'm showing here on these images are plots from Pitswarp, which is the software that Paul and I um, put together to uh, measure source positions and then create uh, a model and then move the FITS image, basically de-warp it back into place. And this is for like a couple of nights of doing, I just threw a GIF together. Um, what we're doing that's uh, that's different is we're now able to use MVSS and SUNS to do this um, de-warping because we have basically matched resolution with them um, much better than we were with Gleam. Um, and you can see on these images occasionally there's like gaps where there's not enough sources. Um, this is an older version of our processing pipeline and we have fixed that now. Um, Fitzwalk has this really nice iterative match where you can um, kind of uh, progressively fit a better and better model um, to, to get all of the atmospheric distortions. So we're saving all of this data. Um, we did a really nice analysis of the atmospheric weather um, with NRL for Gleam. Um, and so we're planning to uh, do another project with them for Gleam X, of course, four times bigger, better resolution. The other thing that we're putting in as a matter of course is um, binocular imaging. So sometimes, or you can't really see it here, sometimes the ionosphere is sufficiently different across the array that sources start to become incoherent and they start to stretch out. With Gleam, we just threw away that data. We were just like, we don't have time for this. With Gleam X, because we have so much redundancy, because we're doing four drift scans per deck, um, we are imaging everything and we're doing the binocular imaging. So we're splitting up the array into components and then trying to measure the altitude of things just as part of the pipeline. And if we um, like then come back, we have this huge data set where parts of it will be useful for checking the altitude of those different atmospheric effects. Um, also, we um, are optimizing the um, pipeline to search for uh, short duration transients. I have a, an interesting uh, result, which I didn't have time to present in this meeting, but Paul will mention. Um, where you, you, you do seem to see um, transients that we didn't expect. So we've changed the pipeline to add 
transient imaging stage. Um, this also allows us uh, to see the effects of the ionosphere on two second time scales. So the image that you're seeing on the right is um, every two seconds we've made an image, but we've subtracted out the, the total image, like the deep image that we made in routine imaging. So you're just seeing the differences between um, our, like the, the static model of the sky and what the ionosphere is doing every two seconds. And you can see that the sources have this like extra little butterflies appearing and disappearing in a very direction dependent array, uh, uh, way. Like this is only a couple of square degrees or actually pretty only less than a square degree of data. And you can see it's incredibly direction dependent. So this is way beyond our ability to calibrate out. And this is probably in most of the data. We do see variation night to night. Um, I know that uh, John Morgan and Chris Jordan have a fantastic honor student who is looking into this. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's, there's gonna be a rich data set here. We're retaining all of this information. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can really explore the atmosphere over the, the uh, observing time of Gleamex. Now, of course, what we want to do, that's all foreground in a way. Uh, we want to get to some of the astrophysics. So we are gonna stitch together all of those snapshots um, to form deep mosaics. This is very similar to how we did it for Gleam, do this in um, drift scans over the night. And um, we are experimenting with um, stacking all of the images in a night and then stacking nights together versus stacking all of the images that were ever taken for a patch of sky and you know making one deep mosaic in one go. Both seem to be giving the same results. So that's good from the point of quality control. We will probably stack images to produce night long mosaics because we can use those to do some quality control um, rather than going kind of all in one and stacking what might be some terrible images into uh, one mosaic at, uh, at once. The data products here, I've just given a little bit of an idea of how much live storage we need uh, every time we do a night of, of processing. Um, and yeah, we're pretty heavy users of the Astro Disk on Palsy. Right, so talking about that quality control, one thing we can do is we can look at how much the sources have been blurred. So how much they uh, are compact, un unresolved like source in MBSS um, now no longer looks like a point and now looks like a stretched thing. So on the left-hand side are some um, sort of the blur factor for four different nights covering the same patch of sky. Um, and the, the, what, the x-axis is basically just epoch. So each snapshot of each of those nights. And um, I think, yeah, the frequency is at the top. And you can see that the, the ionosphere behavior kind of is, is, is writ large here. So for the um, 2018-03-05, that's our favorite night. The ionosphere is very calm. The sources don't get blurred. That's really lovely. The other two, um, two of the nights have a kind of a lot of blur at the beginning, probably as the terminator line moves across the sky, um, but then they settle down and 0209, we hate it. Uh, <laughs> we're probably just gonna check that whole night out of the, the deep mosaics. That has a high blur factor all the way through. And when you look at it, you can see the sources are stretched and distorted. So because we have this, we can just um, throw that data away, not include it in the final mosaics um, and you know keep, keep it, for ionospheric reference, but not include it in, um, in our science, our astrophysics science data. Um, so if you look at the astrometry that you get, um, the right-hand plot uh, shows after we've done Fitzwarp and we've moved everything back together, um, we get pretty good astrometry, uh, standard deviation of uh, one arc second for signal to noise 50 sources, um, and the you know, systematic offsets of less than 0.1 arc second. However, if you flag out the bad data, you can do considerably better. So we're looking at you know, negligible um, systematic offsets and uh, really tight standard deviation. So we're really, really pleased with that. Um, and that should be a lot better than Gleam, um, which was quite limited by its low resolution and um, maybe not the best atmospheric corrections. All right, so we're getting onto mosaics. Um, noise is you know, one of the key things that we really wanted to bring down with GleamX use those long baselines to dig past the confusion noise um, and really show off millions of point sources. So on the left is a plot of RMS noise against the full frequency band um, covered by Gleamax. And the orange points are the eight megahertz channels um, that we do imaging on. Unlike Gleam, we've actually retained the 30 megahertz data all the way through because that turned out to be such a huge resource for Gleam that we, we never 
uh, expected to be so useful. Um, so those are shown in uh, with blue lines. And we've just done a little bit of work recently. Um, I was helped by this, uh, by Kat Ross with this. Um, she did a little bit of the, the data monkeying stuff. So thanks, Kat. Um, to just work out where our optimal averaging is across um, frequency to try and get a really, really deep image. And we found that if we use the top 60 megahertz, which is identical to Gleam, um, we get one Milijansky noise, um, one Milijansky per beam. So we're really, really happy with that. Um, that is, uh, you can see the gray area shows the sort of typical noise levels for Gleam. So we're basically an order of magnitude deeper than Gleam. And that is just brilliant. So we're on track to do that uh, over the whole sky. Um, SED is getting recovered, look really nice. Uh, the top left panel shows a typical source. They look, they all look like that. Um, I had to really <laughs> had to search through a lot of sources to find on the top right something with a some curvature on the bottom left, something that's really funky, uh, and on the bottom right something that's actually um, rising spectrum. So these are the blue line is just always a a log log fit and so it's terrible for the curved sources I just threw these together um so yeah they and the uh, flex density scale agreement is really nice um against gleam which makes sense because we did match it to gleam um so that's within a couple of percent all right so going forward uh on the continuum side um tim and i our next plan for this year is to do some galactic plane processing um i put together this really beautiful um image domain gridding um, prototype to take GleamX data and Gleam data and bring them together so that you get all of those lovely um, large spatial scales as well as the fine spatial scales. And that's so important for doing galactic astrophysics, um, you know, trying to understand supernova remnants and so forth. I've had to put it all to the side because of other uh, projects, but we're hoping to return to that later this year. Um, and we can get, recover really nice noise levels, even in the galactic plane, which is obviously full of emission. We're getting sort of five other janskies per beam noise in the middle of the band. So this should be really, really nice. Okay, so Shane's gonna take over now and talk about polarization for a bit. Oh, I'll just move out the way. Sorry. <laughs> I tangled up. There we go. Ah, thanks, Natasha. Uh, okay, uh, together with the continuous survey, we are also doing a, a full polarization survey with the Green X data. Uh, so we are using the top band uh, of the GleamX survey, that's the uh, 200 to 230 megahertz calibrated data directly from the continuous pipeline. Uh, sorry, sorry. Thanks for those. <laughs> and since the polarization angle is wrapping really fast at low frequencies, uh, for example, the top right panel is showing a polarized source with RM50. And as we can see, the polarization angle has wrapped nine times only between uh, 200 to 230 megahertz. That means we need to make really fine channel images. So uh, we are making about 400 uh, channel images, 80 kilohertz per channel uh, in full Stokes imaging. And after that, uh, we do Fourier transfer of frequency versus Q and U using the RM synthesis. Uh, currently, uh, one of the main issue we have is the big data problem. Uh, that's because when you image it, all the fan channels in full stocks, the data size is very large. For example, the number of OPSIDs in data release one is about 250, and the intermediate data size per observation is two terabytes. Well, the disk quota we have is only 50 terabytes. So it doesn't take a professional a mathematician to figure out there's a problem. Mm -hmm. The current solution is that we are using the data store tapes uh, so we can store the intermediate data over there, which is not very efficient. And we are seeking external uh, HPC resources. So the major updates uh, the polarization pipeline is basically following the previous work by Chris Wesley. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, and the, one of the major updates I would like to discuss is the XY phase correction. So the XY phase is a, a residual phase difference between the orthogonal X and the Y. Uh, and there's a no issue even for MW phase one. Uh, however, at that time, 
the x-ray phase is more like 10 to 15 degrees. So it's not a big problem, if, even if not corrected. Unfortunately, for MW phase two, the x-ray phase is more like 135 degrees. So it caused an obvious leakage from stocks U into stocks V. As we can see in the top panel, uh, here it shows the QUV spectra of a linearly polarized source without circular polarization, while the green curve shows stocks V. As we can see, due to the XY phase caused the leakage, uh, the stocks V is wrapping just like stocks Q and U. Uh, so based on this, we had to observe a linearly polarized source and measure the XY phase and then correct this. And then what we get is the bottom panel, the stocks V. Yeah, the leakage in stocks V just vanished. There are two points I would like to uh, mention here. One, the XY phase is super stable. Uh, we measured it multiple times between 2018 to 2020, and we always get the same results. So the XY phase might be uh, caused by some instrumental issue and uh, is currently being investigated by the MWA ops team. The other thing is uh, we need to correct the XY phase before applying the beam model. Uh, that's because if we do it the other way around, uh, it, it doesn't work very well uh, for sources with large zenith angles. Besides the XY phase, we have some other updates as well. Uh, for example, we are directly using data products from the continued pipeline. So we have the, the same benefits from the updates in the continued pipeline, such as in-field calibration. We are currently using the FEB model, uh, drastically reducing the leakage from stocks I into Q, U, and V. Uh, I think the uh, leakage has been reduced uh, from about 15% to 5% at the age of the images. We are also doing 3D arm synthesis, which allows us to see the extended polarized structure. So what do we get from the pipeline? Uh, here we have a movie uh, which shows, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, which shows the polarized sources as we go through the RM. At RM, uh, close to zero, we are seeing some uh, bright sources. Uh, don't be too excited, these are just leakage. But we are also seeing lots of sources at RM close to 10. Uh, these are the uh, real polarized sources. Uh, not sure if this would come up very clear in on your screens, but if we look closely, we can also see a faint shade sweeping through the field. That's the uh, galactic foreground emission, which is also polarized. Besides the compact sources, uh, we are also looking at the extended sources. Uh, for example, this is a large radio galaxy. The left panel here shows uh, the total intensity, which stops I while the middle panel shows its polarized flux. Uh, previously, uh, we detected the two hot spots, the north and the south hot spots, and uh, their polarized properties have been discussed before. Uh, using the new uh, GLEEX data and the updated pipeline, we revealed the, another bridge uh, close to the northern hot spot and also a bright polarized flow at the center region, which might be the back flow. And besides the linear polarization, since we are doing this XY phase correction, we managed to reveal the circular polarized sources as well. Uh, for example, uh, the left image here uh, shows the stops V image uh, with stops I overlap as counters. As we can see, there are multiple bright stocks I sources in this field, but only one source shows stocks V emission. And this one source is a no pulsar. However, the stocks V images are known to, to be contaminated uh, by leakage. 
So the right image here shows a, an AGN. But the interesting part is one of the lobes AGNs is showing positive Stokes V emission, while the other lobe is showing negative Stokes V emission. Uh, we are not sure if this can be caused by leakage or if this is real Stokes V emission from AGNs. So we are still investigating. So in conclusion, uh, we have updated the polarization pipeline, uh, fixed the XY phase, uh, so we can get the compact uh, and the extended polarized sources in linear, and we can also detect circular polarized sources. Thank you. Great, thanks, Yang. So I thought I'd just, uh, the last part of the talk, we're just gonna talk a very short amount about data management and then data release. So, um, as uh, Shang said, we have this very large data problem um, where we need quite a lot of live storage while we're doing our work. So um, the two systems that we've been using um, so far have been Magnus and Garawala at the Pawsey Center. Uh, I've obtained um, 3 million CPU hours on Magnus this year. And uh, if we use all of MWA size allocation, we have 2 million on Garawala. Um, <laughs> Sorry, everybody else. Uh, we'll just use whatever we can. Um, and across Group and Astro, we have about a petabyte of lab storage. Um, very soon, we, we're just negotiating with the research officers at the moment, but we are nearly done negotiating. Um, Shanghai, um, Tao, and group have um, are, are coming on board with a million CPU hours at their uh, SK prototype cluster. And they also have an enormous amount of storage, which they're planning to grow to about 20 petabytes. So. Um, we have the, the sort of, uh, resources that we need to process the data. Um, the main thing that has been holding up has been this terrible XY phase problem that we're, we're finally done. Um, once we've processed the data, we have to put it somewhere. It's no good just lying around on scratch disks. So we have a partnership with AAO Data Central. Um, they are hosting all of our images, our catalogs, um, the metadata, and we're just starting to port our Gleam VO service over to their um, servers, and that will be expanded to a Gleam X VO server as well. At the moment, they're only offering about 40 terabytes of storage, which, you know, in comparison to the data products is uh, not very much, but uh, we're, as we grow and as we use that, um, they're willing to make it larger and apply for more. Um, so we're, we're only filled about uh, 10 terabytes of that at the moment because that's, um, we're just kind of saving all the good mosaics and good snapshots. But um, once we get to the sort of 35 terabytes, we're gonna ask for more rather than throw data away. That does obviously leave a lot of raw intermediate data products um, that you know, we are having to delete things like giant RM cubes, um, sort of intermediate mosaics, uh, sort of weights and things. So if you are interested in sort of plugging into any part of the Gleamex pipeline, you know, like the ionosphere group, we were like, okay, well, what can we save? And we decided to add a transients um, stage, we're like, okay, how can we uh, fit this in using the minimum amount of time but saving the most maximally useful data products? We were able to do that. We're kind of coming to the end of being able to do add additional things to the pipeline because we're going to be in production for the rest of the year. So please let me know ASAP if you have any other uh, bits that you want to pull out of um, out of our data um, before it just you know get the intermediate stuff gets deleted. Um, we also have this interface, uh, which I've been promising for a long time. It does exist, uh, and that will allow you to kind of log in and see how the process is going. Um, I, I will try and circulate this at some point. So uh, in terms of timeline for actually releasing data, um, we are we, we just I just discovered one more issue. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just rerunning some mosaicing again. Um, but the very first uh, bunch of mosaicing we did, even with the bad data in it, looked very good. So we're pretty sure we should have um, an internal data release of the collaboration um, in the next month. And um, we're going to write up the survey description paper and that first data release covering about 3,000 square degrees um, should go out uh, uh, towards the end of this year. Um, then data release two uh, is quite straightforward because it's that galactic uh, anti-center area. So that is all extra galactic sky. That's quite straightforward. And we hope to get that out um, early, like an internal data release earlier next year. And as I say, our next sort of development priority will be um, tackling the galactic plane. So hopefully um, that will also be another paper next year where the data release three is just 
a hodgepodge of everything else or we put it all together I'm not sure that's that's quite off into the distance um, I'm funded until the end of 2024 um, but we should definitely get all the data out um, before then um, I will advertise that we have two PhD scholarships here at Curtin um, which nominally uh, could be on extragalactic and galactic science with GleamX so please advertise those to your networks um, they'll be going up again on the Curtin website soon uh, and I'll send them out to the MWA collaboration. If you're interested in getting involved in using Lebex for Science, then um, go through the GEG collaboration processes. Um, for the early data releases, there will uh, most likely be a builder's list, um, which uh, Chris and I will be formulating um, at some point. Um, so yeah, uh, reach out if you have any questions. I'm happy to take them now. Thanks. This is Natasha and Zhang Xiang's nice talk. And I see two questions from Juma. Uh, the first one is what transition time scale are you searching on? And the second question is what technique are you using to find the transitions? So sorry, what was the what tech what what are we using as the first question? Um, the first question is what transition time scale are you searching on? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so the time scale is two seconds. So that's on the average sample resolution. We, we, you know, the data are taken at 0.5 second resolution, but obviously if we do some averaging at the measurements at formation stage, that reduces the data volumes by a factor of four. So we only retain two second data and we're making images on that time scale. Um, uh, how I would say you would be able to detect anything between two seconds and two minutes. Um, and what technique? Um, at the moment, the those images that I showed where we have the differences between where the sources are, um, uh, we are retaining all of those. And um, I've got some pretty naive statistical stuff like taking an RMS measurement through the cube, um, which picks out um, potential transients. But I'm happy to, if you know, people want to take this and do some more searching, then great. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, any hands up or comments? Okay, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, so um, the Nico have some question for you. Have you have thought about fancy compressed skill for the intermediate data produced or is that asking for trouble? <laughs> um, yeah, good question, Nicole. Um, I guess we did look at sort of HDF5 files and there are some um, data products that we're able to compress. So for instance, the models that we generate, um, model files while we're doing the cleaning, we use multi-scale clean. So you end up with these like 10 to the minus 12 clean components all over the map. We wrote a very simple program to just mask everything that was below like 10 to the minus six and then zip it, right? And then you end up with a very small file. So we are trying where we can, um, but there's just some points where you have like a really big mosaic and it's it's full of rich, with delicious noise um, that can't really be compressed, so. Okay, uh, okay, Chris, please. Okay, I've got a very quick comment and a very quick question. Um, the comment is that this is all extremely awesome, loving the continuum of polarization results, keep being amazing. Um, my question, uh, when you're talking about the uh, correcting the position shifts, you mentioned that you've been using MPSS and SUMS. We know SUMS has, there, there are issues with both of these, coverage, sensitivity, dynamic range, et cetera. Um, have you looked at using racks at all? Because that's good sensitivity, uniform. Um, it, it covers the whole area of GleamX. Uh, or is the resolution mismatch possibly too much of an issue? Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. Actually, we just hadn't considered it because it didn't exist when we started the survey. Um, we could, I guess, well, one thing that's a huge barrier is the catalog hasn't actually been available. I don't know if Catherine's released that yet. Um, and so, of course, I'm not going to go through all the racks images and do the source finding myself. Um, so maybe when the catalog is available, that might be um, possible. Um, yeah, they should have less ionospheric effects. The resolution mismatch will be a bit of a problem. Um, we could use something like Puma. 
Um, if you have in more information about uh, any uh, issues with SUMS and MVSS, though, um, do drop me a line. I'd love to. I found a few horrors inside the galactic plane, but the extra galactic stuff seemed okay. So, if you have any info, let me know. Oh, thanks. Okay, thanks, Natasha and Jiang Xiang again. Uh, if you have any question, we can start in the Slack channel. So let's move to the next speaker, and Jess will report the greening of the first supermass black hole, a combined MWA and low far study to constrain low frequency spectral turnover. Let's let's welcome. Hi, uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. Fantastic. Okay, I'll just share my slides. Okay, hopefully the slides are showing. Yes, yes. Okay, brilliant. Yep, hi. Um, so I'll be uh, presenting uh, some work on behalf of an international collaboration studying high redshift radio galaxies. Um, so I'll be presenting some work led by my colleagues at Curtin, Guillaume Drouard and Nick Seymour, and also some ongoing collaborative work with George Shield at uh, CSIRO. Okay, so why do we want to study high redshift radio galaxies? Um, so if you look at the figure on the left, that's the famous... Uh, Hubble KZ relation, which is a plot of near infrared magnitude as a function of redshift. Um, so it's the radio galaxies that are among the most massive galaxies at a given redshift, and they trace out this 10 to the 12 solar mass baryonic mass envelope. So they're really vital probes of massive, massive galaxy formation uh, and evolution. So if you take, for example, that system on the right, the spiderweb galaxy, you've got dozens of systems merging hierarchically, you have radio emission being triggered, and the whole system is basically embedded in this giant gaseous nebula. How do systems like this evolve to the um, giant local CD ellipticals that we see in the more local universe? Um, additionally, finding very high redshift AGN is important for studying extreme processes uh, in the early universe. So the most distant AGN known at the moment is a quasar at redshift 7.64, and it has a billion solar mass black hole just 670 million years after the Big Bang. So that implies highly efficient accretion and or large uh, black hole seeds. Okay, so high redshift radio galaxies are really interesting to study, but first we need to find them um, and they're rare objects. Um, so it's really deep low frequency surveys such as Gleam that's providing fresh momentum in the search for very high redshift radio galaxies. Um, traditionally, these sources are found via selecting sources uh, that have ultra steep uh, spectra in the radio. Um, so recently, Saxena cross-matched TGSS with FIRST and NVSS, and they discovered TGSS 1530, which I show in the top right of the slide. And that's the, currently the most distant known radio galaxy at a redshift of 5.72. It's a billion years after the Big Bang. Um, so that's a USS selected source. But in our project, we're using a different technique. So we're selecting on the basis of radio spectral steepness and curvature within GLEAM. Um, additionally, rather than using what can be time-consuming optical spectroscopy, we use ALMA to both get a high-resolution radio morphology and also a redshift via the detection of molecular uh, emission lines. Um, now, with this steepness and curvature selection, as I show in the bottom here, Gleam is really perfect for this thanks to the excellent uh, low-frequency broadband coverage. Um, and essentially, what you can do, if you look at the figure in the bottom right, is you can take well-studied lower redshift sources you shift the, you redshift their radio spectra to, to, to higher redshifts. And then there's this um, part of the parameter space, the, the spectral steepness curvature parameter space, which essentially optimizes our search for very distant radio galaxies. Uh, so what we did, we did a pilot study in the gamma nine field, that's an equatorial field of four sources. And they're marked with the red circles in that bottom right figure. And we discovered from this pilot study, Gleam 0856, which is the second most distant radio galaxy at a redshift of 5.55. Um, and um, you can see that that's the ALMA spectrum at 100 gigahertz, um, detection of two CO emission lines. This is a quite a bright radio source as shown in the top right. Um, the red ALMA contours show two clear components, one um, uh, that's coincident with the very faint host galaxy. There's also some uh, fainter contours to the north um, which I'll show later on that appears to be real emission. So it's rather asymmetric radio source, about 25 kiloparsecs in size. Note that this source wouldn't have been uh, picked up with an ultra steep, steep spectrum uh, selection technique. So that's a, a very exciting discovery. Um, 
So in addition to 0856, uh, another uh, source of uh, great interest from the pilot is 0917. Um, so this is, a, again, a compact radio source as shown in, in that uh, overlay plot there. Um, it's a bit fainter than 0856. Again, another source that wouldn't have been selected with the USS selection technique. Um, so based on the pilot study, initially the, the first ALMA spectrum that we got suggested this source appeared a redshift 10, which would have been super exciting. Unfortunately, follow-up DDT campaigns with ALMA and the JVLA did not um, support this interpretation. So in the bottom figure there, um, so you can see the initial uh, ALMA spectrum at the top and then the deeper spectrum at the bottom. Note that the, the uh, y-axis scale changes. But those gray shaded lines show the uh, possible tentative detection of, of emission lines, but the deeper spectrum, um, we don't see anything. So 0917 is quite a mysterious source and Guillaume has led this uh, large detailed multi-wavelength follow-up study. And we've just resubmitted that now to PASA after the initial referee report. Just a few uh, take home points on this source. Um, in the top figure, that's a, a plot of the uh, radio to near infrared flux density ratio as a function of redshift. So 0917 is the orange line. It has a very extreme uh, ratio. So it's a very radio loud object. In fact, 0856 is the most extreme source on that plot. So by selection, we're finding sources that are very powerful in the radio, but very faint uh, in the near infrared. Um, it's also a, quite a molecular gas pore system. Our ALMA data also suggests that there's a lack of dust. Um, the bottom left figure there is the optical near infrared SED. Um, so we've got our K-band detection, and then uh, we've got upper limits as well, the deepest ones from Subaru. So there's a clear break there in the spectrum. And if that's due to Lyman Alpha, then that suggests the source could be, be above a redshift of seven. Um, of course, it's a little bit more complex than that. So what Guillaume has done is fitted Galaxy templates, that optical to near infrared SED. Um, and there's basically two possible solutions. One is the source between a redshift of two, two and three. It has to be extremely obscured with a very specific dust geometry. Um, the other possibility is it is above a redshift of seven. Um, and we've also got Hubble data to try to un unravel the mystery of this source. Um, that's shown in the bottom right there. So that's our first imaging observation. Again, we detect the host galaxy clearly. We've got GRISM data as well um, that we're currently analyzing. So stay tuned. It's quite challenging. Um, we're nearly done with that uh, analysis and we'll be publishing a paper on that soon. Just a few more points on 0917. Um, so it's not polarized below 10 gigahertz. That includes uh, in the MWA POM survey. Uh, John Morgan will be talking about IPS observations with the MWA later in this meeting. Um, for our source, one possibility from the IPS data is that half of the flux is very compact within a region of uh, 1.6 kiloparks sets if the source is above a redshift of seven. And we've got upcoming v VLBI observations to resolve the compact radio morphology just in a couple of weeks from now. So that'll be really interesting uh, to see what the morphology looks like uh, at higher resolution. Okay, so um, you know, GLEAM has great uh, uh, spectral coverage um, at low frequencies, but there's some interesting scientific possibilities if we combine the GLEAM data with even lower frequency data from LOFAR. So we've got the two broadband SEDs there on the right. Um, the triple power law fit is shown with a solid line, a double power law fit with a dashed line, and then the uncertainties in purple. And you can see the low frequencies of the two fits deviate. And if you can see in the insets there, there's some hint that the source is, both sources are starting to turn over at low frequencies. So we obtained a low far low band data last year for these two sources between 34 and 66 megahertz. And we took seven runs to have some redundancy in case of um, poor ionospheric conditions. We've got low far out of the high northerly latitude and we're looking at a source at the equator. So the elevation is not too high. Um, so I've got some preliminary res results to show from this work. Um, we're still processing a lot of the data. It's quite slow to do that, um, unfortunately, but still some interesting results to show. So these are preliminary uh, wide band images uh, centered at 50 megahertz. Um, and we can see that we detect both sources clearly, which is really nice. I mean, very low frequency equatorial imaging, clearly detect both sources. The noise level is really good. Um, both sources still quite bright at 50 megahertz. The two point spectral indices between 50 megahertz and the bottom of the gleam band suggest for 0856 that the source is flattening a little bit and for 0917 that the source is very flat. Um, so to follow this up some more, 
We can do um, broadband spectral fitting, um, including the low far point. So we have excellent low frequency coverage now, and then also our higher frequency data. Um, and then we break up the low far band into eight four megahertz channels. So we have fluxes from 36 to 64 megahertz. And if we do a triple power law fit to all of the data that we have, there's evidence of a spectral turnover at about 30 megahertz, which in the rest frame is around 200. I've also had to make a, some corrections to the low far data because it's on a slightly different flux scale to the Gleam data. And if you make a first order correction, it looks like things are lining up really well. So similarly for uh, 0917, um, we've uh, also then um, done similar uh, power law fitting. Um, and then again, using all of our data from all the way from 36 megahertz through to 100 gigahertz. Um, and with a triple power law fit, uh, you have evidence of a turnover at 50 megahertz, basically confirming the, um, the hint of that in the Gleam data only. And that would be 400 megahertz if the red shift is above uh, seven. Um, interestingly, the low, um, the very low frequency spectral index is around 1.5 from this fit. If you look at the uh, 10 to 90th percentile range, there's a tentative hint that that spectral index is uh, not as steep as you would get for synchrotron self-absorption. So that's quite interesting, but um, more investigations are needed. And then what also I've, I've done is um, I've just considered the data below 1.4 gigahertz. And I've just done some simple synchrotron self-absorption and free-free absorption fitting. Um, basically, you've got higher frequency spectral steepening. So if you just uh, constrain it to the lower frequencies, you assume a single power law fit and then, and then the turnover. And if you do that fitting for 0856 and 0917, you get results that broadly agree with the uh, triple power law fitting over a wider frequency range. So lower frequency turnovers, um, and then you can um, work out some equipartition magnetic fields as well. Um, again, this is very preliminary work. Um, I'd be interested in the EOR experts whether a 1.2 milligauss uh, equi equipartition magnetic field for 0917 sounds uh, sensible. Um, from this fitting, we can't really distinguish between synchrotron self-absorption uh, and, and free free absorption. Um, essentially, as you can see there, we really need to go to even lower frequencies, maybe even down to 10 megahertz, for example, for 0856. Um, we may be able to do that with LOFAR. Um, there are some test observations taking place for a, a, a survey uh, centered on about 20 megahertz. I think the more fun possibility is MWA phase four on the moon. Um, that could also do the job as well. <laughs> Okay, so, so yeah, so we've got uh, more runs to obviously to process for this. So, I mean, some interesting results, but um, more tests to be done. Um, just lastly, on, on the lower frequency results, so there's the well-known turnover frequency linear size relation. So larger sources turn over at lower rest frame frequencies. So I just wanted to see where our points um, were on that relation. Um, and they're, they're not, they're, I mean, they're, they're quite consistent with previous lower frequency data, as you can see in this plot here on, on the left. Um, um, Basically, also as well, you've, you've got those uh, small cutout images there on the right, just to show our radio morphology. So for the 0856, the ALMO contours, I've overlaid them on VLAS. So it's a very asymmetric source, and the largest angular size is four arc seconds. So that corresponds to about 25 kiloparsecs um, projected linear size. And then 0917, there's a hint, a tiny hint of extension in the, in the first data. So basically, I've used those largest angular sizes to work out the linear sizes. Um, for the candidate redshifts for 0917 and 0856. But um, yeah, they seem to be quite consistent with uh, the previous lower frequency data. So maybe they just redshifted compact steep spectrum sources or peak spectrum sources, essentially. One thing to note though, is that there is a, large, a, a linear size upper limit at higher redshifts. And that's because you have lots of inverse Compton losses. So essentially, if you were to sort of do this plot on the left at higher redshifts, you start to lose the lower right to hand corner because you won't see sources that are so large, um, you only, because um, essentially the emission, um, there, there are significant emission uh, losses. So there's, there's various steps that we need to do to follow on with this work. And that's to do, for example, um, more fitting, but incorporating um, um, the broadband fit, incorporating synchrotron self-absorption and free free absorption models into that. And then the other runs to be processed, unfortunately that takes quite a while to do. And maybe we can also save some processing time by just uh, using kind of the shorter baselines. We don't necessarily need high resolution data uh, for our, um, our science. I think I'm nearly out of time. So just one or two slides on how we're expanding our pilot study. Um, so based on the success of the work uh, for, from the pilots, 
Um, with the caveat of small number statistics, there's excellent potential for finding many more high redshift radio galaxies. So we've taken Gleam and we've also then uh, uh, considered the full Viking near infrared survey. So that's 20 times larger than, the, than our pilot study. We consider all the Gleam sources in that region. And our goal is to build a sample of high redshift radio galaxies within the epoch, epoch of realization. Um, so just very quickly, so we're going an order of magnitude deeper than the pilot in terms of our flux density selection. And then we apply our steepness and uh, curvature criteria. So if you look at the plot uh, there on the top of the figure, so there are all the curved sources in Gleam and we select sources in that lower left-hand region. And those black circles are previously known um, galaxies above, uh, radio galaxies above a redshift of four. So this selection, for example, would find the majority of those. And then if we apply various other criteria, for example, selecting very compact sources and those without near infrared counterparts, we're left with 55 really good high redshift radio galaxy candidates, like that small cutout I show at the bottom of the slide. And if our technique is as efficient as the pilot suggests, then uh, you know, a sample of many tens of powerful radio galaxies within the EOR uh, may well be achievable. Um, and we very much hope so. Um, and, and again, just very quickly, we have broadband radio spectra for all of these sources from Gleam all the way through to the compact array at 10 gigahertz. And our plan is also to get ALMA data. So we, we want to again model these sources to look at energy loss mechanisms, um, to understand the environments in which these sources reside to determine, for example, jet powers and ages. Okay, so um, I'll just leave these conclusions up. Just two uh, main take home points. Really Gleam has been vital here for these um, exciting discoveries and also for facilitating these, this, these large multi-wavelength observing campaigns with a selection of world-class telescopes across the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and you know, based on the success of our pilot, we really want to build on that now. Um, so we've got this new sample of 55 high rigid radio galaxy candidates and um, you know, we hope in the near future to find many more very high redshift, powerful radio galaxies within the, within the EOR, which would facilitate high impact science. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Nice job, Jess. I can't wait to uh, read your publications. Uh, is there any hands up or comments? Yeah, Chris, please. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Jess. That was a great talk. I'm loving the MWA low fast synergy, and I'm so glad that the LVA data is coming out so good. Um, a question about, I think, J0856, where you see the offset in ALMA between the continuum and the molecular gas. Is that a sign that you're seeing some kind of jet driven outflow of molecular gas, perhaps? Yes, that figure. Um, so I, I, so I, I, I should have uh, pointed out with those, uh, those contours are quite uh, low signal to noise as, as indeed, I mean, the, the spectrum at the bottom suggests. So those contours go up to four sigma. Um, did that actual spectrum though was um, extracted at the position of the host galaxy. So my understanding is that if um, you moved that point, then you really, you, you don't see anything in, in the spectrum. So. I think that apparent offset there, I, I don't know if you can read too much into that. It might be worth checking again. I mean, that would be very interesting what you suggest, but uh, don't know if we quite have the signal to noise to do that. Maybe a, a deeper ALMA run could be interesting to get for this source too. Cool, okay, thanks, Jess. Thanks, Jess. Uh, there I have another question for you. How high about Z equals 6.5? Do you expect to go in the sample? Uh, so, sorry, can you can you repeat that? Okay, how high about Z equals six point five? Do you expect to go in that sample? It's in the chatting. Oh, I so I, I don't know if I quite follow that question. Um, I, I might have a look at the chat and then I'm, I'm happy to to answer that. Yes, yes, I, thank I you. I can ask Jess if you can hear me. It's not, it's a yes. question from Mrs. Cap. Yeah, I was just wondering. You you said you expect to find. Um, high redshift radio galaxies above redshift 6.5. Do, do you expect, how, how high in redshift do you expect to go with that sample? Would you push to redshift seven? Oh, okay, so, sorry, I, I, I understand now. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think, well, 
I mean, we, we could put some very rough limits on what we may expect. Um, I mean, so we've got to discover at redshift 5.55, and then we have another source above a redshift of seven. I mean, say, you know, if, if this source was you know, around a redshift of seven or eight, that provides some kind of rough range where we may expect these sources to be. Um, I mean, that is a bit speculative. I mean, we have, I think we have definite hopes that we could potentially find these powerful radio galaxies above a redshift of seven. We've got the quasar discovery recently, a redshift of 7.64. I mean, that's not radio loud. So we don't quite know for sure, but um, I think there is some distinct potential that we could find some of these sources above a redshift of seven or, or eight. That'll be interesting to see. Great, thanks, Jess. First, Jess, again, so let's look forward very much. to the, Yes, let's looking forward to the final report of the GG session. Then we report a synchro fit, a uh, Python based synchrotron spectral fitting code. Yes, uh, Ben, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Two seconds. And can you see my screen? Yes, I can see that. Perfect. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for scheduling this event and uh, for scheduling me a talk. Um, today, I just want to showcase Synchrofit, which is a Python package written by myself and Ross Turner, uh, who's a collaborator of mine from the University of Tasmania. Synchrofit is a synchrotron fitting code used primarily for modeling the spectra of radio lobes. Um, this originally started out as a few handy Python functions that we wrote to help with my current work. Um, and then we just decided to turn this into an easy to use Python package that is currently available and fully documented on GitHub. Uh, why isn't it changing? There we go. So just as a brief recap, here we have a radio galaxy. Um, we've got these powerful jets. Uh, that are being launched from the supermassive black hole at the center of the host galaxy. Uh, these are propagating out into the intergalactic environment uh, where they will eventually terminate to produce these large cocoons uh, of plasma. The plasma emits optically thin synchrotron radiation, which enables us to observe these at, with radio telescopes. Um, and to begin probing the energetics, what we want to do is observe the lobes at many different frequencies. And by doing so, we start sampling the spectral energy distribution, which typically looks something like the diagram on the right, uh, where we have this power law radio spectrum. <clears throat> um, what's important here is that the high energy electrons lose their energy at a faster rate. And what this means is that as the radio galaxy begins to age, um, a break frequency is introduced into the spectrum. Uh, let's get this to play, there we go. Uh, a break frequency is introduced into the spectrum above which we can see the effects of the plasma aging. Now, eventually the jets will turn off, which removes this mechanism responsible for replenishing the lobes with fresh electrons. And when this happens, this introduces a second break frequency above which we can see that very sharp um, that very sharp decline uh, or the turn off in the radio spectrum. And that is directly due to the complete absence of high energy electrons once those jets have turned off. And so one thing that we can do, provided we have the spectral coverage, is that still playing? Oh, here we go. One thing we can do, provided we have the spectral coverage, is we can actually model these break frequencies and then extract from those break frequencies the actual spectral age of the lobes. Um, to do this though, we need to properly parameterize our radio spectrum, which is in essence the idea behind SynchroFit. <clears throat> so uh, basically, uh, uh, basically what I want to do is just quickly go through some underlying physics. Uh, I want to go through how the modeling is actually done and then end on some usage cases for how you might want to use SynchroFit for your own radio galaxies. So, uh, so this is the general form of the synchrotron emissivity. Basically what we have is the single electron spectrum integrated over the electron energy distribution, the pitch angle distribution, and the magnetic field strength distribution. And there's a few, um, 
There's a few constants in there as well. Now, Synchrofit offers three unique spectral models, um, which basically describe different forms for what these distributions can take. Uh, and it's important to understand what these models are, since depending on exactly what it is you're trying to model, uh, this will dictate which spectral model is applicable to you. So to understand which model applies to which cases, um, I want to just touch on some lobe uh, dynamic basics. So when we talk about injection, and I'm looking at the top right diagram at the moment, um, we can think of it as the jets continuously injecting packets of electrons at that hotspot. Um, each packet contains electrons of effectively the same age, and they are initially injected with a zero age, okay? And as these packets of electrons propagate away from the hotspot, they will begin to age. And given that this is a continuous process, in other words, the jets are continuously pumping in these new packets of electrons, what we end up with is a gradient, an age gradient across the lobes. And this is uh, as evidenced by the diagram in the bottom right there. So for example, if I was to look at the spectrum within these three different beams across the lobes, we would see that the beams further from the hotspot have incurred more spectral aging, which is why we see more significant spectral curvature in those beams. <clears throat> so with that in mind, here we have the KP and the JP models. Now, these models are used to describe the spectrum of an impulsively injected plasma. Uh, in other words, any plasma population that has been injected at the same time. So for example, if I wanted to model the spectrum of individual regions across the lobes, I would use one of these models. And that's because provided the region across the lobe is small enough, it's reasonable to treat these as effectively having been injected at the same time, okay? Now, the expression here uh, just gives the time-dependent energy distribution. And we can see that there are two separate energy ranges to consider there, and that's effectively just saying above and below the break frequency. Um, in fact, the only difference between the KP and the JP models is that the JP model assumes electron pitch angle scattering, whereas the KP model does not. Um, for radio galaxies, no pitch angle scattering is, isn't really physical. Um, so I would suggest to just stick with the JP model. However, in the literature, the KP model is very prominent. So we decided to include this in SynchroFit anyway. Um, whereas on the other hand, um, the continuous injection model assumes a mixed age population of electrons. So anytime we're trying to model, say, an unresolved source or the total spectrum of um, an entire radio lobe, we would want to use the CI model um, as we're dealing with plasma populations of different ages. Um, now the full, oh, this is actually a outdated slide, sorry. Um, this more complex model is actually the full CI model. And you can see that there are three different energy ranges. And that's just because we've got two break frequencies to consider. And so the three different energy ranges are just those ranges between those two break frequencies. Um, however, the if the source is known to be active, in other words, there's no remnant phase to consider, then the CI off model just simplifies to the CI on model. So it's just a simplified version of that more complex model. Um, yeah, so that, 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 that's the CI model basically. Um, probably the main thing to take away from this is that when we're fitting the JP or the KP models, we're trying to estimate an injection index and a break frequency. Whereas the CI model has this additional remnant fraction that needs to be estimated as well. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do when we're fitting these models to our data. <clears throat> um, another thing I need to mention is that um, for each of the models that I've just presented, there is a standard variant and there is a triple variant. The standard variant assumes that there is a constant magnetic field across the lobes, whereas the triple assumes that there are local inhomogeneities in the magnetic field strength. Now, although the triple model is actually more physical uh, than uh, a uniform magnetic field uh, across the lobes. Um, this actually doesn't matter. Sorry, the, the triple variant only really changes your spectrum 
uh, for the JP and the KP models. Whereas for the CI models, um, the local inhomogeneities don't actually have that much influence on your overall integrated radio spectrum. So essentially what I'm saying here is unless you're using the JP model, um, I would just stick with the simpler um, standard model. And another reason for this is that if we can assume that the, the, mag the magnetic field is constant, then there's no real need to integrate over it, right? So we can rewrite this mod of the, the, the triple integral and we can um, simplify that down to a double integral. And that's actually very useful to us because that speeds up the um, computational speed significantly. Um, anyway, that's all documented in, in the documentation and you can read that if uh, you need to know more. Right, um, so, to get going with the fitting, all that's required from the user is the observed spectrum as well as the desired model to fit the data. Now, there are many additional options that can be customized by the user depending on their particular needs. Uh, and all of this again is documented. However, the default values set in the code try to offer the best balance between precision and computational speeds. And we've just done this by just some basic testing. Um, the fitting itself uses an adaptive likelihood, uh, maximum likelihood algorithm. Basically, what we're doing is we're creating a grid that allows us to sample the allowed ranges for the injection index, the break frequency, and the remnant fraction. And by iteratively finding the spectral fit for each of these set of parameters, we can essentially estimate the most probable values. Um, so I'll just quickly demonstrate what this looks like. First, we set up the adaptive grid, which just controls how many times we want to update the allowed ranges for the break frequency, the injection index, and the remnant range. Next, we set up the parameter space that we want to sample. We then find the spectral fit for each set of parameters where this spectral models function is those spectral models that we've just been talking about previously. Um, for each model, we then calculate the chi-squared and probability statistics where we're using the spectral fit, the raw data, and the measurement uncertainties. <clears throat> Once we've sampled that entire grid, we then want to find the set of parameters that gave the most probable fit to our data. Um, and uh, once we find the most probable values, we then estimate their uncertainties by just taking the standard deviation from the marginal distributions. And then finally, we update the grid ranges where we're centering our current, sorry, we're centering our ranges on our current most probable values. So we're essentially trying to hone in on what the true parameter is, value of the parameter, I should say. Um, and eventually what we find is that, oh, that's right, wrong slide. Um, eventually what this spits out is a value for the injection index, the break frequency and the remnant fraction, as well as the uncertainties on those parameters. So to bring this all together, I thought I'd finish up by demonstrating a few usage cases. <clears throat> Suppose you see curvature in the integrated radio spectrum of your radio source. You can use SyncroFit to determine whether your curvature is consistent with an active source or whether it requires the source to be a remnant, right? So you're actually trying to tease out the underlying nature of your radio source. Um, I actually had this exact problem uh, not too long ago where I had selected a remnant radio galaxy candidate based on the absence of a radio core. However, it wasn't clear to me whether this reflected a genuinely quiescent AGN or whether the core was simply too faint to detect. And so in this case, um, modeling the energetics became very important because what we basically found was that the spectrum was too steep at the higher frequency end in order for the source to remain consistent with an active injection model. So basically my point here is that the modeling the energetics of the lobes can give you that independent constraint on what the source actually is. Suppose you're modeling a radio source and you want to, uh, sorry, and you know it's redshift and magnetic field strength. Well, then you can relate the break frequency to a spectral age. Now, let's say you repeat this over a sample of radio sources. What you've actually now done is you've sampled the age distribution of radio galaxies, which hasn't been done before, as I'm aware, and it actually starts to tell you about their evolutionary life cycle. 
Okay, so Syncofit obviously provides a small module that will do the spectral age calculation for you. Um, moving on, suppose you have a high resolution broadband radio coverage for a particular radio galaxy. Well, you can implement the JP models to measure the spectral age across the source. And if your source is bright enough and well resolved, you can actually start doing very interesting things with the dynamics where you're using the spectral age to trace the bulk flow of the plasma throughout the lobes. And given the capabilities of all these new facilities, such as the upgraded GMRT, ASCAP, Meerkat, and of course the SKA at some point, this is actually something that we can start doing over reasonable sample sizes. So that's actually something that's quite exciting for me. Um, and just to finish up, I want to quickly mention the applications to supernova remnants. The radio emission produced by a supernova remnant is also synchrotron. Um, and as far as the spectral models are concerned, a supernova remnant is effectively just an impulsively injected population of electrons, right? That, that entire shell is the same age. Um, so in principle, you could estimate the age of the supernova remnant by modeling its spectrum with the JP model. Um, now, yes, this is probably challenging in practice because these things are usually very extended and low surface brightness. And I, I question how high frequency you can go up to before you simply can't detect these. But the point is that the capability is certainly there. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'll leave it at that and open up for some questions. Thank you. Nice talk, friends, Ben. Uh, any questions? Oh, sorry. Any hands up? Yes, please, Rose. Um, really cool talk. Um, I was just wondering, is there any plan to include the absorption models as well? Um, so I think it's really cool that you can actually just come in and um, have like a really definitive value of like finding information for your source. Um, and I, I know the peaked source community would love something very similar. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm pretty sure there was a we didn't we have a colloquia just like a couple of weeks ago. And I remember at the end during question times, there were some talks about this as well. Um, I think in principle, you certainly could, it, as long as the physical models are exi exist there, you could use the same type of algorithm where you're sort of approximating what the best fit is for the for that particular model. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say it is possible to do this. It's a bit beyond my scope at the moment. So um i think there would need to be like some significant interest and probably someone hounding on me to actually <laughs> try and do that but yeah you're right you, you could absolutely do something similar to this in that sense um cool uh quick follow-up as well um in the example you showed where you had the um ci on and ci off and you were determining which was the better model yeah this one um so like yes in this example clearly the ci off is a better fit um, how clear is it in um, other examples? Like, can you really definitively say, yes, it's this one, or yes, it's not that one? Um, or is it often like quite blended that it could be either? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so the caveat here is that this is really limited to how, to the highest frequency that you're probing, right? Because if you look at both of these models, if you, you know, below frequencies of about two gigahertz, these models, I mean, the data is consistent with each model, right? And that's because the source hasn't aged enough for that break frequency to propagate low enough in such that, you know, in order for you to see a, an appreciable difference between the off model and the on model. So yes, that's the caveat. You need high enough frequencies to actually sufficiently probe that curvature. Um, uh, so, so yeah, to answer your question, you, just because something is modeled by a CI on model does not necessarily mean that is it is active. It could just have switched off so recently uh, or, or you just haven't sampled high enough to actually see that second break frequency, okay? Um, but if you have modeled something by the CI off model, as in you have 
your CA off model does give a better fit, um, then you know, I would I would argue that yes, it does give you a good constraint. So essentially, I'm saying is you can go one way. You can say yes, it's a remnant and not an active source, but you can't go the other way in the sense that you can't say, well, it's active, it's definitely active, and definitely not remnant. So there is that um, caveat there. Thank you so much. Great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Nick? Ben, uh, lovely talk. Um, just a quick question. Do you think it'd be possible from this code to uh, determine what the inverse Compton emission spectrum would be across a wide frequency range? I know that's probably a bit beyond what you're planning to do. Yeah. I mean, so this obviously just treats the synchrotron component, um, but I mean, in principle, I think so. I, you know what? I think I'd have to talk with Ross about that because I did actually mention this one time, um, particularly modeling the spectra of higher redshift sources, but I, I'm not too familiar at the moment. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say yes, you can, and <laughs> no, you can't until I understand that a bit better myself. Um, but I think um, you know, in rays that the 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 inverse Compton component is actually treated uh, there. Um, Synchrofit sort of takes an element of that and just just models the synchrotron component, obviously. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, something to ask Ross, I guess. And I will let you Thank know. You. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ben. And uh, so now we finish order our presentation. So, Chris, do you want to say something? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I guess Neil would normally do this, but uh, if um, all I really, I guess, is left to say is uh, thank you to all the speakers for some great GG talks. Thank you to Aileen for being a fantastic session chair and keeping everyone to time. And I guess it's time for coffee. We will see you all back here in about 20 minutes at uh, 10 past whatever hour it is, wherever you are. Uh, see you in 20. I see people coming back to the Kyra boardroom. So I think uh, we can get started. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Aman. So, um... Yeah, I'm going to give the uh, Transients Group update talk. Uh, the Transients Groups are significantly smaller than many of the other groups, so this talk will not take uh, quite so long. Um, there's sort of three things that we um, are focusing on at the moment, uh, three uh, things of interest to report. Um, two of them are new capabilities with the MWA, um, and one of them is a new methodology that we've developed. Um, so the first capability uh, is focused around uh, short GRBs and gravitational wave mergers. Uh, so the, um, the idea here is that um, the link between short GRBs and gravitational wave events, uh, which was very nicely demonstrated by the first ever gravitational wave detection, um, has prompted a lot of models. Um, and some of these models predict either prompt FRB-like uh, coherent emission or persistent uh, dipole emission um, from these uh, gravitational wave mergers, um, in particular binary uh, neutron star mergers. Um, and there's also um, possibility that a stable or semi-stable uh, merger product, uh, such as a magnetar, um, could also uh, produce some radiation. So what we're focusing on here um, is the prompt FRB-like emission and the persistent dipole uh, radiation. Uh, so as I think we reported this at the 2019 um, uh, project meeting in Japan, um, that we have a, a new capability with the MWA, which is a rapid response triggering mode. 
Um, so this is a, a mode in which we can receive alerts from an external instrument um, and the MWA is able to parse those events, um, perform various uh, checks about whether the event is of interest, whether it should be observed, um, look in the current MWA schedule to see what's already going on, and then if necessary, interrupt the schedule and uh, create some new observations. So the thing that makes the MWA such a, an amazing instrument for these rapid response follow-ups or particularly follow-ups of um, gravitational wave events or of GRBs um, is firstly, it's a very large field of view. Um, so uh, X-ray and gamma ray instruments such as Fermi and SWIFT um, can have, well, SWIFT has a fairly small um, uncertainty on the uh, GRBs that it discovers, but uh, Fermi can have GRB uncertainties up to tens of degrees, uh, at least in the early notices. So a large field of view from the MWA of a few thousand degrees um, is extremely beneficial there. Um, the electronic steering so that the uh, telescope can be on target and collecting data within only 20 to 30 seconds is also extremely useful. Um, <clears throat> on the plot that you see on the bottom left here, this is from our 2019 paper, uh, it shows the um, dispersion delay on the vertical axis versus redshift on the horizontal axis. Um, and so for GRBs, which is the sort of blue shaded region, um, the sort of minimum to typical and maximum redshift range, you can see that we would expect dispersion delays between the, this is the delay between the gamma ray signal and um, if a prompt uh, signal is emitted at that same time, the delay for that to reach down to 185 megahertz where we're observing. You can see that the delays range from about 10 seconds up to a couple of hundred seconds, depending on the redshift and what location you're looking through um, our own galaxy. Um, you can also see the gravi first gravitational wave detection here, 170817 um, was not only at a very low redshift, but it was actually meant that it was at a, uh, a fairly small dispersion delay. Um, in fact, just a little bit short of what the MWA uh, was capable of at the time. So um, we, with this um, new capability in place, we have um, uh, initiated a, um, an observing program uh, to follow up a range of different uh, transient events. Um, and the ones that we're reporting on here are the ones that we've had some success with, which are the GRBs. So the strategy is to trigger a 30 minute observation um, and for us to process the data, um, making images on 30 minute time scales, two minute time scales, 30 seconds, five seconds, and half a second time scale. This range of time scales uh, is because we're looking for either a prompt, um, very uh, narrow signal, or we may be looking for the turn on of a, uh, some persistent emission. Um, so to capture those different um, emission states, uh, we um, collect the, well not collect the data, we uh, analyze the data on a range of different time scales. So this is all with the uh, correlator. Um, it is possible that the system can um, respond um, by, uh, using VCS observations. Um, <clears throat> and we have done that, um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't got the results out of uh, that program just yet. So the first um, uh, success that we had was uh, the, well, the first SWIFT triggered GRB that the MWA observed. This is GRB 180805A. Um, <clears throat> So this is the, like I said, the first successful trigger. Uh, we have many more since, but this is the first one. So this was our opportunity to uh, really dig into the uh, analysis techniques and um, all of the, the data processing. 
So we made images, like I said, between a half second all the way up to 30 minute time scales. Um, we wanted to be able to um, detect signals that were very short and also signals that were dispersed. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to kind of replicate what the Pulsar FRB community were doing with their de-dispersion analysis. But since we aren't collecting voltages, we need to uh, form images and then do an image-based de-dispersion. Uh, so in some work that Gemma led in conjunction with uh, Marchin, Jun and myself, um, we've been working on an image-based uh, de-dispersion uh, technique, similar to what I think uh, David Kaplan had done previously. Um, so what you can see on the top left here is a plot of the, uh, on the vertical is the frequency and the horizontal is the time for a small amount of our data. And each of the um, black and white pixels that you see here is just the uh, flux density at the known location of this GRB. So as this was a SWIFT trigger and the SWIFT telescope can give you um, a, a pointing accuracy, a, a position accuracy uh, down to um, much, much less than the MWA synthesized beam. Uh, we don't have to go searching on the sky. We can just pinpoint that location. We can extract the flux density over uh, frequency and time. Uh, so this is using half second time resolution and using the coarse channel uh, images. Um, so from that top plot, we can form, uh, we can do some uh, de-dispersion analysis where we actually go, not just the small sample of data that I've got there, but actually the entire 30 minutes. And so we can look over um, a large range of um, times, uh, sort of a pulse times, and a lot of de-dispersion trials. Um, and in this um, figure here, you can see there's the little uh, sort of maximum hold uh, plot on the right-hand side here. So this is the peak signal to noise. And you can see we don't actually see anything above um, five sigma um, in the um, uh, DM range that we expect. The sort of gray shaded DM range there is what we would expect from the, the galaxy in that direction. Um, so th this was the, the first uh, example of being able to firstly trigger on an M uh, a GRB with the MWA. And this was our development and deployment of that uh, data processing uh, pipeline. Um, <clears throat> so these limits are actually um, uh, allowing us to constrain some of the emission models uh, for the various different types of emission that we see. Um, so following this single um, GRB observation and analysis, we also have a, uh, an observing campaign, uh, which is making up uh, Jun Tian's uh, PhD thesis. Um, and so this time we have many short GRB triggers. So there's the original one that Gemma has analyzed. Um, and we have many more. In fact, we have 10 in total. Uh, three of these were triggered by the SWIFT telescope and seven by the Fermi telescope. Um, not all of the GRBs have uh, known redshifts. In fact, um, many of them have unknown redshifts. Um, and so when we're constraining the um, emission models, we have to fold in the fact that we don't know what the redshift of the galaxy is. So on the two plots on the left-hand side here, you can see the two of the uh, emission models that we uh, considered. Uh, the horizontal colored lines are the limits that we got for each of the GRBs uh, listed. Um, the horizontal dotted line is the sensitivity that we would expect to get if we could use the MWA BCS. And the little diamond is the, um, the upper limit for 1906-27A, which is one of the GRBs that actually has a known uh, redshift. Uh, so we can actually have a, a much more constraining um, uh, look at these uh, emission models using that GRB. Um, so you can see in the case of the um, FRB-like signal from the JET and CSM, that circumstellar medium 
interaction that you um, at low redshifts could potentially um, put some constraints on the model, but the uh, at more typical redshifts for GRBs, which is sort of 0.7 to two, uh, there's not much constraint that can be um, applied there. But if we look on the bottom left plot, plot where we're looking at the persistent emission from a remnant magnetar, uh, you can see that even that some of the um, highest upper uh, lower highest upper limits, yeah, that's what it is. Um, even some of the highest limits that we've been placing are still quite constraining for the model. These models being the the solid black line with the uh, grey uh, uncertainty region. Uh, so this is. Um, as I said, work that um, is done by Jun Tian and uh, should soon see a, um, a, a publication, um, what do we call it now, the uh, uh, collaboration review for that publication should come out soon. Um, we don't detect anything in any of these observations. And so the question is, why do we not detect it? Um, the easy answer is twofold. One, we're either not sensitive enough in the case of the um, JET plus CSM model, or maybe the model's wrong in the case of the magnetar persistent emission model. Uh, maybe some of the assumptions about uh, the strength of the magnetic fields or the, the longevity of the uh, magnetar are wrong. Um, we do have um, one uh, trigger that we're processing at the moment, uh, looking for uh, using the VCS. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't catch all of the data that we wanted to. We didn't get our half an hour. Um, <clears throat> uh, however, um, as I said before, you can look on these plots here, the horizontal dashed line on the top left plot is showing us uh, what we would get from the increased uh, sensitivity with the, the VCS. Um, when we're looking for persistent emission, it doesn't really matter whether you use the VCS or not because you're just integrating a, a signal over time. It's the same as making images. But when we're looking for um, emission that is on the time scale of milliseconds, integrating your uh, visibilities up to half a second um, does actually wash out the signal quite a bit. So, um, so the VCS would help for a lot of these uh, pretty good observations. Um, and with phase three, giving us the opportunity to potentially capture uh, both uh, streams of data at the same time, um, that would be uh, a, a huge boost to a project like this. It would mean that we don't have to make tricky decisions about whether we want only the VCS data and then um, do offline correlation or whether we want to save a bit of space and um, only do the um, correlated observations. We can observe both um, and if it turns out that we don't need the visibility data, uh, the VCS data, we can uh, we can tell Greg and he'll delete them for us. Um, yes, so that's everything I wanted to say about the uh, GRB triggering program. Um, as soon as the MWA is back online, it will start triggering once again, and we should have uh, some even more results into the future. Uh, so the next, um, thing that I wanted to chat about is the uh, a new technique that was developed. Um, so this was uh, Tyrone Idority's um, uh, honors thesis. And I've just seen now that I spelled his name wrong. So sorry, that's my bad. Um, <clears throat> so during his thesis, uh, Tyrone explored this idea of doing um, visibility differencing. So it's similar to um, image differencing, except that you don't create the image as, as the first step. The first thing that you do is that you take the visibilities from two radio observations and you form the difference between them. Now, of course, this is only possible if you have LST locked observations. Um, you need that LST locking so that you can get a consistent uh, UV sampling so that you're subtracting apples with apples, let's say. Um, but thanks to surveys like GleamX, um, there are actually lots of LST locked um, observations in the MWA archive. So <clears throat> um, the process is essentially you take these LST locked observations, you apply a, uh, a calibration to them, 
you difference the visibilities. Um, so obviously identical LST and frequency. Um, this creates a dirty image. And the dirty image is actually quite nice because all of the persistent emission, anything that is the same between the two observations will have been subtracted. So by creating a dirty image, all you're left with are things that change plus you know, calibration errors, that kind of stuff, um, and their side loads. And so often it's um, either not required to do any cleaning or you can, you can get away with a very shallow um, sort of one major iteration uh, clean. Um, so for so this is a technique that we thought would be particularly useful in busy parts of the sky. So um, within the galactic plane where it's uh, quite difficult to form um, nice images of the sky um, and in particular difficult to, to make the same nice image multiple nights in a row, uh, this visibility differencing uh, can get around that. So um, as part of the sort of verification of this technique, uh, Tyrone identified a, a transient. Um, so on the top row of the plots here, we've just got the, um, the dirty image from Epoch 1, the dirty image from Epoch 2, and then the, um, the dirty image of the difference. You can't really see anything on this scale because it's such a huge field of view. But if we zoom in here onto the bottom row where we just, it's the same set of images we've just zoomed in, um, you can see that there's actually a transient here. Um, and uh, Paul, um, you have a minute left. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the nice thing about this is that you can see in these two dirty images, you know, good luck to figuring out the real emission from the side lobes and also what's a persistent source versus just some noise artifact. But um, here we've been able to um, uh, use this visibility differencing to detect the transient. Now, this transient is actually extremely interesting. I'm not going to talk anything about it here, um, but anybody who's attending the ASA uh, in a couple of weeks' times, I highly recommend you go and see Natasha's talk all about this um, extremely interesting source. Um, the last thing is a new, another new capability, and this is tracking space debris with the MWA. I will not say anything about it because Steve Prabhu is about to talk about that in the next talk. So stay tuned for that. And um, just a final update, uh, as Chris was saying in yesterday's um, talk, uh, I'm stepping down as the Transients Group Lead. Um, anybody who would like to replace me um, can nominate themselves or somebody else, I guess. So contact me or Chris about that. Um, the Transients Group is not very large, um, in fact, at the moment, it's only people at Curtin plus one other outside of Curtin. Um, so if there's anybody who is, you know, self-identifies as a transient astronomer and is not, um, not in our group yet, um, please let us know. Uh, you can join the mailing list via the MWA wiki or you can put your name onto the, um, to the wiki page as well. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, Paul. That was really exciting stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but if people do have questions, do put them in the chat. Um, next up, we have Steve talking to us about space surveillance with the MWA. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, can hear cool. you. Uh, I'll share my screen. Yep, we can see you fine. Cool. Uh, do I start? Go for it. Yeah, cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Steve. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student from Curtin. Uh, I'm here to talk about my PhD thesis work, which is on performing space surveillance using the MWA. Uh, so the working principle here is that you have lots of FM transmitters throughout the world that are constantly transmitting FM signals. And because the MWA can observe an FM frequencies 
uh, we can detect FM reflection, satellite FM reflections using MWA observations. Uh, and that's how we go about doing space surveillance. So what is the problem here? Why do we have to do space surveillance? So it's been predicted that when the volume density of human-made objects, when it increases past a critical value, it can lead to cascading collision event scenarios called the Kessler effect. And in the event of Kessler effect, you end up destroying all the objects in a given orbit and you render it useless for future missions. So you can either prevent or delay the onset of Kessler effect or Kessler syndrome by doing space surveillance, which is retaining very uh, reasonably accurate and recent understanding of the space environment at all times. The graph on the right shows the growth rate of human-made objects in Earth orbit. So your x-axis is year, uh, y-axis is number of objects, and you can see the rapid increase in the number of objects. Uh, there are a few jumps in the trend. So this is either when you had multiple objects collide in orbit, creating a big debris field, or when you had uh, different countries testing out their anti-satellite capabilities. Uh, so what led to my work? So the image on the left is from a paper from 2013 where they detect uh, FM reflection from the ISS using the commissioning phase array. So that's using 32 tiles. Uh, and you can see ISS in these images over here. And this paper also does an electromagnetic simulation predicting uh, how big an object and how near does it have to be in order for us to be able to detect with the MWA. Uh, I'll get back to that in a later slide. Uh, the one on the right is from a more recent work where they detect FM reflections from meteor trails. So meteors leave behind an ionized trail and you can these trails reflect FM signals and you can detect them with MWA and they develop uh, different imaging techniques to detect this. Uh, so how do we do our detections? How does different imaging work? So these are two consecutive two second snapshots of the sky uh, made using phase one MWA. Uh, the big emission region here is Vela. And, in a, and when you subtract them in a perfectly calibrated ideal difference image, you would remove all your celestial sources along with the confusion noise. Uh, and anything that moves is brought out as a streak. So the noise in a difference image is limited by the thermal noise of the instrument. Uh, so a streak has a positive head and a negative tail. So according to our convention, a positive head is in the direction of motion of the object, followed by the negative tail. So the streak animation time lapse shown here uh, is of ISS as detected by the phase one MWA. Um, and the images on the right are few streaks from a few more satellites. And the one on the bottom right is actually from a CubeSat and it appears brighter, even brighter than the ISS. And I'll get, us to, get back as to why in the future slide. And then we perform dynamic spectrum analysis to try and understand these signals better. So during the observation, we face track the source, plot the signal in time and frequency. So this is the dynamic spectrum plot for ISS. So your x-axis is frequency, uh, y-axis is time. So you can see the different uh, FM frequencies reflected by the ISS. Uh, many of them were identified to be transmitters from Perth and Geraldton. We also identified few CubeSats to be transmitting all the way inside the FM band. So CubeSats are allowed to transmit at 144, 146 megahertz for downlink telemetry, but probably due to uh, malfunctioning hardware, they were transmitting inside the FM band. And that's actually why in the previous slide, the streak from the CubeSat appears brighter than the ISS. Uh, yes, and if, if, if you were to select uh, the fine channel from your dynamic spectrum plot that contains the signal, you can actually see these, these satellite signals even without doing different imaging or even cleaning. So the one on the top is actually is the moving dot is an object called Alouette. So it's uh, it's it's a satellite that's a meter in diameter orbiting at 2,000 kilometers away. So that's the furthest we have detected something up to now. Uh, and the bright static uh, radio source that you see here is unresolved Fonaxe. So we only use um, short baselines in our imaging. So that's why Fonaxe looks uh, like a point source. Uh, 
so even without differencing or even cleaning and having phone access in the field of view, you can pretty much see these uh, satellite signals in fine channels. And the one in the bottom is ISS drifting through Vela in one of the phase one observations. Uh, and then we build and test a blind detection pipeline that's fairly automated. So it starts with GPU box files uh, and a calibration solution for the night. It images at every single two second time steps and every single fine channel. Uh, and we have our own source finding software that does different, differencing in every for every time step and every fine channel and searches for time varying signals. So this is an example of a streak signal being detected by the source finding software. So in a single two minute observation, we search from around 42,000 different images and the output of the pipeline looks something like this. So this is the visible horizon and uh, anything that you see in red is six sigma detection made by the pipeline. And uh, the, the blue tracks are the predicted trajectories of all the objects in the field of view. Uh, and you can see a satellite being detected over here. And you have this big bright red streak going north south. So that's aircraft. So this is a very common uh, flight path over the MRO and planes are like super bright. And you can see them way outside the primary beam. Uh, so in an autonomous manner, we cross match these events, these detections with known objects uh, within the field of view. So we create search radiuses for each of these objects based on how far the object is. So if the object is fairly close, you search over a larger area. And if it's further away, the search cone becomes smaller. So we tested this blind survey on around 20 hours of archived MWA data, and we were able to detect over 70 unique objects over multiple passes. And this is the detection summary of the blind survey. So the x-axis in this plot is RCS. So it's radar cross-section. It's a measure of how big the object is when you see at a given frequency. And the y-axis is shortest range during pass it's how near the object is during the pass and all the brown scatter points that you see here is all the objects that drift through the primary beam during 20 hours of observation and all the colored markers are detections that we perform uh, and the you can see that uh, there are lots of we detect lots of rocket debris which are shown using diamond uh, cyan diamonds and we also detected uh, objects outside primary beam, which are often very big objects, and they are shown using the uh, pink squares. And the paper from 2013 that I spoke about earlier, uh, which did the electromagnetic simulation, so it predicts that we should be able to detect objects in the bottom right bottom right quadrant of this image, and majority of our detections fall within predicted parameter space. Uh, and because we were doing the detections in a blind man manner, we also detected lots of aircrafts and meteor trails. So some of our observations coincided with the Gemini's meteor shower, and we often detect very fast moving objects, uh, which we sorted as meteor candidates and they point towards the Gemini's radiant. Uh, and another cool thing that we did for objects, bright objects, like bright nearby objects like meteors and aircraft is you can actually split the MWA into two subarrays and do range measurements using apparent parallax position. So the image on the bottom right is uh, a detection of an aircraft uh, using the hex array. Uh, using the entire array, and when you split it into two subarrays, there is an apparent position uh, difference, uh, which is shown using the red and the blue contour. Uh, and using this, you can determine the range to the object. Uh, so then we went on, we go on to do targeted detections. So this is where you use some prior information about the object you're after. Uh, such as its orbital pass, and then you try and detect um, or stack fainter signals. So the first method that we do is called shift stacking. So the 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 circle in the top left image is the visible horizon, and the blue track is the predicted pass of one of the objects we search for. So within the observation for every single fine channel, we face track the source at multiple time steps. 
and we stack these images. So you're basically shifting and stacking across the predicted trajectory. And you can start detecting previously not detected faint signals now. So an example is shown in the bottom left. And we also have to do an image rotation of the frames because because of the large field of view of the MWA, the curvature of the tracks are often resolved. And if you were to stack without correcting for the curvature, then you end up smearing the signal. Uh, and we do this shift stack for all the objects from the 20 hours of blind survey that we performed. And we, re we detect almost all the objects that we detect um, during the blind survey, except few noisy observations. Uh, and we also get a lot more new detections, which are shown here using the white circles. And we almost improve the number of detections by a little under a factor of two. Um, the second targeted detection method that we use is near field imaging. So in standard interferometer theory, you assume the source to be in far field and you assume the received wave front to be planar and you then derive a 2D Fourier relationship between the sky and the visibility. Uh, but because of the near field nature of the objects that we are interested in, when you start using the longer baselines, you start resolving the curvature of the received wave front. And when you image without applying any correction, you defocus the image and you get like a reduced signal to noise detection. Uh, so so we calculate this curvature for all the baselines and apply it as a phase delay. And we tested in one of the extended array observations from last year. So the image, so the object here that we detect is the ISS. So uh, the, the MWA at any instant has around 8,000 baselines. So I take the thousand shortest baselines and make the image on the top left. Uh, and you can see the streak. And with the remaining 7,000 baselines, I make the image on the right. And you don't see the streak before applying the correction, near field correction. And when you apply the correction, the uh, detection using the short baseline, the signal to noise there goes up. And on the right, with the long baseline image, you start seeing like a streak like structure. But the problem here is that uh, given that I earlier on said that 1,000 of the 8,000 baselines go into the short baseline image and the remaining 7,000 baselines go into the image on the right. Given that the one on the, the image on the right has more collecting area, it should actually have a higher signal to noise detection, but that is not what we see here. And we attribute this to fringe washing. So uh, the x-axis in this graph is the baseline length, and you can see the two different histogram distribution for the compact configuration and the extended configuration of MWA phase two. And the y-axis here is satellite altitude. So that determines how fast the object goes past the primary beam during the observation. In this case, we calculated for Zenith. Uh, and because we sample at half a second, we average for visibilities in high, for, for, uh, for over half a second, uh, because the phase of these fast moving objects changes rapidly, the signal starts uh, destructively correlating when you see them using long baselines. Uh, so that's why the signal is weaker in the long baselines. And even we were actually in the previous image correcting for the near field effect, which I show using the green uh, shaded region, but even before near field effect comes into play, you have fringe washing that affects uh, the baselines even much earlier on. But the good news is that with phase three MWA, you should be able to sample at 0.1 time resolution. This should push behind fringe washing uh, further towards the longer baselines, and we should be able to start incorporating more baselines and make more sensitive measurements than we currently do. So this section is basically just me commenting very primary comments on uh, based on our understanding of the MWA space surveillance system, the impact these satellite signals could have on, sat, uh, on radio observations performed from the MRO and possible ways to mitigate, if not eradicate the signal. So in the top left uh, image, uh, I combine all the streak detections that we obtained during the 20 hours of blind survey that we perform, and I plot them in azimuth and elevation and as maximum signal to noise event detected in a given direction. And these detections were made by our pipeline prior to flagging. And then I run AO flagger using the default uh, flagging strategy and 
run the measurements head through the pipeline again and pretty much recover all the events except few uh, examples as shown in the green circle and the inverted U over here is an aircraft track and we were able to recover it with lower signal to noise. So one thing I must note here is that AO flagger is capable of performing very strict flagging if you were to create your own flagging strategy. But this is just to demonstrate that the default arguments uh, is not very ideal for FM band. So probably you should do more strict flagging in the FM band. Um, and uh, my final slide, so this is Starlink. So Starlink is a 40,000 uh, satellite mega constellation that is launched by SpaceX. They plan to launch 40,000 satellites in a few decades. So the top left uh, video is of an optical observation of Starlink. And yes, the MWA in, uh, can see Starlink. So this is a single fine channel, non-differenced time-lapse uh, of a single Starlink on a loop. Um, but there are ways, I think, that you can, given that it doesn't get flagged using the default uh, flagging settings, uh, there are ways probably you can mitigate the impact these satellite signals can have on radio observations. For example, while imaging, if possible, if your science case allows, if you were to weigh more on your um, longer baselines, you start putting these objects in the near field and it should defocus the signal from the satellite and if you also were to average uh, your time your visibilities for more than half a second or two seconds you start washing away these satellite signals through fringe washing for longer baselines so these are methods that possibly might help mitigate the impact if not completely remove them uh, for fm observations from the mro uh, and this is my conclusion so majority of what i've spoken has been written up as three papers the first two have been accepted the third uh, it should be around very soon. It's currently under review. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, really excellent talk. I see we have a hand up from the Kyra boardroom. So go ahead and just shout out. Thanks, Emma. Uh, hey, Steve, it's Natasha here. Um, I, this is the second time I've seen your talk and I still think it's amazing. Um, one thing that occurred to me this time around, especially after giving the Gleamex talk this morning with Shang, was, are these signals polarized? Um, you get a lot of noise from having these dirty images um, from all the uh, background sources. Can you remove them by looking at it in a polarized view? So I haven't checked, but I want to say some of these signals could be polarized because uh, many of these satellites, we see them because they probably have like an antenna. So if the signal is reflected off, the antenna it has to be polarized. So I would presume it's polarized, but I haven't checked. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Is there anyone? Okay, I'll ask one then. Have you seen any unidentified military type satellites? Because I know there are a bunch of them up there. And you see them in like the 200 to 230 megahertz band, but. Yes, so one of my Another PhD student here, my friend Jaden, he when he was reducing higher frequency MWA observations, he did manage to find uh, spy satellites, but the the orbital parameters of the satellite was known. But I I'm not sure if their downlink frequency was made public. But we kind of know what frequency they were transmitting in. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, Next, we have Danny Price talking to us about SETI with the MWA. So go ahead, hey, Danny. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great, let me share my screen. And can you see my slides? Yep, looks good. Perfect. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Danny Price, and I'll be talking about some SETI opportunities for the MWA today. Are we alone? So apologies for those of you who are in particularly you know, unfriendly time zones, uh, if this has plunged your room into darkness. Um, the question though, whether or not we're alone in the universe, if there's something else out there, is one of the most kind of profound ponderances uh, within science. 
So fortunately, according to National Geographic, at least, this has been answered. We're not alone. You can pack up and leave. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'll see you all next year. Um, what they're getting at, though, is that scientists tend to think that life is out there. And most of the discussion is about whether or not we'll be able to detect it. Now, I would like to see MWA on the cover next time. So let's move forward. There's essentially three different ways in which we're searching for life. The first one is we go there and we try and find things. These are your Mars rover missions, your uh, curiosity and dragonfly in the future, flying around and going to Venus and those kind of things where we look within the solar system. The second way, which is a very exciting for the future, is looking for atmospheric biosignatures where you uh, the next kind of generation of telescopes, the spectrometers will be able to tell, you know, if there's hyd not hydrogen, if there's uh, oxygen there, if there's carbon dioxide, potentially other molecules. And what you'd be looking is not necessarily just for those, but the actual uh, ratios of them to look for a chemical disequilibrium that would uh, indicate some something that was non-geological going on there to, to show that there's life or, or some other phenomenon on the planet. The third way is technosignature detection, which is you know, commonly known as the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So to talk about these, with all the robotic missions, we can only really go places within the solar system. We can't get other places yet. With the next generation of telescopes, uh, there's probably a handful of stars for which we could detect atmospheres uh, around the exoplanets. It still take a, a very long integration and it's, it's it won't be easy, but it should be possible. And that's very exciting and something I'm particularly looking forward to. Uh, for technical signatures, however, um, you're looking for artificial signals and the kind that we can just generate here on Earth are very bright. And we think that we could see them out to kind of the other edge of the galaxy um, further if the uh, society was more advanced than us. So if you think that's you know 10 to the 24, this is a very rough number of stars in the observable universe. Yeah, but th these numbers are much bigger than 10 and 1. So these approaches are all complementary. Uh, the other thing is that technical signature detections generally use existing telescopes and they're very cost effective. Um, you know, NASA missions are incredibly expensive. Uh, the JWST has a, something like $10 billion price tag. And, you know, you have to use that telescope for several months staring at one exoplanet. So it's not something, you know, that... I, uh, a telescope with a, a very high duty cycle uh, is necessarily going to be able to do on a large number of exoplanets. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is, you know, the past to SETI, the present and the future. So let me continue. The, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence kicked off in 1959, 1960, when Frank Drake turned the Tatel Telescope in Greenbank, West Virginia, toward two nearby solar-like stars and listen, literally listened to see if there was any evidence of, of artificial signals in them. So since then, from 1960 to 2020, you know, we've had a trillion time improvement in the, the amount of computations we can do per second. So we've gone from mega ops to peta ops. And this just means that, you know, similarly, the sensitivity of telescopes and the capability of telescopes and other technological things that we have here on Earth has increased um, accordingly. Now, if you take all the study that's been done to date and try and put it on a plot, it's very difficult because there's so many different parameters, but one way you can do is on this particular plot. So going through here, we have EIRP, which is the equivalent isotropic radiated power on one axis. It's the minimum amount that you could detect. Um, so this is essentially the more sensitive your telescope is, uh, the the lower minimum EIRP you could detect. So you you want to be close to the left of this plot. That means you've got a very sensitive thing. Um, it just also depends on how far away the targets are you're looking at. So the very bottom right plot, um, the, the circle there is uh, observations of M31. So that's an entire galaxy, but it's very far away. Whereas uh, if you were to look at Proxima Centauri, it would appear more on the left just because of virtue of it's much, much closer. But on that axis is essentially sensitivity. The other axis on this is called transmitter rate, and this is a function of how complete your survey is. And you can think of this as essentially the product of the number of stars that have been searched or the, the size of the sample, the, the volume that has been searched, and the kind of fractional bandwidth uh, that you've searched. So where you want to be is the bottom 
uh, left of this plot. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, this is a, <clears throat> a new kind of visualization that Genoa has came up with. And the size of the bubbles here is the number of objects in a given search. So this is kind of hinting why MWA is, uh, is particularly interesting as an unexplored part of parameter space. Uh, most searches to date are around the waterhole, which is why the big bubble with lots of objects is up around 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, but the MWA you can see is way off on the left there. Um, we don't think there's a preferred, when you're looking, uh, doing a blind search, you can't uh, claim a preferred frequency. So you have to search everywhere. And you can see that there's huge swaths of this parameter space that have been unexplored. And that brings us to the present, where we are. So Breakthrough Listen is a project that I've been working with since 2016, and it's the largest ever scientific research program aimed at finding evidence of intelligent life. And the funding for the third triennium uh, has recently been approved, which will run, you know, July 2021 to 2024. And I'm pleased to say that wide field study is a key science goal in this third triennium of Breakthrough Listen. Uh, you may have heard that we found something interesting at 982 megahertz, and that's because it was leaked uh, by The Guardian uh, back around six months ago. And our analysis is still ongoing, uh, but it didn't stop a lot of press coming out of this. So this is, SETI is something that, you know, really engages uh, a large, large proportion of the population. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more about this, but that we have submitted some papers and you will hear more. Uh, in the future. So I'm just going to tantalize you there. Now, the, the primary thing that Breakthrough did in the first triennium, or the, the first few years, was doing target observations of nearby stars using Green Bank and Parks. This is across about one to 10 gigahertz. If you look at the top left there, you can see the, the, you know, the main sequence stars and the, um, the red giant branch there on the, uh, the diagram. And this is just showing that we have gone for a not type complete, but a, a diverse range of stars. We're not just looking at solar stars. There's good reason to believe that M dwarfs, because you can be a lot closer um, and have a, a rocky planet there. You could still be habitable, although there's you know, lots of arguments uh, for and against, but we, we don't want to bias ourselves in that, in that way. So the, the catalog is there in Isaacs and Edel. And the first analysis was in, well, the second analysis of uh, 1327 stars was in uh, Chrysadao, where we looked with Greenbank and Parks with different receivers. This is just showing the points on the sky. Now, these points, um, uh, there's a lot of sky that we haven't done because these, uh, these telescopes we use have a very small field of view, particularly as you go up to higher frequencies. So although we've covered a lot of the nearby stars, there's still a large volume that has, has not been searched. When you take these breakthrough listen points and you put them on this plot, remember the bottom left is where you want to be. Uh, the breakthrough listen points are the most constraining, uh, the most sensitive with the, the largest amount of targets in them, uh, at least up to 2020. Now, SETI has already been done by the MWA. I'm not the first person to think of this. Uh, the first one was done in 2016, where they uh, looked at the galactic center around 100 to 133 megahertz. There were some known planetary systems in the field that were found by Kepler. Um, so they looked at those in particular and did not find any spectral features that were narrow band below 10 kilohertz. That was kind of the first try. And in this abstract, it's interesting to see uh, this, this is, I'll just read it out. Uh, a study experiment with the MWA covering the full sky and full frequency range would take about a month. So you can do the most incredible survey in, in only one month. And it really is, you know, with its frequency range, its southern hemisphere location, and its large field of view and sensitivity, it really is a unique facility for SETI. And so there have been, we haven't done the whole sky, that could be done, you know, perhaps you could take the, the GLEAMX data, uh, but we have done uh, you know, Tinge Yadao, Tinge Tremblay and Croft in 2018, um, looking toward the Galactic Angie Center, and more recently, uh, Tremblay and Tinge uh, looking toward Vila. So we've slowly but surely been you know, pumping out SETI papers, and there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can explore. Uh, at the moment, uh, Chinoa has been leading analysis of uh, Galactic Center data, data cube at 154 megahertz. And since the 2016 paper, the Gaia catalog has come out, so we can use that for stellar distances. And uh, this is just showing the, the exoplanet. Uh, there's more exoplanets detected now, um, and they're just overlaid here. And so this is ongoing work at the moment. Now, to, uh, to take that uh, paper and uh, plot the, the points on this diagram, you see there's, there's now four points that have been overlaid. Um, 
And this depends on, you know, if you take the Gaia catalog and where you cut off, so if you only look at the nearby stars, you're more sensitive by virtue of the fact that the isotropic radiated power minimum is higher. So you can think of if you have a, a survey um, and you, you slowly increase the distance, you could kind of make a continuous line on this plot. It doesn't have to be a single point. Um, and so, you know, you can think of these as kind of forming a bit of a, uh, a surface on here um, and it should roughly scale as, you know, minus three on two, uh, but obviously the stars aren't uh, isotropically distributed. Um, uh, there's, there's some structure there, so it won't be quite like that. Um, but just coming back to this, you know, slide field of view and high sensitivity with this uh, observation just of Vila, um, uh, which wasn't that long in the scheme of things, it's already like one of the most constraining um, city surveys to date. Um, so what's in store for the future? Well, the two obvious things to do, improve the sky coverage and do a wider frequency range. Uh, we can also, with the, the new correlator, increase the frequency resolution, which for narrowband signals will increase the sensitivity, and we can also increase in, uh, integration time. So if we do that, we may be able to move these points down here like this, and all of a sudden it becomes you know, much, much more um, constraining as to the, you know, the prevalence of putative transmitters. There's some other work that we've been doing, and that's uh, using the voltages that can be streamed from the MWA to, uh, to curtain here um, over a 100 gigabit a second link. And uh, this is work where we will be doing FRBs and SETI. Um, it uses a lot of the pipelines use very similar components. So for example, you have to capture the data, which is a stream of UDP packets. Um, both will have identical codes there. Um, the only difference is FRBs, you know, you run the, your, uh, detection pipeline, the Freder or Heimdall, this kind of FRB search detection pipelines. SETI so generally have a high frequency product and you run a different pipeline um, to look for drifting signals. Um, but the, the short of it is that if we increase from 10 kilohertz to one hertz fine channels in a, a SETI data product, the, your sensitivity to narrowband signals increases by a factor of 100 times. And so that's, that's very impressive. And so the work's underway to, to make this search capability. So that's kind of the, the very high level summary. Um, in the future upcoming, uh, Breakthrough Listen has allocated funds in their third training for SETI opportunities on the MWA specifically. Uh, we're aiming to bring two postdoc positions based at Kyra, and I'm in touch with the research office here and trying to go through that, but it's been quite slow. Um, there's also some funding allocated for hardware. Um, so if you're interested, please get in touch um, and let me know any questions you have. Thanks, Danny. We already have the first question, which is from Nicole Barry. Um, a lot of 1.4 gigahertz searches are looking for broadcasted signals with the idea that it's a, it's special hyperfine transition. So that's how others would communicate intelligence. Are there any special frequencies in the MWA band in a similar way? There are. Um, I think the, the field has somewhat moved on from these so-called magic frequencies. Um, and we try and just look at, at all frequencies because we can't possibly know what other people are thinking is the, the be all and end all. Certainly we are still guided by how we build telescopes. So for example, we want to look at 21 centimeter line. So we build receivers that can look at 21 centimeter line and that makes it somewhere where we can search. So a lot of this is virtue of the, the things that we have on the ground. These are the areas where we can search. So that's another reason why we look at 21 centimeter line still. Um, certainly we know from the atmosphere, there's, you know, you can't look at X-rays from the ground. So it'd be much more expensive to do an X-ray SETI search if you had to go into space. Um, there, there have been some, you know, archival data search for SETI on X-rays, but you know, there, there are certain frequencies we think are a little bit more probable for somewhere where it has an atmosphere. But really, I think you can't really make any broad claims until you've done the widest bandwidth, covered as much of the frequency range as possible and have a really large statistical sample of stars. And then you can start saying something about, um, you know, the prevalence of, of transmitters as opposed to if you look at one star at a very particular frequency, you can't really say that much. Cool. Um, we've got another one from Nick. Um, does the time domain search require the data to be de-dispersed. If the SETI searches doesn't take much processing, it may be possible to put, put, it in, put it on the end of my search pipeline to take advantage of the sensitivity, 
sensitive tide array beams? Uh, yeah, that's certainly the kind of thing that we'd, we'd like to be doing. Um, so the, the first thing we'll do with the, the system we're producing uh, with the FRB search and the, the SETI search in, in tandem will be just doing an incoherent beam. Um, and obviously that will see the, the whole uh, field of view, but it won't have as much sensitivity as a tide array beam. Uh, it would be great to chuck it onto the end of a tide array beam as well. Um, so that's something we'd like to do. Um, the in terms of uh, broadband signals, uh, I didn't really touch on it in this talk. Uh, we we have some thoughts about looking for artificial ones. Uh, at the end of the day, if it looks and quacks like a FRB or a, a single pulse pulsar, then we would we would think it was. So you have to look for something that has a in some way strange um, broadband signal. But I think most FRB pipelines will pick up signals uh, that could be artificial in nature. And then you know, we'll, we'll be able to look at it in the future. It's only if you want to look for something that had, you know, for example, a negative dispersion measure or an apparent negative dispersion measure, that might be an indication that it was uh, engineered. Um, cool. Uh, are there any last questions? I think we have time for one more. Otherwise, thanks a lot, Danny. That was really exciting talk, seeing what the MWA can do in this field. Um, and we'll move on to the next talk by Ramesh. He's gonna be giving us an update on the VCS system. So take it away, Ramesh. Okay, thanks, Amin. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Um, let me know when you can see it. Yep, it's perfect, all good. Okay, I hope I'm audible. Yep. All right, so thank you, Amin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so what used to be called the VCS update up until recently will henceforth be called PFT science update. PFT stands for pulsars and fast transients. That's a new science working group that is being set up. And uh, you just heard it from Chris this morning. And I have the honor of uh, serving it as, uh, serving as it's a science lead for the next uh, couple of years. So here are the few things that uh, I'm going to cover today. Uh, sorry, um, looks like my presentation is not moving. Sorry, give me a second. Okay, good. Um, so I will tell you what our current system is, high time resolution backend for NWA and mention a few science highlights and give you a quick uh, update of uh, where our big pulsar science survey program is going and our plans for the new high time resolution system and uh, commissioning plans in the next uh, six months or so. So VCS, which stands for voltage capture system, it's a subsystem that sits between uh, the correlator and uh, the, the after the second stage of uh, um, a PFB. So that essentially captures the voltage data streams that goes into the correlator at 10 kilohertz, 100 microsecond resolution from every single tile and two polarizations. So that's a lot of data, but if you want to do science that can't be catered by the current correlator or um, the previous legacy correlator. So this is your high time resolution functionality for MWA. And for pulsar observations, we essentially bring all this data to POSI and then do all our calibration, beam forming and post-processing and everything. So from a pulsar point of view, it's a fairly non-traditional data intensive and processing intensive path. That's how it has been, but that hasn't really stopped us from uh, taking advantage of that. And over the past few years, lots of publications have come out of it, including uh, several PhD theses. Other important point that I want to highlight is that VCS was always intended to be a system for not just for pulsars, also for other classes of uh, high time resolution work, like a fast transient, passive radar, and uh, surveillance, and uh, things like that. And it's great to see that uh, over the past couple of years, some of those area areas also is like picking up uh, quite well. So let me just give you like a couple of uh, uh, select highlights. And uh, you heard about uh, uh, the cosmic ray development from Alex Williamson, his detailed presentation at the last project meeting on the development of uh, ultra high time resolution mode for detecting cosmic rays. So essentially what happens here is that 
100 microsecond time series from uh, the VCS goes through like a two stages of uh, inversion of a PFB to get down to 60 nanosecond resolution. And then you correlate the time delays between every single tile so that you can localize an impulsive signal. So this is essentially the new functionality that uh, Alex and team developed in the past uh, couple of years. And you can uh, see the, all the details in uh, his uh, recent publication. But the most significant development has been processing almost uh, or over a half a petabyte of data from VCS and looking for uh, the cosmic ray candidates. And this has been a phenomenal success. And they have some good bunch of uh, very, very promising candidates. And one of them is shown here. So this is essentially the high time resolution data from a few central tiles. Uh, and the plot that is shown here is like the time delays in the color coded type. So at this point, they have about a handful of candidates that are going through the close scrutiny and the paper public, uh, will be coming uh, in the next uh, uh, coming months. So other interesting area that uh, VCS has been quite nicely exploited is the passive radar, use of MW as a passive radar. This is the work being done by Brendan Hennessy, another Curtin PhD student. So the idea here is essentially to look at uh, the reflections from our terrestrial transmissions, and MWA is a large field of view. It's a real big advantage when you want to look at uh, low Earth orbiting satellites. There have been quite a few VCS-based publications already, and I'm showing you this nice looking animation from Brendan. So the circle there is, range circle is about 1,000 kilometers. Different tracks are essentially the satellite tracks. And when you see different colors, that means uh, different transmitters. So that's uh, another promising area that uh, can be exploited with uh, uh, VCS system uh, of MWA. On the Pulsar front, let me show this a very interesting result from uh, uh, soon to be submitted PhD thesis by Wilfried Kaur, and uh, who is at, the point, at this point counting literally single digit number of days and for submitting her thesis. So this is a clear and a very compelling evidence for uh, what is called a frequency dependent dispersion measure on a very important millisecond pulsar that has been a hot target and will be a hot target for both current and future pulsar timing array experiments that someday hoping to detect uh, ultra low frequency, nano hertz frequency gravitational waves. Dispersion measure, as you know, is essentially the column density of free electrons. So when you say frequency dependence, that might sound a little bit weird, but this is an interesting consequence of uh, pulsar radiation and uh, undergoing a multi-path propagation, which is a frequency dependent effect. So as an interesting interplay between dispersion and the scattering and gives you like a chromaticity. Again, it's a very, very subtle effect. We are talking about few parts in 10,000 parts per centimeter cube, but the, with the kind of precision that we are achieving with MWA on these pulsars, which is few parts in million, and uh, you can happily measure that. And uh, so that's what is shown here. This was uh, achieved from uh, making a contemporaneous observations of uh, short period millisecond pulsars using a combination of the telescopes, essentially achieving frequency coverage from 80 megahertz to four gigahertz. So let me come to uh, the big survey program, smart survey, and uh, which you have uh, heard about quite a few times. And uh, it looks to me that my sites are like a little bit older version, but that's all right. Um, so essentially, this is an all sky survey that takes advantage of uh, MWA's uh, large field of view, low frequencies, and the phase two upgrade, which brings a compact uh, configuration that gives us like a lot of beam pro warming processing efficiency. So the whole idea is like a do a, a large scale full sky survey and discover hundreds of pulsars. And the survey will be like uh, two to three times deeper than the previous generation low frequency surveys. It will essentially do what Fox did in the high frequency band in the southern sky. And uh, it will also create a nice digital record of uh, the entire southern sky at the low frequencies, which will be an incredibly valuable resource for uh, the future surveys planned with uh, SKA-1 low. So all said and done, and we are talking about quite a significant uh, efforts in ter terms of data collection and the processing. Almost uh, three petabytes of data that will flow through this project which will need to be processed into more than half million beams to translate the whole field of view. This is with a compact configuration. And you are talking about something like several million core hours of just to do even the very first 
fast processing. So over the past few years, and through a series of dedicated campaigns, when the opportunity was uh, came up through the compact configuration, and we have advanced survey. So at this point, the data collection part is 75% complete, and the survey reference paper is coming up. So in terms of processing, uh, at the moment, we are essentially like a doing a, what is called a first pass survey. So we are doing a, essentially a shallow processing, shallow survey, uh, processing about 10% of the data and uh, reaching about the 30% of sensitivity. This is purely because of a huge amount of processing cost that is involved in doing a, a full-scale pulsar searches at a very low frequencies. So we are doing best we can. So we are using both the FOSI and the OSTAR uh, computational resources. FOSI is where we do all the initial data quality checks and the recombination of the data, calibration, beamforming on non pulsars for important integrity checks and sensitivity checks. Then a small part of that data gets funneled to uh, OSTAR supercomputer, where our pipeline works much faster. And we have a well uh, optimized and uh, streamlined software. So at the moment, we are doing like a, a limited parameter search, looking at the dispersion measure out to something like a 250 parsec per centimeter cube, and searching essentially single pulse searches and the limited periodicity searches. And the second phase, phase of this will be essentially extending it to like a deeper searches to get to the full sensitivity, and hopefully also trialing a range of acceleration so that we can start targeting millisecond pulsars with a fairly moderate or wider orbits. These are the kind of targets we need for pulsar timing array experiments. Um, okay, so um, uh, every single observation is essentially quality check, as I said, and uh, so uh, every single dot there is like a non pulsars coming through our observations. And I just want to make the point that uh, um, um, all the observations have been like a process for this initial uh, uh, data quality check. So you heard about it uh, quite a bit, and uh, uh, after a long um, time, and we have finally seen the light at the end of a long tunnel. This is uh, the first pulsar, and uh, essentially an extended plot that you have already seen uh, early morning from uh, Chris's talk. So detections of the pulsars from MWA, and as well as uh, GMRT bands going from 300 megahertz to 700 megahertz, and the high frequency detection sparks. And you will hear a full story from Nick, but the point I want to make here, and uh, like Chris said, this has pretty, pretty much emerged from uh, processing 1% uh, of the data. And that still has been a lot of processing and data scrutiny, but essentially it shows that uh, when we do this in the full scale, we can be like quite hopeful of discovering many more pulsars. And the other interesting part is that what turned out to be like, a, what appeared to be like an ordinary vanilla type pulsar turned out to be an interesting class of uh, object in terms of its characteristics of luminosity and spectrum. It is in the lowermost 2% of uh, the currently long population of long period pulsars. And that's the kind of pulsars that we thought, you know, we should be like a discovering with MWA. And it's a period and DM are given here by the symmetric numbers and the pulsar has a fairly narrow duty cycle. As it is the MWS first, we only okay. got a fair bit of attention and the crowd had a press release and it momentarily gave us a little bit of fame and glory. But an interesting highlight was uh, the gorgeous artwork from Bill Preet, which you have seen already a couple of times, but I just can't resist showing you that uh, once again. Uh, okay, an interesting point minutes. that I want to highlight, which probably won't be mentioned in uh, 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 Nick's uh, uh, talk, hopefully, but uh, which is like uh, our success in timing uh, this pulsar using a combination of uh, the new observations as well as the data coming from uh, archival observations. And uh, fortunately for us, this uh, pulsar happened to be in the vicinity of uh, one of Sami's favorite pulsars, which gave us like a lot of archival detections from the past. And uh, like I said, you know, that uh, oftentimes when you find a pulsar or when you confirm it, it is just a step zero. And the step one is to following it up, characterizing it to the regular timing and the nailing it down. It's the astrometry and uh, spin parameters and things like that, which typically for a long period pulsars can take a good couple of years. And we didn't want to wait for two, couple, two years to publish this uh, discovery. So we did some uh, fast track approach 
essentially using a combination of uh, 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 data from uh, MWA follow-up, which is what is shown here after the discovery, and uh, the data from uh, uh, GMRT to get some initial position, and working essentially backward so that we can iteratively solve for uh, the Pulsar's uh, full coherent uh, timing solution. So I don't want to go into all the details, but I just want to show you this uh, interesting diagram. So the cluster that you see on the right, if you can see my first, uh, cursor, is the initial timing solution. And when you put in the data from all the past archival data, it's all over. And from that, we have gone to something like this, which is essentially like a one millisecond timing precision over five year time span. And which is quite a triumph, and given the fact that MWA is like a relatively new instrument, and I really wanted to um, uh, give the takeaway that uh, we have gone from uh, an initial seven sigma significance in uh, pulsar spin derivative in the five months of follow-up to something like 780 sigma by combining with archival data. And the position improved from uh, 10 arc minutes from the initial discovery to something like a sub arc second. Uh, What's the position at the end? So a big shout out to all the people who have been looking after the system very well over this time. And in the Pulsar language, we are essentially achieving a phase connection over quite some time. And I should say that uh, I have been extremely paranoid as I was working through this, uh, every single detection from the past and iteratingly solving, solving for uh, the refined solution and also like uh, checking for the signal improvement. And that is something one has to be quite uh, careful about with any new Pulsar instrumentation. But on the good side, it is very comforting to see that we can actually now count on MWA for follow-up of uh, our new Pulsar discoveries. So after quite a bit of a pause, so we have our second Pulsar candidate, and uh, which is called Keegan's Pulsar because he was the first one to spot it. So there you go. So if you are in keen to get a Pulsar named after you, feel free to line up and uh, help us to do some heavy lifting. Um, so Stephen mentioned it's a candidate yesterday, but I think it's a bit more than a candidate. Nick has seen it a couple more times in his processing. And uh, you, so you will see that this is something quite peculiar. So when we started the observation, Pulsar was off. So maybe I should tell you what the floors are because you are probably seeing it for the first time in this uh, meeting. So the left panel is essentially the signal strength as a function of time and the pulse phase. And the top panel is the pulsar profile, which is the average emission pattern repeated twice to help and guide your eyes. The middle panel is essentially the signal strength as a function of frequency. And the rest of them are essentially the signal strength or a proxy for it as a function of dispersion measure and pulsar spin period and it's the derivative, the whole bunch of diagnostics that we typically use in uh, pulsar processing. So as you will note, the pulsar, you know, that uh, was essentially like uh, inactive or not detectable to start off, then it came back on for something like uh, 10 minutes or so, then it was non-detectable or for almost like a 30, 40 minutes, then on for another 10 minutes, then off for the rest of the time. So it's quite an intermittent kind of a behavior. But remind you, you know, that uh, it's only, we only process like a 10 minutes of data in the current first pass processing. So the first five minutes, the pulsar was off and the next few minutes, the pulsar turned back on. So we just turned out to be lucky. So if you work out from uh, this particular observation, which is the longest we have, that's like a nulling fraction of about 75%, that itself puts it in the pulsar in a, quite an interesting category because uh, only 5% of the pulsars non-pulsars are known to know, show such an extreme behavior, or it could be a state switching pulsars. Because some pulsars, when it is like a switch from bright mode to quiescent mode, they saw some persistent weak emission. But obviously with the MWA observation, we can't quite be sure about that. So we are um, uh, looking at uh, waiting for our proposals to get accepted at parks and GMRT. And as soon as the system is back online with MWA, we are going to come to you, Stephen, so that we can get more time on this particular object because we don't have a lot of archival data because this doesn't happen to be any of uh, Sammy's or other people's favorite pulsars uh, at this point. Anyways, so another important point that I want to make is that uh, this is also the kind of pulsars that we think we will have like a higher sensitivity for detecting 
primarily due to the lo much longer dwell times that we are uh, going for with the smart survey and the very large field of view that we will have uh, uh, with the uh, MWA. So we are probably getting like an example of uh, the kind of pulsars or the kind of population that we will uncover from uh, uh, this survey. I mentioned that there is a processing is one of the biggest challenges uh, with uh, uh, the uh, MWA Pulsar survey. So I just want to mention this uh, uh, interesting work that is uh, going on at uh, Shavo Pulsar Group and where Shongli and team are using uh, the SKF prototyping cluster to benchmark the software and uh, doing a whole range of optimization and uh, parallelization. The bottom line takeaway here is that they are already achieving a significant improvement and as the, we move forward, the aim is basically to uh, distribute the processing to a whole bunch of different platforms. And this is all uh, important preparatory work going in that uh, direction. Chris mentioned this morning that we have seen a heap of pulsars with MWA. That is certainly true. But I just want to tell you what has been like, a, you know, one, uh, another interesting highlight from all the smart survey data processing. Few years ago, when uh, our, one of our first generation students, Mengyao Xu, was doing her PhD thesis, we did essentially a partial sky census using a then available capability, which was the incoherent beam, which is only like about 10% uh, of uh, MWA sensitivity and detected about 50 pulsars. And over the past couple of years, so that has more than tripled, and more than two thirds of those detections are are essentially coming from smart survey observations. And with the important detections that many of them are like a full coherent beam detections, so much higher sensitivity, a good fraction of them can also be used for like a high time resolution polarimetry. So obviously the Nick and Keegan are going to be the first scientific uh, beneficiary of this uh, very interesting uh, sample. Nick's project will focus on the population studies, which you will hear in a short while. And the Keegan's project will uh, focus on uh, frequency dependence of uh, pulsar emission. Okay, so now I come to the last uh, part of my uh, talk, which is essentially the new high time resolution system. So I'm showing you a couple of slides that uh, Sami has uh, provided, and it's a very nice informative slides. And the top, what you see is the legacy system. So as we all know, so we get the signal after two stages of uh, PFB inversion, and then we can beam form and the various different ways. And if you get uh, um, um, of, uh, for the routine pulsar work, you get a full stocks uh, pulsar beam at uh, full VCS resolution. And if you want to do millisecond pulsars, you do like a yet another stage of processing and get like a higher time resolution. With the new system, so we are going to tap the signal at a different point. So that has quite a lot of important implications. And this is also like an opportunity to revamp the system and go for a system that is like more multi-purpose and flexible and that can cater to multiple different science goals. And I should point out that uh, this is all uh, possible primarily because of the lot of uh, hard work that is going behind the scene. And you heard a lot about uh, MWA lit and uh, from Greg yesterday. And uh, that's uh, like a fairly extensive documentation of the new data format that is very important for this uh, development. And also the fact that you are getting like a course time series, which means that the delays will be like uh, many samples across the array, which has a quite a big implication on uh, any kind of processing, including beam forming or correlation. And of course, the whole bunch of uh, metadata support that is coming through and through. So I particularly mention uh, Brian and Greg and uh, uh, Andrew have been supporting uh, this uh, development and the planning. And Sammy is obviously leading much of the software and subsystem development work. But essentially, the plan is to have uh, like a system that can essentially reconfigure and the different kinds of uh, uh, signs, um, pulsars or FRBs, or if you want like a much higher time resolution for cosmic ray detection or high time resolution visibilities for fast imaging or FR, you know, FRBs or, and all those different kinds of goals all under one particular umbrella. So that obviously translates to some important uh, desire, uh, design features or the desirable features for uh, the new subsystem. And many of them are basically listed here. So we are talking about the high time resolution processing. So obviously there has to be an accelerated software. There has to be flexible so that we can cater to multiple different science drivers. 
and extendable for something that may come up in the future and obviously portable as the system gets upgraded or the software that can be ported to the new platform. And uh, some uh, Hi, Ramesh. Uh, You're kind sorry. of running over time. Right. Uh, um, so can you wrap up uh, in, a, in a minute or so? Yeah. So essentially, you know, that uh, the whole idea here is like uh, um, uh, the dynamic uh, memory management that will do a very uh, so optimal uh, resource allocation and uh, shield all that complexity from uh, the end user. So we have a series of milestones planned to bring this uh, system online. And uh, that's all uh, will be like uh, um, um, uh, 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 encompassed in uh, the new proposal plan that we have gone for. So in summary, I just want to say that it has been a quite a long and exciting journey to get here. And with a uh, new system coming online, that's an imminent gear shift and the real challenge starts now. And we are talking about uh, the broadening the science avenues and it's going to be a uh, very busy year ahead. Thanks, Anand. Uh, th thanks a lot, Ramesh. That was a lot of new information for me, but it looks exciting stuff is coming up. Uh, unfortunately, we're a bit over time, so people with questions, put them in the chat and Ramesh will answer you there or on Slack. Um, for the next talk, we have um, Sam McSweeney talking to us about um, pulsar polar polarimetry. So over to you, Sam. All right, can I be heard now? Yep, we can hear you. With some echo. <laughs> All right, and you can see my slides coming up. Yes. Okay. Looks perfect. Okay, great. Thanks very much for uh, inviting uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, this talk is a lot about what we've learned over the last year in term from our point of view um, voltage capture system group. Uh, uh, pulsars and fast, radi uh, and fast tra transients. Um, and I think we've learned a lot actually. So, um, so the, throughout the talk, you'll see me uh, credit a lot of uh, the other working groups that we've been liaising with to try and understand MWA polarization. Um, so uh, thanks to them in advance and also <laughs> during the talk. Um, why do we want to have, uh, to be confident in our polarization for pulsars in particular um, pulsars, as, as uh, I'm sure most of you know, um, are surrounded by this highly relativistic uh, plasma that stream out along magnetic field lines. The whole ensemble is rotating um, and, uh, and we get this beamed coherent radio emission coming from the magnetic axes. Um, and as it sweeps by the earth, that's what we detect as, uh, as, as these pulses. Um, the trouble is, is that we don't actually understand how the relativistic plasma gives rise to that beamed coherent radio emission. Um, and this is an ongoing puzzle that's been, um, that's been out there for the last 50 years, pretty much since pulsars were discovered. Um, and there, in order to address this problem, polarization is really, really important. In fact, um, even our basic picture of what I just described came about because of a recognition of uh, the, signa the polarization signature um, uh, that comes from a rotating dipole. And even in the last uh, very short while, there's been uh, massive attempts to, to understand uh, polarization from a single pulse point of view, um, especially to see how what are called orthogonal polarization modes, um, how they might combine coherently within the magnetosphere or without to, uh, to give rise to the polarization signature that we actually detect. So this is a relatively unexplored uh, parameter space, especially at low frequencies. And I believe the MWA is really ripe to look at single polarization, uh, sorry, single pulse, uh, full polarization uh, studies of pulsars. Um, so this all sounds great. Um, last year at the same meeting, so about a year ago now, I gave a tentative um, uh, and quite optimistic hope that something we saw very interesting in Stokes V 
uh, might, ha might have some um, implications for the plasma physics going on. And I drew attention to this one particular pulsar, and this is the pulsar that Ramesh has been calling my favorite pulsar. Um, and uh, I drew attention to this, to this uh, dip in Stokes V um, that, uh, that appeared at two places across the MWA band. Um, and I uh, got very excited about this. And so I presented it last year. And then come question time, Xiang said something like, oh, maybe this is to do with some kind of leakage. And then it kind of felt like a bit of a trap door opening up. <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, <laughs> let's see if we can actually uh, test this particular data set in particular, because I'm very keen to, uh, to, to turn this data set into, into a, a detailed study of this pulsar's polarimetry. So we have to test, but what do we actually expect to see for pulsar polarimetry? Well, if there were no Faraday rotation whatsoever from the interstellar medium, and you looked at a pulsar in Stokes IQ UNV, um, you might see something like this. Now the banded structure is actually scintillation for this particular pulsar. Uh, this is not the same pulsar, by the way, this is another one called uh, 0628. Um, and if you look at U and V, you can actually, if you look carefully at the left-hand side of Q, it's a little bit uh, darker. Um, there's like a dark band and a bright band. And similarly in U, except it's a bit swapped. And this is actually just, just uh, the fact that the position angle of the linear polarization is sweeping across a bunch of angles. Uh, so that shows up as this interplay between Q and U. Stokes V, on the other hand, you don't expect to see, uh, uh, well, actually it depends on the pulsar. You might see some, some phase uh, structure or not, uh, just depending on what that pulsar likes to do. This one just looks like it has generally negative V. Um, so if I just vanish that, you can see it across the band. Um, but of course there is Faraday rotation due to the interstellar medium. So actually what you end up seeing is something like this. Q and U now have this banded structure both uh, as a function of frequency and phase. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the gap is actually just a coarse channel that was discarded. And Faraday rotation doesn't affect V, so you, you shouldn't see a change in V. But this data set from this pulsar was actually taken two weeks after the last one. So when we, uh, the, for the other pulsar I mentioned, uh, and when we looked at V actually in detail, we saw this standard structure, which was like, oh damn, uh, actually there is clearly some leakage there because you can see this, this signature of the Faraday rotation in V. And this is exactly what Xiang was showing before in, in her talk. Um, uh, she was just showing a single uh, 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 plot uh, uh, dimension across frequency, but here I've got this phase information as well. Okay, so clearly leakage is a problem. Uh, so, um, an early attempt to address that, um, there's a lot in this plot, but I'll try to be brief. Um, first of all, these colored plots over here, I tried to overlay U, uh, Q, U and V into an RGB uh, scheme so I could have a look at them all in one go. And here I've got, um, as the animation scrolls up, you're seeing uh, the, the points in that spectrum that are within the pulse window being plotted in QUV space um, on a unit sphere. And, uh, and you can see actually the signature of uh, Faraday rotation is just this circle going around and around and around, most obviously in the QU plane. Um, but we know that there sh shouldn't be any change in V. The arrow here is actually just a normal to a plane fitted to those data in each, in each, at each frequency channel. Um, so what I tried to do then was to fit a plane and then correct for it because you don't expect that plane to be tilting as you go through, uh, as you go through frequency. Tilting in the plane means that you're getting some kind of extra leakage into V. So subtracting out that correction or making that correction makes a difference between a Stokes V where you can see in the third column on the right hand side that uh, still has that strong signature of Faraday rotation. And, and then on the most right after the correction, you can see it's virtually gone. Maybe if you squint, you can see a little bit in there. So this was quite encouraging. Um, so we took this solution 
and applied it to the two week beforehand data from this other pulsar. The reason why that we thought that might work is because there was this talk on the ground, a discussion with other groups that, um, that the, uh, the cause of this particular kind of leakage might be, might be instrumental and might be stable over long enough time periods. So when I applied it to that data set, you can see this is actually just a single pulse from that from that data, um, from that pulsar, and you can still see that uh, banded structure in Stokes V. This is Stokes V I'm showing. But then after we apply the correction, the banded structure largely goes away. The finer structure that's left over is consistent with, uh, with scintillation. So this is very encouraging. And then you can start to explore the data and you see some really exciting things. Um, this is, these are all Stokes V I'm showing here. These are different pulses. Now I've just changed this color scale so you can see when it changes from positive to negative Stokes V. So even though on average, this pulsar has um, a one-sided Stokes V, um, actually from pulse to pulse, you can see it flipping and changing. Um, and as far as I know, this is something that is not yet fully understood. And furthermore, it seems increasingly unlikely now, especially after these corrections, that this has to do with, um, that this can be entirely explained by some kind of leakage. So that's very exciting. Um, also, we found in this particular data set um, that uh, weirdly the the absolute position angle seemed to be changing over the course of the observation. This is a this is actually showing individual pulses in rapid succession, um, and the two bands of uh, of points you can see in the top panel show the the position angle um, for the two polarization modes. But then if I skip towards the end of the animation, you can actually see that the whole bands have shifted up. Um, and this made us scratch our heads for a while, but in the end we found that actually that this is due to uh, ionospheric uh, rotation measure uh, changing over the course of our uh, roughly one hour observation. And this uh, we found was consistent with other studies of rotation measure due to ionospheric changes over that over those time scales that other people have found in the, in, in the past. Um, so that's exciting as well. We can also you know probe um, probe the ionosphere in this way. Um, so this was all uh, done with this uh, slightly hacky, maybe one-off analysis of the leakage and correction that I did. Um, but then actually talking with all the other groups, they already have all of these fantastic ways that they can improve the, uh, <laughs> the calibration solutions. Uh, so taking a leaf out of their book, um, we actually uh, started doing what everybody else has been doing for years now and, uh, and found that the frequency structure we see across the MWA band in the calibration solutions can be corrected in this way. Um, and we can get rid of uh, to a large extent, all the uh, the frequency dependence of the of, of of the calibration solutions, which meant that we we can make uh, we can rely on uh, on our polarization data a lot more confidently. Um, and actually, uh, this is the 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 B O six two eight pulsar again, the same data set this time without that coarse channel thrown away. And it looks fantastic now, absolutely. It's better than my crappy correction that I did uh, originally. Um, so with this, we're now more confident that we can do some, um, start to do some really good pulsar pol polarimetry science. Um, we've implemented, along with uh, those things, we've implemented the FEE beam. Um, uh, we've been using Chris's hyperbeam uh, and and, uh, and and also this uh, also the kinds of corrections that the imaging people have been doing all along. So that's all now in our pipeline, which is great. Just in time for a rewrite. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, so but now of course we can take the lessons we've learned going forward into the into the rewrite of the software for the MYX mode. Um, how much time do I have left? Real quick. Uh, you have four minutes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so. Um, Sorry? I think the last talk went over, so you can probably go over a couple of minutes too. So you, six minutes. Okay, no worries. No, no, I'm, I'm not too far away from the end now, so that's fine. Um, so one thing that we can make sure we do to, uh, uh, at least for, um, for any targeted observations we might make in the future, is to always take five minutes uh, just to observe a well-known, well-studied pulsar 
um, so that we can always make just check to see whether or not there's any weird uh, polarization uh, craziness going coming in because of our calibration solutions. Um, so that's something we can build into our working pipeline uh, going forward. It's an easy thing to do. Um, in fact, I picked out a, a small number of pulsars that might be good candidates for that, based largely on their brightness, but also on um, also on the number of uh, rotations you expect due to interstellar medium Faraday rotation across the particular band you might be you happen to be observing in. Um, so these are some likely candidates um, for pulsars. Or they may there may be better ones. It remains to be seen. But this is our shortlist for the time being. Um, so if you want to perhaps do a little more thorough job, um, we could probably also start to complement the existing source lists uh, that we use for calibration using the RTS or hyperdrive or whatever uh, with some more polarized sources. So that would require, it's more difficult because it requires us to actually understand what the low frequency um, polarization of pulsars in the field are. And, and this is a fairly under uh, underrepresented um, uh, sample. We, we don't have a good understanding uh, of often of low frequency polarization of pulsars. So that would, that would be a quite in-depth study we would have to do. But also um, it's a little bit um, not so good because the, when you average visibilities over times, um, a lot of that linear polarization gets washed out. Um, so you can do something more sophisticated and other groups have been doing things more sophisticated to take into account the fact that you can, uh, you, you should know what uh, Pulsar's uh, profile, polar, pol polarimetric profile looks like, and you can build that into a, some kind of calibration scheme. So this is something we might explore in the future. Um, and then, and, and there may be other things to do as well that haven't been done in the past. And actually, I was really hoping that this talk would be about a new calibration technique that uh, uh, that I've been thinking of, um, but uh, it wasn't uh, mature enough yet to present today. Um, but I will just give a quick uh, a quick description of the idea. As I just said, uh, the problem with using pulsars as calibration sources is is the uh, the averaging of the visibilities in time because it dilutes a lot of your useful polarization information. Um, and, uh, and I got to thinking, well, actually, um, pulsars, um, the, because they're repeating sources, uh, there's either by folding, forming a profile or by, or by looking at a spectrum, you can actually condense a lot of the information about pulsars into a relatively small number of frequency components. Um, and I think that's true not only for the Stokes parameters, but also for the raw, visit, uh, the raw voltages. So I thought maybe we can use some other kind of, uh, 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 not, not a traditional visibility, but some other kind of data product based on vol voltages that could be used for some kind of calibration scheme. So, uh, uh, and along these lines, I was thinking it's much more useful uh, possibly to do this in a circular basis. So I have all of these ideas, but as I said, they're not yet mature enough for me to um, expand on them beyond that. But if you're interested, come and talk to me. Um, so finally, over the last year, we've uh, dipped our toe into the exciting world of pulsar polarization, but we haven't yet dived in fully because the uh, uh, persistent leakage problems um, that not just us, but other groups have experienced as well. Um, but we are gaining confidence that uh, that the current mitigation strategies, mostly led by the imaging group uh, that, that I've been liaising with and to whom I thank very much, um, that we can start to have confidence that our polarization is looking good, good enough to do science with. Um, we have all of this data um, that can be turned into papers just as soon as we gain confidence. and. Uh, and, uh, and then I've also been spending a lot of time thinking up possible new ways to, to calibrate uh, the MWA using pulsars. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Amy. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, Andrew Williams has put something in the Slack, which seems interesting. He says that if you guys can come up with a half dozen polarization calibrator sources, at the ranges of RA, he can include them in a standard calibration block in the morning and evening. 
and he asked whether a single observation at one frequency band would be okay or whether you would need it need all of the standard bands on the target well if i'm thinking selfishly to be honest a lot of our pulsar work um, is done within only one or two bands uh, so selfishly i would say that we could get away with uh, with using one or two um, um, i think yes we absolutely could be potentially providing lists of calibrators. Um, obviously, they would have to be bright enough and uh, stable enough so that, first of all, the profile converges only after a few minutes, um, but also that the averaging, like in the standard calibration mode that Andrew is describing, so that, uh, that would also have to be, uh, have not a significant amount of dilution of their polarization after after that averaging. So that would all have to be checked. But in principle, uh, yes, that could be something we we should probably should be something we would do. Yep. Oh, that's true. Yep. Um, are there is there any is there a last question from anyone? Otherwise, uh, thanks a lot, Sammy. Really good improvements, it seems, and exciting things coming up. Um, so we'll move on to the last talk of this session by Nick Swainston on the smart survey, smart pulse hour survey. Yeah, you just stop sharing, Sammy, and I can start. Oh, here we go. Yep. All right. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yep, to both. You're good to All go. Right. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the smart pulsar survey with Amdo, where your progress to date and the first results. So obviously a pulsar survey is a big undertaking. So I have all these researchers down the bottom to thank. And I'd also like to apologize in advance, a bit of overlap with Ramesh's talk, but I'll be going into things in a bit more detail. So uh, as was talked about, so the smart pulsar survey is 70, 80 minute observations. We've already observed 51 of them. And of these 30 of them, I've done a 10 minute search. It's just a quick, uh, just using the first 10 minutes of the data to find any bright pulsars um, before other telescopes find them. So this has produced about four and a half million pulsar candidates, which is just a completely unfeasible amount to go through. Uh, so what we did is we got the machine learning classifier from LOFA, and that helped us uh, reduce the number of candidates by about an order of magnitude down to about 400,000, but that's still a lot to get through. Um, I've, myself mostly and a few other st uh, students like Stuart have gone through a lot of these candidates by eye to human classify them and we've got to do about 20,000. And that was a worthy effort. Uh, with this is our first pulsar discovery, uh, J336. Um, so Ramesh talked about um, these plots briefly. So just a quick refresher. Uh, here's the pulse profile repeated twice. Um, you can see in time that you can see the pulsar the entire time. And this is in frequency. You can see it through most of the frequency band. And this is dispersion measure. We get more sensitive as we get towards the true dispersion measure. It's not like a random fluctuation. And you can see the same thing here in period and period derivative. So this looks like a good candidate. So I started to follow it up. I reobserved it with the full observation and I could see it even brighter. So then what we can do with the voltage capture system is because that it, we have the, voc the voltages archived, we can re-beam form immediately without having to reobserve with a telescope. So that's what I've done here. So these, each of these green circles rec represents the full width half maximum of a tidal rate beam. These two thick ones are the two beams I originally detected the pulsar in. And then um, from the signal to noises of each of these detections, I can estimate where I think this pulsar truly is, which is shown by this shaded green circle here. So this is with the phase two comeback array, which has very wide full width half maximum uh, tidal rate beams, which is why we do the survey edit. But because we have archival observations, I can get an even better localization. So for example, with phase one observations, larger baseline, baseline smaller full width half maximum, I can make another grid of beams, so by these red circles, and I can further increase my position estimate shown by this shaded red circle here. And then one more time with the extended array, which is the, the smallest forward half maximum. 
Uh, so then we get this localization here, which was about a bit less than 20 arc seconds uncertainty on our position, pretty much immediately without having to reobserve, which is pretty cool. So we did try to image it with the MWA, but unfortunately we don't quite have the sensitivity to see this faint source. So we then followed it up with the GMR telescope in both band three and four, and we were able to detect it as shown within this little red circle here. So this was able to help us improve our localization even further to about five arc seconds. And uh, like Ramesh showed, we were also able to detect it with parts with that localization. Uh, so obviously this is definitely a real pulsar. I've been able to detect it in multiple telescopes. And with these multiple detections at different frequencies, we can start using flux density calculations to do some spectral index stuff. So first, uh, normally when you're doing flux density calculations, you do multiple observations to help average out scintillation. But because we didn't have the telescope time to do that, instead what we did is we estimated the scintillation bandwidth using MWA observations of PSR J0437. And then just use a theoretical scaling to convert that to RDM um, to work out. So this scintillation bandwidth used to, we used, so we split our observation into sub bands larger than the scintillation bandwidth to hopefully average out short-term scintillation effects. So you can see this here. So using GMRT and PARCS, we were able to fit a spectral index of about negative two plus or minus 0.2. Uh, so the average spectral index is about negative 1.6. So this is steeper than usual. So we can call it a steep spectrum pulsar. And with these uh, flux density measurements and its dispersion measure, we can then get a distance from the dispersion measure and a electron density model. So the distance and the flux density, we can work at the luminosity, which is about 0 0.1 millijanskis. And there's only about, there's only 40 other pulsars with a lower luminosity out of about 3000. So we can say that this is a low luminosity, pulse, low luminosity steep spectrum pulsar, which is the type of pulsar we're hoping to detect in these sort of smart surveys, because we are more sensitive at these lower frequencies to these types of pulsars compared to high frequency telescopes like PARCs. So uh, Ramesh already showed this plot, but, uh, so this just shows that the archival detections are very useful and that this pulsar shows a lot of sort of variability. Um, and you can see here in purple, this is my first pulsar. This is the first detection of the pulsar. So it seems that I was actually pretty lucky that it was pulsar was scintillating up when I was looking at it. Um, and this shows one of the benefits of uh, low frequency surveys that the scintillation can really help us out sometimes. Uh, yeah, and I think I must talk about that one enough. So yeah, this is, you know, most probably sick of seeing this beautiful image, but yeah, uh, as a summary, uh, we found a steep spectrum low luminosity pulsar and we've published a paper and the new releases are all out. Um, I even did uh, two little interviews, which was um, pretty exciting. So, but uh, no rest for the wicked. There's still lots of uh, candidates to classify, about 400,000. This is still a bit unfeasible, so we're hoping to improve our machine learning models. We have a couple of honors students working on this. If we get this down by another order of magnitude, that'd be great, but we'll see how they go. Um, it's also a bit unfeasible for me to sort of do this on my laptop and then sort of hope I'm keeping track well enough. Um, so our database would be much better, especially as we start to get more and people more and more people classifying these candidates. So Paul Hancock and the Curtin Institute of Computation team have made us this sort of beta version of a Pulsar database, which you can see here. So it's pretty simple, but I don't care how it looks. It works pretty well so far. So this is what you sort of see if you wanted to classify candidates. It would give you sort of an image like this, kind of like I showed before. So this one's probably noise, you can't really see anything. So you'd give it a rating one to five. In this case, you'd give it just one and you submit and you'd be able to go through a lot fairly efficiently and it would keep track of the ratings for you, which would be pretty efficient. Uh, so yeah, if this sounds fun or maybe if you know any students that would like to do this, uh, yeah, get them in contact with us. We have lots of candidates to get through. We'd love some help. Uh, so Keegan Smith um, uh, went through a couple dozen of these, only a couple of dozen of these really, and found this promising candidate. Uh, which Ramesh mentioned before, um, and I said, yep, sweet, this looks pretty real. I got pretty excited and followed it up, and yeah, here was the pulsar. I'm definitely not sulky that Keegan only had to look through a couple dozen to find this pulsar. Psh, whatever. Who cares? I'm with a couple thousand. Whatever. Um, so this pulsar nulling fraction 
uh, seems to be pretty large, which is good. This is sort of one of the other types of pulsars we're hoping to detect thanks to our long dwell time. Um, so I've been able to detect it in two other compact ray observations, um, but not in any extended ray observations. So I only have a pretty wide position estimate at the moment. I'm really struggling to detect it in the extended ray observations, probably because it might just have turned off during those observations. So we see how we go. I'm still processing lots of the observations because luckily this is only 10 degrees away from my pulsar. So lots of the timing observations we did, I can use them to hopefully try and detect this pulsar. And yeah, we're following up with GMRT and parks. So eventually when we discover more pulsars, like when we get to sort of the three digits, sort of maybe a hundred or so, we can start uh, investigating the population a bit more. We can see if there's any biases between low frequency and high frequency surveys and push down the luminosity distribution of pulsars down towards the lower end. But uh, we don't have to wait to do that. There's still lots of things we can do with all these smart detections and, and the way detections we've made of known pulsars. Uh, am I missing a slide? Oh no, okay. Uh, so Meng Yao's already done sort of some of this analysis of predicting how many pulsars that the SK load can discover. So this is a plot from Meng Yao's incoherent sensors. So using her 50 pulsar detections, what you can do is given that number of pulsars and the telescope parameters, you can sort of generate this simulated pulsar population. And then you can run it through a survey with a different telescope's parameters to see, to estimate how many pulsars you can detect. So it's best to do these uh, telescopes with similar frequencies so you don't uh, introduce any biases. And uh, so now that we've really increased the sensitivity compared to many hours and increased the number of pulsars, soon we can improve on this uh, simulation to get a more accurate estimate, hopefully a more accurate estimate of the SDLA SKA pulsar discoveries. Um, I haven't completed this yet because I'm trying to account, I'm taking into account the end of ways varying sky sensitivity. So unlike dish telescopes, the sensitivity of the survey as part, you know, different RAs and decks changes a bit because we use drift scans and the tidal array beam is a bit complicated. And um, because at low frequencies, even the sky temperature fluctuates a bit. So I need to change this PSR pop uh, code to taking that into account, which I'm currently working on. So another thing we can do is sort of make this sort of pulsar low frequency data set. So we have these 186 pulsars and we can get all these different sort of information from it. So we can get things like dispersion measure, which as you can probably know from some of Dilpreet's work, we can get a bit more accurately at low frequencies. We can look at the scattering caused by the ISM. Uh, we can work out the flux density, uh, but that is a bit of a difficult calculation. I plan to use a method developed by Bradley Myers to simulate the tide array beam response over the entire sky. It is a bit processing uh, heavy, but I've worked with Bradley's code to make it a bit more efficient. So now it's more feasible to do on this large number of pulsar detections. Uh, so we can also look at the pulsar width and the pulsar polarization profiles. So this data set's almost ready to go. We're just working on a few edge cases and making sure all of our numbers are reasonable. Then I'll be investigating these sort of first three points and then Keegan's gonna be looking at these last two points. So some of the stuff I'm planning to do with this cool new data set once it's done. So I can uh, uh, look at the sort of correlation between dispersion measure and scattering. So this is uh, from a LOFAR paper. It shows on the x-axis dispersion measure and on the y-axis the scattering as a fraction of the pulsar period, because as the scattering starts to get close to or even longer than the pulse period, it gets very difficult to detect the pulsar. So this is sort of a limiting factor of low frequency uh, pulsar telescopes or pulsar surveys. So all the X's are non-detection. So you can see as you get to high DMs and scatterings, it's harder to detect. So with so first you can investigate this correlation to investigate the interstellar medium, but you can also use it to work out what sort of maximum DM you can feasibly detect pulsars in. And then using uh, electron density models, you can sort of work out the maximum distance that you can detect pulsars in, show this red 
lying here in the galaxy. Um, so you can, so you sort of know what sort of area in the galaxy you can find pulsars. And this might even help our surveys in the future because we can set a more list, a more uh, reasonable maximum dispersion measure that we search out to, to make it maybe make it a bit more efficient. So with the flux density measurements that we'll have, often these will be the first ones at low frequencies. So we can start to investigate the spectral properties of pulsars. So most pulsars can be described with a single power law. Um, so they just get brighter at uh, lower frequencies. But some of them show this low frequency spectral turnover, which you can see in this plot here. So the, it's straight, but eventually starts to turn over and decrease. We think this is due to either synchrotron self-absorption or thermal free-free emission. If I can use this uh, data set to work out how many pulsars turn over and at what frequencies, then I can start to investigate, are there any common uh, pulsar properties that show spectral turnover? Like there has been some uh, correlation between the period and the frequency of the turnover that has been shown. Hopefully this will help us understand the emission properties of the pulsars and why they sort of turn over. But yeah, that's future work. Hopefully it'll be ready to go soon. So here's a little summary slide. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Nick. That was uh, fantastic. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Uh, so the Kyra boardroom has raised their hand. So go ahead. Um, good, really cool talk. I liked it a lot. Um, on your slide where you showed uh, the number of pulsars for the different telescopes, if you do sort of a, a yeah, that one. This one? Yep. No, 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 the other one. Oh, Sorry. Uh, this one. Yeah, that one. No, no, no. <laughs> the one in between this those one. two. Oh, uh, yes. this one? Yep. No. Ah, <laughs> yeah, this one, this one, this one, this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so with this one, like you're already um, relying on on getting uh, honor students to flick through all of the observations and, and rate your pulsar candidates. When we get to like SKA low, is that really going to be feasible anymore? Is I like <laughs> yeah, there's only so many honor students around, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some students, yeah. We just keep going lower <laughs> down the, to the undergraduates, etc. Is there a plan yeah. for that? Well, one would be hopefully get, well, to an extent, this smart survey, lots of the stuff I'm doing, like handling big data rates and this sort of problem that you've exactly uh, pointed out is some of the things I hope to learn from so we can improve them for SKA. So hopefully some of the honors students work in machine learning Will really help that out because yeah if we can reduce that by an order of magnitude fantastic and that's feasible that's roughly what LOFAR can do so their version is 99% accurate and ours about 90 so if we can get that up sweet step one's done um but yeah I don't know we're just it's it's something that's always had to be done with pulsar surveys you just have to go through lots of candidates but I don't know if the SKA is a bigger project hopefully we'll have more honest students we'll see fingers <laughs> crossed yeah. <laughs> Can I jump in as well from the boardroom? Is that all right? Yep, go um, for it. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, so uh, I had a question about that last plot that you showed with the pulsar spectrum. Um, if it was just the last slide. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah, is there variability in this pulsar as well? Or is that bump on the kind of two to five gigahertz, is that a real thing? That the way it kind oh, of so goes off the power loop? Yeah, so this isn't my work. Um, it's uh, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest pulsar, pulsar spectral index papers. Um, so I can't remember that exact one, but like pulsars are, it's very hard to get accurate flux density calculations because they can scintillate and understanding the telescope is very hard. Um, so I'm not sure for that exact one, but yeah, who knows. Okay, no worries. And then I guess the other question is, I, I can kind of understand the pulsar being synchrotron self-absorbed, but what is causing, what could cause the free-free absorption stuff around it? Uh, probably just it's, uh, it's um, minute, speed, minute, ions. Oh, I've forgotten. Um, it's, 
I forgot my pulse of physics. Um, there's, what's it called? Plasma. Yeah, I think it's just the, the surrounding plasma. Um, I oh, can't. So, like it's embedded in something, like, or behind a H2 region. It's not intrinsic or like, I don't know, in the system. In oh, plasma. that's a good question. I'm not sure. I, I, I assumed it was the local plasma, but that's a good point. There might be something in between. I, yeah, I have I to go. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, I have to dive into that. That's a good point. Uh, Ramesh has raised his hand too. So go ahead, Ramesh. Okay, so okay, if you can hear me, then it was just a quick answer to uh, Natasha's uh, first question. Uh, for that particular person, Natasha, the DM is a uh, dispersion measure is very high, close to 500. So in terms of uh, variability, um, we are not expecting anything uh, more than a factor of two uh, at any of the bands that is uh, shown here. So I don't think uh, the issue there is the variability. It is most likely the telescope systematics. Uh, as you can see that uh, the data have come from like multiple different telescopes and different people. So the combination of different biases and um, uh, obviously this particular group has gone to the extent of like a developing an algorithm that is pretty much robust and uh, you know that uh, gives penalizes uh, uh, outliers. But I don't think the variability is a big issue for this particular one. Thank oh, you. thanks. Okay, uh, I think it's uh, time to wrap up this session. So thanks, Nick, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, it's lunchtime, or depending on where you are, some other break time. So we'll be back in an hour at 10 past the hour. So see you all soon. See you later, and thanks, Amon, for being a great session chair. Nice work. All right, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Awesome, yeah, I can see the text. Yeah. Awesome. I'm Jaden, and I'll be chairing this uh, session, the last session of the MWA project meeting. Um, just to let the speakers know, I'll be giving you a one minute warning before the end of your talk. Uh, today, in this session, the first talk we have is a solo update from uh, Devia Obrai. Sorry if I pronounce names incorrectly. Um, uh, ready when you are. Okay. Thanks, Jaden. And your pronunciation was fine. So uh, the one minute warning, is it at 15, uh, 14 minutes or 19 minutes? Um, uh, for the updates, I think they seem to be going a bit longer. So I'll give you one for 19 minutes. Okay. Well, I was hoping to time it for 15, but that's, that's fine. So let's see how it goes. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Devi Obroy. Happy to be here giving you the solar update. Uh, and hope all of you are doing well. So here is the team uh, on behalf of which I'm presenting. Most of the names are familiar. The new additions are highlighted in color. That's Shilpi Bhunia, who was a MS student with me uh, past year and now is at Trinity College, uh, Ireland, pursuing her PhD with Oyen Carly. And so these are the two new people to have joined our fold. And here's the various areas or most of the various areas in which we've been working. Most of our work has been on uh, learning more about these so-called weak, impulsive, narrowband quite sun emissions or winks as we like to call them. Uh, we've also been working on uh, developing a polarimetric imaging pipeline, which we call pair cars, a take on the original name, which was air cars. And we've been finding uh, sort of initially serendipitously, and then we've been looking for them, lots of waves and sort of quasi-periodic pulsations in, in solar emissions. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. Uh, Shilpi has been working on studying a type two that I'll not talk much about today. Okay, so put things to put things in context, let me uh, briefly tell you something about coronal heating. So. The figure which you see on the screen has coronal height on the x-axis and the solid curve shows you the coronal temperature on the y-axis. Now, 
basically, the mystery is that as you rise above the photosphere, the temperature first drops and then it rises again to about 10,000 Kelvin and then much more steeply to a million Kelvin or so as you come to the corona. And uh, finding an answer to that, that how is this million Kelvin corona sitting atop a 5,800 Kelvin photosphere is what is referred to as the coronal heating problem. Now, this coronal medium is permeated by magnetic fields, and the base of these magnetic fields are in the photosphere, which is undergoing all these churning motions. And so the magnetic field you have in the corona is all sort of twisted and tangled. And there is consensus in the community that it is the energy from this magnetic field which has somehow been extracted to heat up the corona. So now the question becomes, how do you extract this energy from the coronal magnetic field? And one of the ways to do it is via so-called nanoflares, which were uh, proposed by Parker actually a bit later in 1988, where the idea was that if you have oppositely directed magnetic fields coming close to each other in an environment like our corona, the magnetic field tries to uh, move towards a lower energy state by dissipating some of its energy, which shows up in the form of heating uh, for the local plasma. And so signatures of this heating is what people have been looking at for or looking for for decades now. And so the plot on the right shows you uh, energy in Earth on the x-axis and the histogram of this uh, energy density distribution of these various impulsive events on the y-axis. And the energy range of order 10 to the power 24 herbs is what is referred to as nanoflares. And people have been finding them. The only issue has been that uh, the distribution of these nanoflares, you expect this power loss slope to be steeper than minus two if these, uh, have, if these have to give rise to coronal heating. And people have been robustly finding the slope to be around minus 1.8. And in addition, the distribution of these events, whenever we have the capability to image them, also seems to follow the distribution of active regions on the sun, while we know that <clears throat> the corona all over the sun is hot, not just close to the active regions. Okay, so where does radio come in? So the nice thing is that each of these small reconnections, which are dumping their energy in the plasma, they are going to also accelerate the electrons which are there, which uh, will then give rise to these non-thermal electron beams, which uh, give out plasma emission. And this emission mechanism gives rise to coherent radio emission. And the wonderful thing about that is that it gives rise to a disproportionately large observational signature, right? I can shine a milliwatt laser across a very large room and you can still see it clearly. And this has been known for a while, so why have people not been doing it? And the reason for that is that it's it's been quite hard to do. So these emissions are quite impulsive. We know that they are uh, at time scales significantly smaller than a second. We've been finding them to be quite narrow band, maybe order 100 kilohertz or so. And uh, the, the flux densities corresponding to them are also rather low. Uh, we've been finding them to be in the regime of 1 to 10 milli SFU. An SFU is uh, 10,000 Jansky, and the typical flux of the sun in this frequency range might be anywhere between, say, 20,000 Jansky to a few hundred thousand uh, Jansky. So you're looking for a really tiny signal on top of a rather large background, and that is what has been making it hard. Okay, so we published our first detection of these wings last year, and that got us really excited. And what we were really looking at was the following. If uh, FIT is to represent the uh, the flux density which we are seeing in the ith region at the th at the th timestamp, you subtract from this the median of the uh, intensity distribution for that particular PSF size region and normalize by the same median. And if you were to look at the histograms of these guys, this is what you see on the right hand side. And if you were to push this to milli SFU units approximately, so this is where one SFU is and this is about 10 SFU. And we find that the slopes of all of these guys are uh, beyond two or uh, steeper than minus two, which was really exciting for us. And we looked at about 70 minutes of data, uh, gave rise to around 33,000 images. And we were finding lots and lots of these features at this frequency of 132 megahertz. We had roughly around 33,500 uh, detections, which we, which we had of these wings. So we wanted to confirm this and we wanted to look at another data, which uh, I should have pointed out that here this, this dark uh, magenta spot was the site of an active region, which we chose to ignore for the purposes of uh, this work. 
And then we looked at another independent data set, uh, which was chosen specifically to not have any active region at all. And we repeated the same analysis. We had improved our imaging a little bit, and we found actually a much larger number of weaker features. And that was something like this 87,000. The surprising thing, however, was that uh, this, this first red bar, uh, green bar is supposed to mark the end of the power law, which you had seen at the earlier plot, around 1 milli SFU. And the highest flux density features which we see are just around a factor of two. Earlier, we had more than an order of magnitude, uh, uh, this power law extending over more than an order of magnitude range. And that was really surprising that the brightest of these winds have gone missing. And that sort of sent us starting to look at the older data. And we found that all of the more energetic winks in the earlier data set, they came somewhere from the periphery of that lone active region. So that was uh, some solace. And then we looked at the distribution function of, uh, of these events, and we found that it is actually described very well by a log normal function. And to tell you the story of what inspired us to do this, uh, so uh, much earlier in 2007, Paulahan and Solanki, they were looking at EUV data, or rather what they were wanting to do is to simulate uh, the observed time series from an instrument assuming that the time series came from a large number of uh, impulsive events, each with its characteristic decay time, right? And the impulsive events were drawn from a power law distribution of the of original events. And they found that if you have unresolved uh, such events, your sampling is imperfect and your resolution is not high enough, what you end up with is uh, something which looks, which is modeled very well by a log normal distribution. And in fact, they tried to model this log normal distribution in terms of the five parameters they had for their time series. And uh, so we also seem to be in a similar regime, or it looks like at least that uh, what we find is consistent with a bunch of unresolved uh, events, which would be present in these data. Each one of them is impulsive, and they have been drawn from a power law distribution. So that, that does sound uh, very exciting and more needs to be done on this front. Okay, now as I told you earlier that the basic quantity we started with was just some sort of a deviation from the medium, some normalized deviation from the medium inside a PSF sized element. Now naturally there are better ways to detect these. So right, what you would prefer to do is to look at things in the image plane and intrinsically find out these peaks and then begin to study them. And that's something which uh, we have started to do. And another reason why you might want to do this is that from first principles, you expect these wings to be quite compact, but we know that the corona is, uh, is an inhomogeneous medium. And so on its way out, this radiation is going to get scatter broadened. And maybe if our resolution allows us, we might be able to say something about the scatter broadening properties of the coronal medium if we are able to actually see them. And so we decided to use uh, uh, machine learning uh, based techniques to look for that. And here is a poster which we had submitted last year to uh, the ADAS. All I want you to notice from here is if you look at this example image of the sun, there is that active region which you had seen earlier. Then there are these bunch of things which we call clustered peaks and there are these isolated peaks. And we've been modeling these isolated peaks uh, as Gaussians. And what you see here are the residuals from a Gaussian fit. And you can't read the numbers here, but the residuals are within plus minus 4%, right? So the isolated peaks which we are getting are actually quite, uh, uh, they're very well described by a Gaussian function. And these histograms, which again, you can't really see, are the histograms of uh, distributions of the axial ratio, the major axis, the intensity, and the area of these. And so we've been chugging along on these, and this is where we are right now in terms of the distributions which we see. Uh, these come from, a, from the data set which did not have that active region. And you find that these are actually very sharply peaked, right? This is just a factor of two in terms of axial ratio, and you drop by more than two orders of magnitude just across a factor of two. Okay. Uh, this major axis is measured in units of pixels, and our PSF is something like three, three by five pixels. So I think this is... Uh, so we are finding them to be quite unresolved. The median uh, axial ratio is also similar to our uh, point spread function. So this also seems to be matching sort of our expectations and uh, this is something which we are progressing on. Now, uh, even though at radio wavelengths, uh, it becomes much easier to see these events, 
it becomes much the quantity of interest from coronal heating perspective is actually how much energy was dumped into the corona and only a small fraction of what was dumped into the corona makes out uh, as the radio waves and it's very hard to go from the radio energy which you have captured to the amount of energy which would have been dumped in the corona because it's a non linear process via which this emission takes place on the other hand if you were to look at euv or soft x ray because there you are looking at thermal electrons which are giving rise to this radiation that process is much easier so we wanted to see if we can actually begin to see the euv counterparts of these quite some emissions now we realized that these individual events are naturally too faint for us to be able to see them but what if we looked at a cluster of these guys and that's what we uh, shurajit rather tried to do in this work okay so if you were to sort of zoom in in this particular part here are the radio contours which you see here and there is a dashed box here and a solid box here and these are two euv transient features which we identified in the vicinity of this active region. which could have been uh, corresponding to winds which we saw uh, to give to the sense of what it looks like in the is the range and you see that uh, there uh, uh, i'll just switch off my videos okay let me uh, because Sorry. So the correspondence between the radio light curve and the EUV light curve is really really it's and if you look at energy positive in the orbit of this particular piece, that gives you a number like 10 to the power 25 or so something like. 10 times that of a nano flare and this entire picture ties up very nicely uh, in terms of a, a, the physical scenario which we are trying to interpret it is the same scenario which we saw in multiple studies which we have done. just a little bit you to learn more that I wanted to talk bit of the trick work we are doing so uh, because all of this low frequency emission is arising in the corona and uh, uh, there is the sense of field this corona naturally leads to emission of the types of radio charge seen dynamic spectra here we also have the quiet sun and we also have the gyrosynchrotron emission from the coronal magnetic uh, coronal mass ejections which is sitting here now on the panel on top the red boxes are showing you the brightness temperature on the left hand side and the blue boxes are showing you the fractional circular polarization on the right hand side so the brightness temperatures range from something like 10 to the power 5 or a little bit 10 to the power 4 actually for this uh, gyrosynchrotron emission to something like 10 to the power 15 for these type 3 emissions so that's an enormous range in brightness temperatures to span and similarly the the fractional polarizations which you see they can be very high for type 1s and type 4s hitting almost 100% while if you get to the quiet sun they are at our frequencies of interest they are usually less than a percent okay now i should also mention that uh, a lot of the studies which have been done for these known types of bursts uh, the polarimetric studies they are most of the time not imaging studies most of those have been done using just the dynamic spectrum so it would be actually a big jump if we were to be able to do this routinely uh, i should also mention that some work uh, looking at the polarization of type 3 radio bursts has already been done using the mwa and that was done by Patrick McCauley uh, working at University of Sydney with fever. So, some so basically this is now the the hunting ground which we want to sort of play in. I specifically want to point out the this quite sun uh, circular polarization. This arises because even though the the thermal radiation is supposed to be non-polarized as it is propagating through this magnetized plasma, 
because of the slight difference in the refractive indices for the X and the O modes, it picks up just a slight amount of circular polarization. It is yet to be detected. And also the, the polarized emission from the gyrosynchrotron emission from the CME plasma, that is also yet to be uh, detected. And that's also going to be wonderful because that now significantly increases the number of constraints using which you can model the spectra and get physical information out. And so this developing this uh, polarimetric imaging pipeline, which we call uh, pair cars or polarimetry using automated imaging routine for compact areas for the radio sun is the thesis project of uh, Dirijyoki Kansubanek. And the, we've also been using this, this opportunity to actually sort of reorganize, rationalize and improve the pipeline which we had earlier, the air cars, which didn't quite have the polarimetric part into it. So the polarimetry sits inside this pink box that box itself grows into something much larger. Uh, David Jyoti and I will be happy to discuss this in more detail offline. But what I want to do here is to show you some initial results from our uh, air cars. So this is a type one, one of those bursts which could be up to almost 100% circularly polarized. And the color scale here shows you the circular polarization. The green contours are the total intensity. Okay. Here's an example from a type two burst, one of the few which we have seen using the MWA. This is also quite uh, nicely circularly polarized, something about minus 53% or so. Uh, what we are particularly excited about is this quite some uh, polar polarimetric or, or polarization detection. This picture doesn't quite do justice to it because of the presence of these uh, large negative and a smaller positive circular polarization. But if I was to change the color scale to highlight it, you would find that uh, we have somewhere around 0.7 to 1.2% circular polarization at the edges in these regions. And in this region around the center, we have around 0.2% uh, percent, uh, uh, fractional circular polarization. And that is very close to one sigma for now. But uh, there's certainly a hint that uh, this is something which is going to come within reach. Uh, so that's something we are very excited about. Another thing which we are very excited about as well is that uh, it is the same type one burst, but for which I am now showing you the linear polarization, right? And this is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, among the first linear polarization detections from the sun, because the conventional wisdom has been essentially that uh, there is going to be so much differential Faraday rotation uh, as the waves are propagating out of the corona that it is going to wash out all signatures of linear polarization. Uh, but I should mention that this bandwidth over which we are doing is almost an order of magnitude smaller than what has previously been used. So it is perhaps feasible uh, that uh, one could actually detect it. And just I'll be happy. Minute. Say that again? Yeah. Just one minute. Okay, yeah. one minute more. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay, I am going to use more time than, than I thought. Yeah. Okay, this is the last piece which I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, in terms of the science which we are doing. So quite serendipitously early on, we found uh, a sort of quasi-periodic pulsation of order about three seconds or so. So let me first say what this plot is. This is x-axis x is sort of roughly the period in seconds and y-axis is the flux density of the, the emission where we found it, right? And these quasi-periodic pulsations have been regarded as a common feature uh, during flaring processes. And people have been studying this at x-rays and, uh, and EUV and even at higher radio frequencies, many gigahertz or so. But now for the first time, we are looking at it at low radio frequencies and we are actually doing quite a good job. And what we are finding is that uh, these guys actually seem to be present almost all the time, right? We are, we are spanning roughly four orders of magnitude here in flux density and we find them to be there. And we are looking at these energetically weak features where these electron beams they are not going to be the ones responsible for setting up these, uh, these oscillations. They are just like test particles which are lighting up the magnetic bundle through which they are propagating. And so the picture we are slowly evolving is that there is this widespread presence of these, uh, these MHP oscillations which are there and these radio uh, emissions are allowing us to actually become aware of their presence. So that is quite nice. Uh, here are the publications from our last year. The one on top was accepted just earlier this week. And the list at the bottom for the ones in preparation is sort of incomplete, but this is where uh, we have at least 
some rough semblance of a draft. In the near term, we want to finish uh, our work on pair cards, sort of integrate all the different pieces of the pipeline, also want to include a improved flux calibration into it. Winks, uh, we want to pursue further. Uh, we started a project with uh, Ramesh and his group on VCS, which is sort of languished for a bit. We want to get back to it as soon as we make some space on our plate to be able to do that. Like I said earlier, it's hard to get an estimate of the energy dumped into the corona from radio emissions alone. To attack the problem from a different perspective, we are now trying to simulate the radio emissions from weak energetic, uh, weak uh, reconnections so that we can get an independent handle on their energies. Uh, Shilpi and Ayan are studying the type two burst. I showed you a few examples from pair cars. Once we are, once we have sort of satisfied ourselves of the robustness of pair cars, we want to go after the science which it is going to deliver. And there's a, it's very interesting that there's a bunch of uh, spacecraft which are up there, which provide very interesting opportunities for us to make coordinated observations, and we hope to have better success with them going forward. Uh, sorry for the typo on, on top. So what I want to leave you with is that uh, we are really exploring sort of previously unexplored and interesting parts of the solar radio physics phase space, and we have carefully chosen them to match the strengths of MWA. And we are continuing to invest in building a good set of tools and techniques to, for the analysis of these data. We have a small but slowly growing team, and we have more interesting stuff to come, so stay tuned. And I just want to end by thanking uh, essentially team MWA for making this beautiful science possible. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, we're running a little bit late. So if uh, we could do the questions offline in the chat, that would be great. Um, we're just gonna move on to the next talk. So the next talk is by Dr. Surajit Mondal and it's insights from snapshot spectroscopic radio observations of a weak type one solar noise storm. Uh, ready for you to share your slides whenever you are. Yep, we can see your screen. Awesome. Uh, take it away. Hello. Yeah. So today I will be talking about the insights we have gained from snapshot spectroscopic radio observations of a weak type one solar noise storm. The solar type one noise storms are the most commonly observed non-thermal emission in the metric band. These type of noise storms are characterized by intense narrowband impulsive bursts over a long-lived wideband emission. This wideband emission can be present for even several days, whereas these intense impulsive emissions are present probably for a few seconds. In this image, I have overlaid the radio contours of a noise storm on top of a 94 angstrom image. So this uh, in the underlying uh, white, slightly whitish color is the active region to which this noise storm was associated with. The noise storm emission is believed to be arising from intense plasma emission from non-thermal accelerated electrons which are trapped inside the coronal loops. These coronal loops are known to host the various MHD waves like sausage modes, torsional modes, etc. Now, these wave modes are interesting to study because using them, it is possible to infer the magnetic field density, etc., of the corona. Now, such studies have mostly been done in the extreme ultraviolet and the X ray bands. However, these waves also have radio signatures. A key advantage of using radio data for such studies is because is that the radio data is available at a much higher time and frequency resolution and at higher heights. Hence, it is possible to study fast oscillations and also study them at higher coronal heights. Hence, this, the radio data has the potential to revolutionize the study of coronal seismology. In the past, 
there has been several studies using the these radio oscillations and these oscillations can be divided into three classes the fast oscillations the very fast oscillations have periods less than 0.5 seconds these oscillations are most probably not produced by mhd waves and can be produced due to fragmented energy release during a burst to reconnection process the short period waves where the period range from 0.5 to 5 seconds are generally interpreted as produced due to mhd modes and this is a figure where the detected short period waves has been plotted along with the frequency please note uh, in in the frequency range between 100 to 200 megahertz which approximate the band mw observes the pulse periods range from about 1 to about 7 8 seconds so using mw wave you can actually do a time dissolved study of these waves as well there are also three reports of long period oscillations where the uh, these oscillations were clustered near 3 and 5 minutes now of course there are some exceptions to this rule and i will talk about one of them here now most of these past radio studies focused on strong radio bursts with the advent of new instruments like the mw wave these detections at much lower flux density levels have now been reported for example mohan in 2019 observed oscillations in both area integrated flux density of these uh, oscillations and the periodicities was between 3 to 4 seconds interestingly they observed that the area and integrated flux density showed a anti correlated behavior mohan 2021 also reported anti correlation between area and the position angle this was interpreted at presence of torsional modes this is an image taken from mohan 2019 in green we have shown integrated flux density and in red is shown the area i would like to draw your attention to this particular figure as you can see clearly there are these oscillate oscillations present in the data and periods were about 3 to 4 seconds but we also find that there are this strong anti correlation between the integrated flux density and the area here although this oscillatory pattern is not evident the anti correlation can still be observed between the area and the integrated flux density i mentioned to you earlier that the short period oscillations where the periodicities range from 0.5 to 5 seconds are generally interpreted as being produced due to sausage mode oscillations at the emission site mohan in 2019 showed that these observations could not be explained by this phenomena they explain this by hypothesizing that there are these sausage mode oscillations at the site of reconnection itself and that is why these sort of phenomena are being produced from this plot uh, this is clear that even though this oscillatory pattern is not present in this time period the presence of this anti correlation was sufficient to infer the presence of sausage modes at the site of reconnection and this is interesting because is often in coronal conditions the waves show a, show a quasi periodic nature additionally if waves are present for short durations then detecting the periodicity is tough however as evident from the earlier figure the anti correlation between these quantities can still be found even if the periodicities is not evident now this technique has already been used to give insights into how energy is channeled in different wave modes during a flare i will like again point it out that all past studies regarding oscillations in the radio band were done when the sun was active in this work we have detected the presence of sausage mode oscillations 
in a quiescent active region using the technique of this anti-correlation. The flux density of the active region studied in this work is about 100 times weaker and the faintest studied prior to this work. Our work shows that probably these MHD waves are present almost always and the radio data gives us a unique probe to study them. These observations were, were taken between 130 to 240 UT on 27 November 2017. In this figure, I have overlaid the radio contours on top of a 193 angstrom image. There was only one active region on the solar disk. So this is the active region in yellow. And this is the noise storm associated with this active region. The sun was very quiet on this day. This is extra light curve from that day. And I will like draw, draw your attention between zero and three UT. This covers the time range studied in this work and clearly you can see no X-ray flare between these times. The sun was very quiet. But if we plot the light curve of this noise storm, we see this sort of a time variation. I mentioned it to you earlier that noise storms are characterized by a smooth background with narrow impulsive bursts superposed on top of it. This pattern is also seen here. The highest, at its highest, which is, the, 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 which is this peak, the flux density of this noise storm was 100 times weaker than the earlier works. So the noise storm, which was studying, is very quiescent, actually. Even though it is seen very showing high flux densities here, in comparison, it is very quiet. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, we would like to search for sausage modes by trying to detect anti-correlation between area and the integrated flux density. For that, we fitted this noise storm emission by a 2D Gaussian plus the constant background and extracted the area and integrated flux density from the fitted parameters. Then we search for anti-correlation in time interval such that the Spearman rank correlation in that time interval is less than minus 0.8. Additionally, we enforced that this anti-correlation should, should exist for at least 10 seconds. This 10 second was motivated by the fact that the periodicities were of the order of three to four seconds. And hence, within 10 seconds, we'll, we have a sufficient number of oscillations uh, in the time range. Here I have shown four such examples in red is shown the area and in blue is the integrated flux density. It's evident from this figure that there is a strong anti-correlation between these two quantities. Here I have shown the normalized cross-correlation of four different time intervals uh, where the anti-correlation was detected. And clearly we see this at t is equal to zero. But I would like to draw your attention to these small peaks here. It seems that they occur at regular intervals. Now this can be taken as a hint of periodicity of periods of the order of five seconds. However, since the time span is small, it's insufficient to prove this in a robust manner. Now, we have also investigated if the presence of anti-correlation at any particular fr frequency implies its presence at other frequencies as well. We find that the answer is no. For example, here, see in this time interval, the anti-correlation was present at 160 megahertz only, was completely absent in other three fre frequencies. Similarly here, we find the anti-correlation be present at 120 megahertz and 160 megahertz. Nothing was seen at these two frequencies. So in conclusion, the Anti, the presence of anti-correlation between area and integrated flux density of the noise storm at a frequency does not imply its presence at other frequencies. Now, it was interesting to investigate if there is any trend or relationship between the time intervals where the anti-correlation is present and 
the integrated flux density of the noise storm source. In this figure, this transparent red shows the time intervals where this anti-correlation was detected. No apparent relationship is evident from this figure. Now, how do we interpret these results? As I mentioned earlier, the noise storm studied here was very weak. Hence, it is we can assume that the non-thermal uh, electrons which are powering this noise storm are also very weak. From past studies, we have learned that such weak non-thermal electrons cannot travel far into the higher up to the corona because they quickly get damped due to collisions. Hence, we, we hypothesize that the plasma emission which is arising at different frequencies are due to local electron beams which are produced locally. Now imagine that there is a flux tube which has sausage modes in it. So these patterns will be produced due to the presence of sausage modes. And this star shows the site of reconnection. And since I mentioned that these are locally produced, the emission site will be close to the site of reconnection. Now, when the area is large, the density of the electrons accelerated will be small. Hence, the observed radio flux density will also be small. Just a On one minute warning. Yeah. In contrary, when the uh, in such a region where the density will be larger and the emission site will also be smaller. Hence, we can observe this sort of a anti-correlation. Based on this, we hypothesize that these waves are pro probably present always. And it is these non-thermal electrons which are being produced due to these reconnections produce a flashlight for lighting up these MHD waves in the vicinity. Now, I don't have time to explain this, so which they said I will discuss but I will just do, do this in short. So imagine this is a small coronal loop in much lower in the corona and the radio loops go to much higher heights. Now imagine that these are two positive polarity regions and this is a mixed polarity, which means there's both positive and negative polarity here. Now due to small scale reconnections here, the electron beams will of course be produced, but it can also induce uh, MHD modes in this big coronal loop. Now, uh, due to various twisting and turning motions, reconnections might be induced higher up in the corona, which ultimately lead to plasma emissions giving rise to a radio source. We are finding that this sort of a model can both explain the presence of wings, which we should, uh, uh, should uh, showed earlier, and the first oscillations which we are observing here. Now, we'll, this so. In to conclude, we are finding that we can detect these sort of waves, even when the radio flux density is 100 times weaker than the earlier works. This in itself is a testament to the high dynamic imaging capability of the MWV. Our work suggests that with increase in sensitivity and the dynamic range, the radio observations are not able to detect MHD waves even in quiescent times. For reporting the idea that these waves are almost always present in the coronal loops. The radio emission serves as a beacon to detect these high frequency waves. And we hope that in future, we might be able to do coronal seismology with similar observations. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's have a look. All right, no questions. Um, okay, in that case, I guess we'll move on to the next talk. So the next talk is from Rohit Sharma, which is imaging of weak impulsive solar emissions using residual visibilities. Uh, it's ready whenever you are. Yeah, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen and I can hear you clearly. Uh, perfect. Awesome. Okay, um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Roy Sharma and I'm a postdoc at University of Applied Sciences in Northwest Switzerland. And um, uh, today I will be talking about the imaging of weak impulsive uh, emission using residual visibility. So this is in continuation with uh, 
with uh, what Div said about uh, the detection of wings. Uh, so this is an alternative technique where we are exploring this technique to to quantify the weak emissions at uh, at meter wavelength solar solar emission. So Div already has uh, uh, motivated uh, uh, the uh, the the case for the detection of the wings. Uh, as 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 uh, the coronal heating problem and particle acceleration problem has been the uh, the issue Follow the power law. So you should expect a very weak uh, type of uh, emission at uh, at a much much higher frequencies, um, and uh, um, and the thing is to basically detect them uh, using the high sensitivity of MWA. It's uh, it it makes it a very interesting uh, uh, very interesting wave, uh, window of wavelengths to look into it because uh, the radio wavelengths at at meter waves is optically thin, and so it covers a large range of coronal heights. Especially at lower frequency, at around so let's say 100 megahertz, and the uh, emission mechanism for the burst here is the plasma emission mechanism, which is produces a large contrast in the in in the data that we see. Uh, for the for these uh, um, weak features, and uh, the plot on the right actually shows the occurrence of these uh, these uh, weak impulsive features, which is prevalent all throughout the meter wave frequency band, and also present um, equally in all of these uh, uh, frequency bands. So yeah, so that is uh, something which uh, we want to take it forward and try to quantify them even more uh, in the imaging domain. So one of the problems uh, uh, or one of the issues is uh, in the uh, when we are, when we are doing the imaging is basically when we uh, the total visibility has uh, two components in in solar emission one is the stationary component and one is the another one is the burst component so here uh, what I classify as the stationary component is uh, is, uh, is 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 a, is a state Uh, that we see often in at radio frequencies uh, they they vary over these time scales of seconds so uh, if we if, if, if we take out a um, image of sun which is shown in, at, uh, at the bottom at 108 megahertz so uh, if you take out one of these uh, regions it will have a comp uh, contributions from both of the stationary and the non stationary components so if we if we, if we are able to quantify the stationary component or if we take out the if we want to study the non stationary component we should we must take out the stationary component to for for getting a more accurate picture on the on the brightness and the location of the non stationary burst a non non stationary component so that is precisely um, what I, I i want to investigate in this in this work and um, uh, the visibility subtraction has been used uh, before uh, uh, to to study flares, especially in for to image the image image the uh, the, the the radio burst location. And here is an example of uh, of, uh, of a VLA uh, L band uh, um, the radio spikes that we see, uh, which is which is shown on the on the on the right hand side. And uh, here, um, typically, the uh, visibility subtraction is is done for, by choosing uh, the uh, visibility is at, uh, at at the background time. Uh, uh, so here you choose choose uh, the visibility to which you want to subtract and the stationary visibilities uh, from the from the time which is just before the uh, before the radio 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 burst, and then you subtract it throughout uh, the time series and try to image uh, the residual visibilities to get an accurate uh, position of the of the radio source. So here is an example of that, and you find that uh, the the radio burst location is quite uh, agreement with uh, for this element uh, is, is in agreement with the with the flared location which you find and here you can get an accuracy of a uh, few tens of uh, a few tens of uh, uh, arc second uh, uh, 
uh, for for VLA because it has um, it, it is a large frequency. This is a larger larger um, frequency and uh, it has more uh, longer uh, baselines. So, but you can get a get a larger uh, larger accuracy at least from the location of, of these uh, burst. Uh, so instead of doing uh, just choosing a one-time slice, we can probably uh, actually model this stationary component, which is varying over, over the time scales of minute, and we can subtract that, uh, and uh, we we can get uh, uh, we can get a more accurate picture on this on the location of this this bus because the you know stationary component varies over the time scale of minute, so only subtracting one component one time slice will not help. So what we do is basically precisely this. Uh, and we for this we choose a data which is very very quiet. Uh, so this is data taken in 2015 when uh, when the uh, when 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 there was a presence of large coronal hole, there was no activity. Uh, as you can see, the dynamic spectrum on the right from MWA is, is pretty smooth, uh, and uh, um, the UV map which is shown on the left uh, has uh, has various components. So there's a presence of large coronal hole. Uh, so um, yeah, we, we choose this data. Uh, we, we choose this data, and we make the solar images as uh, um, as um, uh, as usual. Uh, and uh, we made these solar images for eight frequency bands. And you can see the the contour plots for M uh, MW uh, radio contours here. And uh, um, and and you can see the structural variation uh, from from lower frequency to the higher frequency. And this is because of uh, various effects, like um, uh, you are sampling different uh, coronal heights, and also there is a propagation effect actually uh, increases at lower frequency. So you get a redistribution of flux uh, within the solar disk at lower frequency. Uh, but when you um, uh, so so what we did in the in this analysis, so we we took this data, we 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 had the real and imaginary component. We did the vector separation for the uh, real and imaginary components. And we imaged uh, uh, the residual visibility, whatever we get. So here we employ the polynomial subtraction in time uh, for each baseline. Um, um, we also tried with uh, running median um, subtraction, which actually gives us a better result. But here I'm showing you the result from the polynomial subtraction. Uh, and, and when we did uh, this and we made the solar maps, uh, so we, we could identify some transient features which, uh, which, which pops up uh, right away. And uh, they have characteristics of very, very weak uh, busts uh, here. So this is a residual map. So what I'm showing you here is basically uh, for we, we had uh, 30 minutes of data. So for each 30 minutes of data, we made uh, images at 0.5 second uh, 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 time resolution for the residual from the residual visibilities. And uh, here I am actually uh, averaging over the entire 30 minutes to 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 highlight the fact that. These bursts are actually um, so the the bursts that we see. They are coming from very compact regions from here. So so you can see there is a continuity of this uh, the, the burst forming region across across frequency. So from 240 megahertz, uh, you can see this spot here, and uh, 217 megahertz, you see the same spot at 179. You see the similar spot. Uh, at low frequency, however, uh, the, the the emission is quite scattered, and this is we are currently investigating why there are some uh, patches of emission uh, here, uh, for example, for example, here very away from the sun. So, um, but overall, we could be able to find the transient features, which is of the order of a few thousands of um, a few thousands of uh, um, uh, Kelvin in in strength, uh, and. Uh, so, uh, we see the lo their location they, uh, with uh, with respect to the underlying UV um, images. Then most of them actually seems to come from the the uh, the coronal part of the or the edge from the limb part of the of the of the solar uh, solar limb. And um, and this is expected because this is where you you actually sample a larger coronal height. Uh, large the, the line of sight actually uh, has larger larger range. Um, and um, they correspond to the active regions. So there are a couple of active regions which uh, which have just rotated it away in the in the limb there. And um, yeah, you can see the continuity in the frequency here. We also find some of the bursts which are located in the emerging active region, which is which is here, um, and uh, at low frequency. So so these bursts uh, are are quite weak, uh, and they have uh, the UV counterparts. Um, we are we are currently working on the uh, on the um, on the uh, on the uh, residual visibilities from the running median also, so where they, we find actually even more 
more such type of burst and um, uh, that is currently under investigation and um, if you look at the time scale of these uh, time scales of these transients so i chose a couple of uh, regions here um, uh, precisely six regions and i, I made the um, uh, time series uh, on, on and which is shown on the top right um, and uh, uh, you can see that in region one especially you see a couple of uh, very interesting bursts especially uh, in 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 the uh, uh, in the in the later part of the of the time series you, you find these oscillating pattern of burst which 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 actually pops up and these are all, all like uh, uh, 5000 to 10000 kelvin uh, type of burst and if you look at the time series of these bursts, most of these time, most of these bursts are unresolved uh, with uh, with MWA uh, 0.5 second uh, time resolution, and uh, um, and uh, um, you you basically have uh, uh, a couple of bursts which are actually resolved in time, and uh, uh, and and you and and you you basically see. Um, uh, at at point five second resolution, most of them are unresolved. So these are uh, very narrow uh, time, small time scale burst that that we have detected. And here is an example of uh, of the of the transient event, uh, um, uh, the brightness temperature that we have. So you can see most of them actually have are they lie between three to nine, three to ten uh, kilo Kelvin type of um, um, brightness temperatures. And these are the cutoffs that I gave. And um, when we compute it uh, with respect to the self noise, which is which is present, um, uh, with respect to self noise, self noise levels are are much lower than the uh, uh, the detected uh, and the detected uh, the practice temperatures for these transients. So overall, so this this technique seems to be very promising in in detecting the very fine, very weak uh, burst, uh, especially if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to relate to the, um, if you want to relate, to, if you want to find the location of these burst and uh, um, yeah, study them. So the, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, we are currently also looking at uh, some of the, uh, uh, Correlations from radio uh, and X-rays. Uh, so for this, uh, we are um, um, we are using the data from uh, from Stix X-ray. Uh, so Stix is basically a spectrometer on board solar orbiter mission, which is going around the sun. And um, uh, and uh, X-ray and uh, radio are actually complementary emission in a standard uh, a stand, a standard uh, solar player model picture. Because when the reconnection takes place, the, the electrons go up uh, along the loop and comes down. And when they comes down, they hit the hard, uh, high density regions near the chromosphere and they produce hard X-ray signatures. Uh, while the, the electrons which go up, they, they tend to produce the meter wave uh, radio emission. So in a way, in a flare process, we expect them to be uh, present, both, the, both of them. Uh, so that, that's why um, studying the radio in context with X-ray is, is is pretty interesting. And since uh, solar orbiter is going around the sun, we will get a different perspective of X-ray emission. So we probably we can made, make it like a three D picture of the of the flare phenomena. Uh, so that is something we are looking forward to. Um, last year we we did try to um, get uh, some observations from MWA from 16th to 19th November 2020. Um, and uh, this is where the solar orbiter was. And uh, just a uh, one minute warning. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so solar orbiter was here, and uh, Sun Earth is here. So we had an overlap of like forty degrees, but uh, um, and we found actually a couple of interesting flares, uh, uh, which uh, which in, in X rays, um, which would be visible from uh, solar orbiter and the and also from the Earth. Uh, this is a ghost light curve. However, they they seem to be um, related in temporally, but uh, if you if you if you make the images from or the X-ray images, they they seems to be very very off. So, so these are actually uh, some of the things which which makes things complicated. Like um, you have uh, um, you have temporal um, correspondence, but in the uh, but when you image, they are totally at a different location. So we could not unfortunately we could not find uh, uh, any 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 event during this time. But we we look forward. To for the next time, um, that is the uh, November, where where the um, the solar orbiter will be near Earth. It will have a Earth uh, gravity maneuver, so um, we will have a larger overlap of the sun. 
with uh, with uh, earth field of view so we we can be and the uh, solar activity level is also rising so we'll have we'll, we'll, we hope to capture more of the of the of the solar flares in the, in this uh, in this year at the end of this year so that would be pretty interesting um, yeah so i will leave you with the summary so uh, basically the visibility subtraction technique is, is is pretty promising to detect weak burst and it can detect a weak burst up to level of milli of you and it can actually very accurately look at them yeah so yeah thank you very much awesome thank you for the talk uh does anyone have any questions just have a look yeah uh one from ramesh go for it Uh, yeah, quick one. I think at uh, one point you mentioned uh, some of those bursts uh, were unresolved. So, did you mean in time or in the location? So, I'm, I mean, yeah. was, was where this uh, uh, data that you were showing all those contour maps were they from phase one or extended array? Yeah, those, those uh, that that is from phase one, and they are uh, um, unresolved in temporal dimension because. Um, in space, you can actually uh, see them, um, and some of them actually show some extensions also. So it's it's a mixture of both uh, in spatial dimension. But I, what I meant was a, in the temporal uh, domain. It is it is. Uh, so that's half a second, right? A half Probably. a second. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think we have one more question from Surajit. Um, so. Shall I? Yep, go for it. So Rohit, your uh, region five was located outside, I think the intensity map which you had shown and yeah. uh, the brightness temperature which you quoted was about 6,000 Kelvin. But uh, in the time series plot, there was, I think there was no such burst. So is this a different time or different data thing of that sort? Uh, you mean to say in the in the region five years? So this is actually yeah. So um, uh, this is I'm showing you for two forty megahertz, um, and um, and actually the burst that we see at uh, that is at one o eight megahertz, where we have okay. a streamer actually here. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I don't think we have any more time for any more questions. So if you want to chat offline, feel free. Uh, until then, thanks for the talk. Our next speaker is John Morgan, uh, and the talk is titled IPS and Ionospheric Scintillation Measurements with the MWA. It's all yours, John. I think we... Uh, it's got Rohit still sharing his screen. Uh, yeah, you... Stop you uh, oh, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Stop share. Should, yeah, cool. Should be free for you. Okay, I'm just, uh, uh, just getting my screen up. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I think probably most of you know me, but uh, my name is John Morgan. Um, I work across um, several of the MWA teams, particularly um, uh, survey work um, and uh, solar work. Uh, my main focus is on um, interplanetary scintillation measurements with the MWA, um, where I work closely with uh, Rajan Chetri and Rong Ikers. Um, but uh, I'm going to spend most of um, my talk today um, talking about some scintillation measurements uh, of the ionosphere that we've been doing using the methodology that we've developed for IPS with the MWA. Uh, and that work has been led by an honours student, um, Angie Majewski, um, who I co-supervise with Chris Jordan. Um, and I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Tim Galvin, who's been um, co-supervising a third year project with me um, as well on, on, um, on IPS. 
So before I get onto the ionosphere stuff, um, a, a fairly brief update on our um, MWA IPS work. Um, so we um, started taking really very regular observations um, with the MWA when it was in its extended configuration, um, basically over the whole of 2019A. Um, and those are the observations that we took. So we observed all the way around the sun, sort of about six to 10 observations every day, um, covering different clock angles at a fixed distance of about 30 degrees from the sun as the, uh, as the um, earth moves um, along the, as the sun moves along the ecliptic. So those are our 2019 observations, all of them plotted in uh, right ascension and declination. Um, and already pretty much by um, this time last year, we had um, selected a, a subset of those observations to process. Um, that processing is now complete and we're, we already have and have had for a little while um, a reasonably um, sensible catalog um, drawn from, about, from, from those observations containing a few thousand sources. Um, it's got good coverage of Gamma 9, it's got good coverage of the Galactic Anticenter, um, and we uh, also by design focused on a little bit on the Northern Hemisphere for this first um, data release. Um, in 2020, when the MWA was in its very long um, um, period of extended configuration, um, we took these observations here, so really filled in the, the full um, trip around the, around the ecliptic right the way through um, the year. Um, so in the future, we should be able to publish a, um, a paper that covers all compact sources within about 30 degrees or so of the ecliptic, uh, which is very exciting. You'll notice a few scion dots on the um, bottom right there. Um, so those are um, observations using 30 megahertz of bandwidth in essentially the top gleam band. Um, so that's something new. We haven't really looked at them yet. Um, but the motivation for those will become clear if we switch to a uh, galactic coordinate system. Um, we're basically, those are around the galactic center. Uh, we expect there, in fact, we've got good e evidence from our observations at the galactic um, anti-center over on, on the right of the plot um, that we're able to probe really, really well the um, turbulence in the ionized interstellar medium because it scatter broadens sources at these um, frequencies and it makes means that we can't see IPS from, from certain regions of the sky. And so we're hoping to, to do a little bit better where the scattering is strong close to the galactic center um, by using a higher, higher frequency. Anyway, unfortunately, I don't have time in this time slip to, to go into uh, the, the galactic scattering anymore. Uh, watch this space. Uh, we'll be hopefully publishing some of that work soon. Um, but I'll just give a few science highlights from, our, from, from this survey. Even though the actual data are not publicly released yet, um, they have contributed to um, a couple of um, submitted papers. Um, so the first was an MWA collaboration paper um, where we did a fairly in-depth comparison. This was just one section of the of the of the of the um, low far long baseline calibrator survey paper, but we did a fairly in-depth comparison of the um, compact sources as probed by international low far versus our IPS survey. Um, they probe very very similar spatial scales. Um, and we were able to show this really, really good one-to-one um, -one correlation um, between the compact flux density as measured by IPS and a sort of weighted compact flux density, weighted, weighted based on the, the scales, the baselines weighted by the, the, the extent to which they contribute to um, IPS scintillation indices. And you get this really, really good one-to-one um, -one, um, connection. Um, so uh, we've already used this um, also for um, Guillaume's um, paper um, uh, that Jess mentioned in his talk um, earlier, um, and there's a lot of work in progress. So we're looking at a, a more detailed comparison um, with international LOFAR, so we can actually use their data to calibrate what we call the NSI, the Normalized Scintillation Index. So rather than just... Um, 
uh, uh, reporting this NSI, which is somewhat esoteric, esoteric for the average astronomer, we should be able to actually just report um, a size in arc seconds um, for each of our sources. Um, Rajan's um, looking quite deeply into the Gleam 4 Jansky sample sources, which fall within our um, survey. Um, I've already mentioned the galactic scattering. Um, we're just beginning to explore the potential of this survey for, for space weather work. There's certainly a lot of potential there, um, although not that many resources at the moment. Um, but Zhang has um, kindly had a look at some of the polarimetry for our observations, and it seems that we can um, recover polarimetry from our IPS observations in spite of the fact that you have the sun, the sun lurking in the side lobes. Um, but we're also really interested in um, using the uh, methodology and the, the know-how that we've developed for this project and applying it to other instruments um, um, and also to, to, to other phenomena and other problems. So that's really what I'm going to talk about um, for most of the rest of um, today. So I, I'm not just presenting uh, Angie's uh, work, I'm more or less um, uh, presenting her slides. So um, uh, a lot of this is, is, is down to her. Um, so I'll start off with, with something that I think everyone is reasonably familiar with, and that's the, the positional shifts um, that are induced in MWA images um, due to refraction um, in the ionosphere. Um, this was first really well, really discovered, but, but also um, uh, 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 analyzed to, to, um, uh, and understood to a very, very high level um, by um, an honor student, Cleo Loy, um, five or six years ago now. Um, and that was very high profile. And I think this is really sort of embedded in the, in the know-how of the, of the MWA collaboration. So Cleo was initially um, uh, doing this work to understand the effects of these shifts on um, transient searches. Um, Natasha presented earlier today just how well these refractive shifts can be taken out and you can get exceptionally good astrometry, uh, particularly with the phase two MWA um, uh, for, for, um, for survey science. And you, well, you can basically um, essentially remove all of these refractive shifts and get down to positional accuracy of a fraction of an arc second, which is really quite incredible. Um, and Chris Jordan and, and Kath Trott have, uh, and others um, have done a lot of work on understanding the impact uh, uh, that these kinds of effects can, can have on um, EOR science. So this is a very, very well known phenomenon. Um, and uh, Chris Jordan has uh, sort of separated these out into to four types of um, ionospheric conditions. Um, and um, uh, and uh, we, the, the, his paper also compares this to work that's been done with LOFAR um, in terms of um, the kind of um, ionospheric conditions um, th this relates to if you boil down the ionospheric um, phase screen to a, to a single statistic, which is the um, transverse distance over which you get a phase shift of one radian, um, which, is, which is known as R diff. So that gives me a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a segue to why you might try and do amplitude um, scintillation measurements with the, with the MWA. Um, so this is a, a plot um, that, uh, well, uh, the plot's my idea, but the, the basic sort of thing that it's plotting comes from this rather obscure but really nice paper um, by Tim Cornwell from 1989, um, looking at the effect of scattering and relating it to um, the effects that you get in the image plane. Um, so... Um, it's a really interesting paper, not least because it focuses on this area in the top right where things go really crazy. Um, but basically what you have on the x-axis is the scattering strength. So this is the, that, that diffractive um, uh, R diff um, compared to the, the, the Fresnel scale. So the, the, the scale over which you get a, a phase change of one radian versus the, the Fresnel scale, which is a purely geometric um, construction depends on the square root of the wavelength and the distance to the scattering screen. Um, and so you go from very weak scattering to very, very strong scattering. Um, and then the y-axis compares the telescope's maximum baseline length to that R diff. So you go from your, your one radian happening 
within your size of your interferometer at the bottom of the plot up to the um, RDIF being, um, sorry, sorry, much larger at the top of the plot um, than uh, much smaller than, than the baseline length within your array at, at the top of the plot. So uh, depending on which of these um, quadrants you are in, you will see either weak amplitude scintillation, strong amplitude scintillation, weak source distortion or profound source distortion in the image plane. And if you just plug in the numbers for the MWA um, and for the um, RDIF that's been found from these previous studies, you find that you're pretty solidly in the bottom left-hand corner. So we should expect to see amplitude scintillation um, in here. Um, another reason that I thought I would find it is because uh, if anyone's uh, looked at my source noise paper that I published earlier this year with Ronald Eakers, we also see amplitude scintillation on the scale of a few, few percent. And you can see that plotted on there um, as well. Going to a larger telescope shifts you from low down on the plot to higher up on the plot. And you can see that for the dis difference between phase one and phase two. Um, and there's a weak dependence on frequency um, as well. Sorry, these should all be 154 megahertz and 182 megahertz for orange, which is the, which is the two EOR frequencies. So it's an interesting thing to look at, different way of probing the ionosphere, um, directly relevant for IPS because we worry about how things vary in the time domain. Um, but um, it's also neat because it gives us a, offers a potential way to measure the ionosphere without the need for longer baselines, which may be useful for um, other instruments similar to the MWA or even in the MWA in the compact configuration. All right, so we, we basically, um, to begin with, picked out um, 100 uh, observations. Um, and we, we did that by taking 10 observations from each decile of the EOR, 2014 EOR data, um, based on Chris Jordan's uh, ionospheric uh, statistic. So we'd have a good range of, of ionospheric conditions within our data set. Um, we found a few interesting gotchas in our data. So uh, we found that, um, that this only applies to very old MWA data. We think it's a cotter bug, um, but basically there's a, a, a time step offset um, when you go from one set of GPU box files to, to the next, which um, causes all kinds of, all of your sources basically to shift by a second in time um, in the in the image. A really good diagnostic for all of these issues we found is to self-calibrate um, the uh, data for um, every single time step individually um, in, your, in, your, in your data set. And that shows off, up all of these issues really, really clearly. Um, sometimes we saw a whole um, uh, receiver's worth of tiles take an excursion. Um, and sometimes we saw just one or two tiles was going crazy. These all cause real problems for us in the image plane, but by doing this diagnostic, we could flag those out and it made the problem go away. So this is what we get. Um, so this is the light curve for a set of um, sources within the EOR zero field for one particular one of these observations. The gray lines are off source measurements to give you an idea of the noise level. Um, the colored lines are on source for a variety of different sources. We've subtracted um, a model of the sky out of the, these measurement sets, um, but that's an imperfect process. So um, although not all of the lines are centered on zero, they are at a level much lower than their true flux density. The, the y-axis here is in, in Janskis. The dotted lines are known IPS sources from our surveys. Um, and you can see that night side IPS is at least when you have relatively low ionospheric scintillation is the dominant source of, of variability for, for those sources. Um, we also have um, very strong or relatively strong um, scintillation. It's not um, uh, formally in the, in the strong regime, but something more like about a, a, a seven or 8% modulation index. Um, and you can see that almost quasi sinusoidal variability very easily resolved by our two second resolution. This has all of the hallmarks um, of ionospheric scintillation. Um, and ionospheric and IPS are, are additive. So um, the, the ionosphere starts to dominate, although the IPS sources show both. And so they're still the most variable. 
So this matches exactly the, the predicted range of um, scintillation indices based on the RDIF. Um, and uh, here is um, a plot of all of the mod modulation indices in order for those 76 uh, observations that we've looked at. Um, the black line is the median, I think, excluding the IPS sources. So you can see most of the time it's sort of three or four percent um, scintillation index. And then for a small subset of sources, it goes up to as high as, as 10 percent. And indeed, in a lot of cases, when you um, compare the ionospheric scintillation to the refractive shifts, you, you find that you have some where there's low scintillation index and low offset. Um, and others where there is high scintillation index and large refractive shifts. But we also have cases where the scintillation index is fairly low and the refractive shifts are going crazy. And also cases where the refractive shifts seem relatively benign and you have extremely strong ionospheric scintillation. So here is the plot of the two um, against each other. Um, there is a weak correlation. Um, it's actually got a p-value of 7%, but I think nonetheless it's pretty believable that there is a weak correlation there. But it is not a very strong to one, one to one relationship um, at all. There's one set of four observations that stand out on their own, um, and they are all from one night. If you look at them compared to Chris Jordan's two um, metrics, um, they sit in a, quite an interesting um, uh, point, um, just about falling in within the range where they're, they're type one, and you'd say that the ionosphere was benign, but very, very close to falling into one of the um, stronger um, ionosphere regimes. So this is a rather interesting um, discrepancy. Um, and uh, we are, of course, measuring slightly different things, although both um, claim to be measuring our diff, they measure it on different scales. So one is measuring the gradient of the um, ionospheric density across the array. Um, the other is measuring the sort of curvature of that, um, uh, of, of that uh, um, density across a scale which is considerably smaller. Um, than, the, than the phase one array of a few hundred meters. So RF's a, a few hundred meters. And within that range, as you, as you put in a random phase screen, it will either on average be a slightly converging lens or a slightly deep diverging lens. And that's what weak scintillation is. So there's a, 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 a scale difference of a factor of a few on, on what you're actually measuring here. And the way that the, the, these effects um, scale with distance to the scattering screen is very slightly different as well. But if you compare it to other um, turbulent media, such as the interstellar medium, where you have this perfect Kolmogorov turbulence all the way from tens of parsecs to hundreds of kilometers, sort of seven orders of magnitude, the fact that we're looking at less than an order of magnitude different between these things, and we see such different effects. Just still one minute warning, John. Interesting. Thanks. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the, at the, at the offsets, they do not look anything like um, isotropic Kolmogorov turbulence. They are not fractal. Um, they are describable by a few simple sort of sinusoidal um, modes. So the fact that we don't see them as being behaving like Kolmogorov isotropic turbulence is perhaps not a surprise. And one thing I've been thinking about over the last week or so is whether there is a correlation there, but it has a time delay or a spatial offset. Maybe those large scale structures do eventually cascade down to the smaller scales, um, or they, um, uh, this could be the, the wake of a um, traveling ionospheric um, uh, uh, um, a disturbance uh, that, that we're seeing with, with the um, amplitude scintillation. So implications, um, I mean, obviously it's interesting in itself. We've got a new way of discovering uh, the, the, by uh, probing the ionosphere. Um, but I think it's, it's important to note that beyond the actual amplitude scintillations themselves, the fact that your sources are, are changing in, in brightness, which is um, something that I, I care about with, with my IPS work, there are other effects that are almost certainly present, which might have an effect on, on other people's science as well. So if you have um, turbulent structure um, on scales of a few hundred meters, 
that means that you're going to have phase scintillations as well in your visibility. Those phase scintillations increase with ba baseline lengths and they have shorter time scales than typical ionospheric effects as well as you go to the longer baselines. So this is essentially blurring or scatter broadening of your sources once you make an image using a a, a, um, a time scale longer than that than that uh, time scale of variability, which will almost certainly be the case. And um, if you look at what Natasha presented this morning, the connection between this this um, wobble in the position of sources on half second, two second time scales, and the blurring that you eventually get in the in the um, in the image plane. So I, I think as we look towards SK low and longer baselines on the MW, MRO. Um, these kinds of, uh, uh, this amplitude scintillation gives us an insight into a, a rather more pernicious kind of active ionosphere than these refractive shifts that over the last few years, I think the MWA has figured out how to, to work with. Um, this is, uh, I think, seems to me a, a much more tricky thing um, to deal with. Um, and uh, at least for the foreseeable, I think it's likely that you're going to be throwing away data where, where you've got this kind of um, kind of thing going on. And so we're going to be working hard to, um, to try to do some climatology and understand the filling factor, how often this is going on and, and, and a bit more about it. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Uh, That's a good talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yep, there's one hand up in the Cairo boardroom. Go for it. Hey John, I always love seeing this stuff. It's great. Um, so uh, yes, I, compared to the talk I gave this morning, I, mean, I am seeing position shifts. I would say those position shifts are fairly common. Um, we're seeing them in quite a lot of the nights. And, and you're right, they're not particularly correlated with the refractive shifts. Um, we've been just doing some really tentative work on that and I have some terrible plots I didn't show. Um, what I'd like to understand is how that relates to the diagram that you showed at the beginning. I mean, are we just not supposed to see these things? Um, you have the, I guess, the Mebius at all points. Um, yeah. Uh, should these be at the top left of the diagram? Well, I, I think um, a, a really um, big caveat with this diagram, and I think it's a really good way of visualizing and understanding these issues. Um, but these, um, these four regimes formally apply um, if you go to infinity at minus x plus x, uh, minus x what, minus y plus x plus x plus y and so on. It's, they, they apply at the corners and how you go from one regime to the other and what it looks like when you're in an intermediate between those two is not particularly well, well defined. So the fact that at the upper end of the, the, of the R diffs that we see, um, with, uh, um, with, with other techniques for, for probing this, um, that we're getting close to the um, zero line here and moving up towards the top of the plot, I think just, just implies that you start to get a bit of very, very mild fail, phase scintillation induced wobble in the, in the positions and, and shapes of those sources. Um, and as you go to longer and longer baselines, that line is just going to move up and up and up. Yeah, well, I'd love to pick your brain sometimes for a discussion we should have offline about how to save this information in the most useful way give, without adding too much burden to our existing processing so that we can really dig sure. this out of our data. And also, I guess, if amplitude scintillation is expected, I think at the moment, the way I'm creating those images, it's all just going to be rolled together and... Um, yeah, it might take a bit of effort to disentangle. So yeah, love to chat offline about that. Yeah, we should we should chat, chat offline. I'll just mention very briefly um, that uh, if you have a, an array which has a large extent on the ground, um, uh, the, these the the amplitude scintillation is actually scintles. Your your sources all have bright and dark patches physically on the ground. So if your array is much bigger than those patches, then you won't see that amplitude scintillation. And in fact, what, one of the things that's on our to-do list is to re-image all of this using the core stations alone and see if that actually slightly increases the amplitude scintillations that we measure. Um, so I, I, I'm interested in whether we can actually just pull this out of the visibilities in, in some way um, for the longer baseline data. 
Yeah, that'd be super. It's like being underneath the swimming pool, looking up. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Awesome. Um, does I think that's enough for questions now. We're just running a little bit late. Um, in that case, uh, I'll pass on to Stephen for the wrap up. Thanks for all the talks, everybody. Yep, thanks very much, Jaden. Can everyone hear me at this point? All good? Yep, we can hear you. All right, thanks very much. Um, yeah, look, overall, I'd really like to thank everyone for their participation in the meeting over the last couple of days. It's been really impressive to see how many people have joined. Uh, and it's always really good to see the, the quality of all of the presentations. So um, I've, I've watched each and every presentation and I thought they were all fantastic. Um, so particular thanks to all of the, the science teams, the science working group leads who have organized the overview presentations. They've been really informative. Uh, and a particular thanks, I think, to the MWA operations team. Uh, again, I really enjoyed the the, the technical presentations and updates on the status of the instrument and the progress towards various different things. Um, it's really impressive stuff across the board. Uh, thanks also to all of the session chairs uh, and, and the uh, people behind the scenes uh, like Mia who've uh, organized the event as such and um, to Chris for hosting the, the, the Zoom uh, hookup itself. Um, a really good team effort to, to get a meeting like this underway. Um, I guess we've all had a bit of practice with uh, fully online conferences over the last 18 months. Um, they are very effective. Um, they are a bit of work to, to set up and it's a particular style of interaction. And um, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, while I think they're useful, I really can't wait to get back to face-to-face -face interactions at conferences and workshops. And um, even though December this year might be just a little bit too soon, um, I think this time next year, I, I'm really looking forward to getting the MWA team together for a good old face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, Mia charged me with a couple of tasks. Um, I've got to hand out some awards, which, um, I've got to be honest, it's been pretty tricky at this meeting just because of the, the really overall high quality of, of presentations. Now, I know um, I'm not supposed to give awards to MWA uh, management team members, and I'm not going to, but I think I have to give an honourable mention to Chris Risley for bringing the enthusiasm and uh, the energy to his principal scientist's presentation this morning at some sort of insanely ridiculous time of the night and or day, whatever it was, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 1 a.m., I don't know. Um, but Chris, respect. Uh, but you don't get any MWA merchandise, unfortunately. Um, I was charged with uh, coming up with a, a, a best junior researcher award and a, a best senior researcher award. So I'll, I'll start with the senior uh, person award, although it's a little bit tricky to determine who's junior and who's senior. Um, but I'm, I'm giving the, the senior award to Divya Oberoi for his overall presentation of, of the solar work, which after many years is really, really deeply impressive. Divya, you and your, your crew have kept at it for a long time and are really coming up with the results. And I think if you guys can even in part crack the nut of the coronal heating mystery, that will be enormous for you guys and immense for the MWA. Um, that's a big problem and close to home. So uh, congratulations on the work and a really nice presentation today. And Mia will have some merchandise in the mail to you at some point. 
maybe Mia, you can throw in a, a few extra things for Divya's as collaborators. I think we could manage that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. No, no, Divya, thanks to you and your team and everyone who's been involved in the solar stuff over the years. It's been a, a journey. Uh, in terms of the uh, junior award, I've uh, selected Nick Swainston as the recipient uh, for his presentation on the SMART survey, the Pulsar survey, and in particular, the discovery of the first uh, new Pulsar with the MWA, which is equally enormous and a similar story. The, the Pulsar guys over many, many, many years have been chipping away and just gradually accelerating down the trajectory of getting to this point. Um, and we should not underestimate the volume of data and the complexity of analysis and checking and verification that's required in that type of work. So um, congratulations to Nick for that, but also uh, obviously the, the whole Pulsar team and uh, Ramesh as, as the leader of that team. That's uh, enormous effort and a, a very good result and also a great presentation of the results, Nick. So well done. Awesome, thank uh, you very the, much. No worries. But of, of course, like I say, it was a tough job actually. and I did have to resort to going back and looking at some of the YouTube recording to, um, to balance up the uh, adjudication there. So um, that YouTube recording is very, very handy, Mia and, and, and Chris. So anyway, I think enough from me. Um, look, I'm really looking forward to the next steps, um, getting MWAX up and running and deployed is going to be really exciting and we're really banking on a lot of you guys uh, champing at the bit to get some commissioning data off MWAX into your hands and into your desktops and, um, and, and see what you can learn from it over the next uh, few months. Um, so a couple of months down the track, I think it's going to be really exciting and um, the, the prospect of um, hopefully a new suite of receivers on the MWA uh, starting next year is also enormously exciting. Uh, there's clearly um, quite a lot of work to do. And of course, there's always challenges, but I think the future is looking really bright. Um, and uh, of course, that's because we've got a great facility and um, a great operations team, but in large part because we've got um, you guys as the MWA community working away on all manner of scientific endeavors. And that is absolutely key to our success. So once more, big thanks to all of you and, and thanks for participating. Uh, now we've got a couple of days of meetings with the board uh, and no doubt there'll be some outcomes and news out of that that we will uh, report to the collaboration uh, probably next Monday or Tuesday. So keep an eye out for that. All right, I, I think that's enough from me. Uh, have we got anything final to do, Mia? No, Mia's shaking her head, so that means no. So I guess uh, sign off and uh, see you later. Good luck to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. See you later.